up to four. Hey Kevin, let us know when to test the backup line, and I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna give it over to Cisco since he's here. All right, the backup line is on. This is a sound check for the AT&T backup line. Can you hear me? Coming through clearly. Can you hear me as well? Yes, we can. Thank you. You're welcome.
Yeah, we only yeah. have one speaker. All the computer All the speakers, speakers are muted. muted. It's a little better, but there's still a little echo. Excuse me, uh, Amy, Brandon, and Mary, uh, where are you located? In B22. Okay, we, we'll send um, our IT staff member down there to assist you with the echoing. Thank you. Oh, how about now? Now. Good morning. This is a sound check for Saman Kashani. Can you hear me? Oh, one. Sorry, one second. I'm going to ask for two, two seconds. Uh, I can hear you, but I can't unmute. Uh, correct. Yeah. Um, the host will be able to mute and unmute you. When you are mute, uh, you, wouldn't, you won't be able to unmute yourself, but when you're unmuted, then you can mute yourself. Okay, I think I understood that. <laughs> okay. But yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Thanks. But if and when you present, then you will have the ability to mute or unmute yourself. Thank you. I see. Good morning. This is a sound check for Dr. Ferrer. Can you hear me? Hi, good morning. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Muted me. Muted me. See.
do what you're working for. Do that. Hi, this is another sound check for Amy, Brandon, and Mary. Can you hear it? 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 Uh, yes, we can, but still, there's still an echo. So this speaker, so we're talking through my mic. So we're talking through my mic right now. This speaker, for some reason. Okay. okay. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the LA County Board of Supervisors, which is being held. Remotely today is Tuesday, May 3rd, 2020. We'll take roll to confirm attendance. Great. Supervisor Solis. Present. Supervisor Kuhl. Here. Supervisor Hahn. I'm here. Supervisor Barger. Here. Chief Davenport, Chief Executive Officer. Present. Don Harrison, Acting County Council. Present. And Celia Zavala, Executive Officer of the Board. Here. 
Great, thank you. Supervisor Barger, would you do us the honor of leading us to the pledge? I would. Would you please stand and face the flag, put your hand over your heart, and repeat after me. As indicated on the, on the posted agenda, we'll be taking telephonic public comments during today's meeting. The Executive Office of the Board received over 150 written public comments for today's meeting, and as those written comments were received, all of them were available to the supervisors for their consideration, consistent with the Brown Act's requirements. We'll continue to receive written public comments throughout the meeting, which will become part of the official record. Executive Officer, please call the agenda. Madam Chair and members of the board, today's agenda will begin on page two, Scent Matters. Scent Matter 1 is a report by the Chief Executive Officer and appropriate department heads as necessary on the status of the American Rescue Plan funding and consideration of necessary action. Scent Matter 2 is a discussion and consideration of necessary actions on the public health order related to COVID-19 and the status of COVID-19 vaccine. These items will be held for discussion. On page three, consent calendar, Board of Supervisors, items three through 29. On item four, Supervisor Barger requests that this item be held. Also, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 11, Supervisor Solis requests that this item be held. On items 16 and 17, Supervisor Mitchell requests that these items be held. On item 18, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 19, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. Also, Supervisor Barger would like her vote to be recorded as no. On item 23, Supervisor Kuehl requests that this item be held. On item 25, Supervisor Hahn requests that this item be held. On item 26, Supervisor Hahn and Supervisor Barger request that this item be held. On page 25, administrative matters, items 30 through 76. On item 30, this includes a revision as, and the Chief Executive Officer requests that this item be removed from future agendas as indicated on the post and supplemental agendas. On page 54, this includes miscellaneous additions to the agenda which were posted more than 72 hours in advance of the meeting as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On page 55, ordinance for introductions, items 77 through 80. On item 78, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be continued two weeks to May 17, 2022. On page 57, public hearing item 81, this item will be held for hearing. On page 58, special district agenda, this is the agenda for the Los Angeles County Development Authority. On page 61, notices of closed session. On items CS1 and CS5, the Acting County Council requests that these items be referred back to the department as indicated on the supplemental agenda. The request for continuances and referred backs through CS5 are before you. Thank you, Executive Officer. And can you please read the short title of the I'm sorry, public Supervisor, can we take a vote on that? Uh, um, of course move. we can. <laughs> I'm moving fast today, just skip the whole paragraph. Yes, moved by Supervisor Solis, seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve these items, and such will be the order. Back now, if you could go ahead uh, and lead us into the short title. Thank you. For those who plan to testify before the board on the public hearing item, please prepare to be sworn in. In the testimony you may give before this board, you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Item 81 is a hearing on a resolution to increase the junior lifeguard program fee by $50 from 535 to 585 effective immediately. No departmental statement was provided and, and correspondence was received. We'll now take public comment for all agenda items. Executive Officer, please read the call-in information that was also provided on the agenda and explain the speaking rules to those members of the public who will be calling in to address the board. As indicated on the agenda, members of the public wishing to offer public comment should call 877-336-4437 
and use participant code number 1366786. To repeat, please call 877-336-4437 and use participant code number 1366786. Do not call that number if you only want to listen to the meeting. To listen only, please call 877-873-8017. And follow the instructions. To members of the public calling in, when it's your turn to speak, please state your name <clears throat> and which agenda items you wish to speak on. We will allocate 90 minutes for public comment on all items posted on today's agenda. You will have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more agenda items. In addition, those who would like to address the board with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum total up to three minutes per person. We will continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the record. When speaking on an agenda item, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you're not speaking on a topic or if we cannot tell if you're speaking on an agenda item, you will get one warning from county council or the chair. If you do not immediately or clearly get on topic or if you stray off topic again, you will forfeit the rest of your time and the chair will move to the next speaker. Please note that if you're also listening to the board meeting on a computer or speaker phone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices as soon as the moderator calls on you. If you do not turn down the volume, there will be an echo. Moderator, may we have the first speaker, please. Our first participant is Zeke Sandoval. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. This is Zeke Sandoval with PASS. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, regarding items 426 in general public comment. Um, item 4 is an ambitious motion. A new county entity charged with leading region-wide homelessness response has the potential to be transformative, but only if given proper authority and support to direct countywide action. Critically, the entity must have some authority over creating new permanent supportive and affordable housing, homes and homelessness. Separating land use and development policies from homelessness goals ignores that reality. As we have emphasized to all supervisor offices, we believe the homeless initiative in the CEO's office should be elevated to this role, retaining key staff to minimize waste and equip the new entity with practiced experts. Regarding LASA, we agree that structural changes should be made to place more emphasis on their systems administrator role and away from direct service provision. If LASA staff are transitioned, it is crucial for the county to prioritize continuity of care for our neighbors who depend on their LASA case management and to work together with organized labor to ensure no LASA employee falls to the cracks. On item 26, the direction to improve co-investment with cities and COGS is a positive step especially if those co-investments are explicitly directed towards housing construction. As the Blue Ribbon Report acknowledges, small cities and COGS need more assistance building out staff capacity and housing infrastructure. The county should strive, however, to keep the majority of its focus on regional service delivery as opposed to a city-by-city -city approach. People experiencing homelessness do not distinguish between city boundaries, and county-funded services must reflect that. Additionally, while we agree data sharing between providers and government agencies can and should be streamlined to speed up service delivery, we have serious concerns about broadening first-hand HMIS access to city and county governments. People experiencing homelessness are already some of the most vulnerable members of our society, and mishandled personal information heightens the risk of interpersonal violence, unfair criminalization, and political interference. Nonprofit providers already safeguard this data. Let us continue in that role. On general public comment, uh, overall, we know the homelessness response system is in dire need of reform, and we appreciate the hard work from all supervisors to make the county a leader for the region. In thinking about the structural changes ahead, we urge our county partners to trust the expertise of providers and COHI and keep ultimate focus on building more permanent housing so we can bring our neighbors home. Additionally, we strongly uh, discourage any sort of steering measure H funding towards uh, LASD host teams or any other law enforcement centric outreach teams as has been uh, alluded to in some press reports. Thank you very much. Thank you, next speaker, please. Our next participant is Anthony Arenas. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. 
Hi, my name is Anthony Arenas, and I'll be speaking on agenda items 23, 30, and general public comment. For agenda item 23, I thank the board for recognizing the importance of posting the Bill of Rights in juvenile facilities, but the closure of Barry J. Nydorf is long overdue. Please recognize the importance of investing in our youth, investing by decarcerating the youth population of LA County and providing supportive care that is separate from the probation department. On agenda item 30, the Sheriff's Department financial status report is supposed to be a semi-annual report. While the CEO is requesting this item be removed from the Board of Supervisor agenda, I demand clarity on how this will comply with the requirement that the reports are provided to the public on a semi-annual basis at least two times per year. And for general uh, public comment, just to reiterate the importance of closing Men's Central Jail, the time is now people are dying. In 2021 alone, 55 people died while in custody of the LA Sheriff's Department. That is more than one person a week dying in the LA County jails. This is unacceptable. Yes, people are dying of COVID in overcrowded conditions while deputies who refuse to get vaccinated or wear masks come into their living spaces every day. But even if we did not count COVID deaths in 2021, it would have still been the deadliest year in LA County Jail at least in at least 20 years. What could the Board of Supervisors have done in 2021? Y'all could have allocated money to create the 3,600 mental health beds that the county work group they created told them to. They could have, y'all could have started closing the most dangerous areas of Men's Central Jail. Y'all could have demanded the Sheriff's Department exercise its authority to release people to protect those in its care. But what did y'all do? You all allowed 55 people to die in the Sheriff's Department's custody. Like Supervisor Mitchell said in her own words, every day this jail remains open. You fail in your obligation to keep those who live and work there. Uh, all decarceration efforts and policies must focus on this overrepresentation of black people within the jail population, paying special attention to black women and black people with uh, mental health needs. And while black people make up 8% of the LA population, they represent 38% of those incarcerated in LA County jails. While the jail population decreased during the COVID-19 pandemic, racial dispar disparities worsened for black and Latina populations. A 2020 study showed that the black women uh, were spending the longest days in custody and that black people with mental health needs were released at significantly lower rates than their white counterparts. The county must address the racial injustice of incarceration and prioritize black and Latina community members in the county's decarceration efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Thaddeus McCormack. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Yeah, I want to speak on item four and 26. I know it's been pulled, but I'm in support of those, not for uh, general oral communications. Uh, my name is Thaddeus McCormack. I'm Lakewood City Manager, speaking on behalf of the city of Lakewood in support, uh, support of items uh, four and 26. I want to thank Supervisors Han, Barger, and Solis for their leadership in bringing these motions forward today and for their support in implementing the Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness recommendations. I also want to thank uh, you for supporting the Contract Cities proposed amendments. Smaller to medium-sized cities, Contract Cities in particular, often don't have the resources or political cloud of larger entities, but it doesn't mean that we are not as equally committed to addressing homelessness and improving how we address the issues in LA County. Allowing cities a seat at the table with the proposed county structure would go a long way to allow us to be a true partner on these critical issues. Allowing for host team funding would help multiply a proven and effective tool throughout the county. Allowing for the in-kind fund matching will help lower income communities as well as small to medium sized contract cities like Lakewood who receive a significantly lower percentage of property tax and other revenues compared to larger cities, which makes it more difficult to fund robust social services like those needed to combat homelessness on our own. Again, thank you, Supervisors Hahn, Barger, and Sleese, and the rest of the board for your concern and consideration on these matters that will help us all serve those experiencing homelessness throughout the county. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Kent Mendoza. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you will address on public comment. You may begin. Hi, good morning. My name is Kent Mendoza. I'm the manager of advocates and community organization at Dance Service Tourism Coalition, and I'm speaking on item 23. I'm providing general comments. Uh, just wanted to say that this county has made many, has worked on many alternatives to uh, incarceration in the past several years, and as we continue to move towards a real youth justice reimagined in our county, we must also ensure that we set standards of how young people should be treated and be viewed in in, a, in the most vulnerable places such as juvenile halls, camps, and just overall jails. Um, by supporting this uh, motion, uh, just uh, I want to say thank you to Supervisor Sheila Q and Supervisor the police for just bringing this motion forward, you know, because this is uh, something that we really need in this county right now, actually. Um, uh, this uh, By supporting this motion, the county agrees that uh, youth, youth life don't only matter, but that they also have a voice and that they should have every avenue and opportunity to be uh, available to them to be able to be heard. Uh, when I was incarcerated in these facilities in LA County from the age of 15 through 20, I spent many times in this uh, county juvenile house in Kent where I didn't even know how to use my voice or how to speak for myself. It was just hard to know that I even had a voice because it was still never really explained or it wasn't something that was really broken down in a really way, in a, in a way that as a young person, I will feel empowered. Uh, so, I, you know, it's, uh, it's something that we need. And uh, had I had proper understanding, orientation and breakdown of, of, of these types of uh, rights that I had, I would have, you know, been able to advocate for myself from the start of my journey from 15 to 20 of, in this facility. So. Uh, this is why I believe that, you know, the board should approve and move forward with this motion. Uh, you know, regardless of what happens at the state level, uh, you know, we, this is something that is needed, as we have seen in our own juvenile halls and camps, you know, and, and specifically Bridge Area United of Juvenile Hall. You know, there's just a lot of things that need to be fixed in that, in that place. And just in general, you know, uh, that's the place where young people should feel empowered and not be felt forgotten. So just really uh, urge this board to support the implementation of this uh, state bill, Assembly Bill 2417 by Assembly Member Ting. I'm also honored that I'm, uh, my organization is a co sponsor of this bill, so I really Excuse urge me? support to move forward. Your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Do better with young people. Thanks. Our next participant is Marissa Creter. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, my name is Marissa Crater and I'm the Executive Director of the Sangamo Valley Council of Governments and I'm speaking in support of Agenda Item 4 and general public comment. Um, I wanted to thank Supervisors Barger and Solis for bringing forward this important motion to implement the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness. We appreciate the thoughtful and comprehensive approach that the Blue Ribbon Commission took to welcome diverse perspectives and expertise. The seven recommendations are a critical step forward to improving how we address homelessness across the county, particularly in smaller cities. The COG and the 31 member cities have worked tirelessly to develop and implement local solutions to best serve persons experiencing homelessness in their communities. The Local Solutions Fund will support local initiatives to address homelessness for uh, these residents. The county entity will give cities the opportunity to be a part of the strategy and vision for addressing homelessness countywide. The motion will help increase collaboration across the county. It's a critical step forward that will improve our response to homelessness for all residents. We commend Birch and the Board of Supervisors on their acknowledgement of the existing challenges and development of recommendations that could better serve PEH across the county. Please vote yes on item four. Thank you very much. Thank you, next speaker, our please. Next participant, our next participant is Zachary Warma. Please state the agenda items you will be addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Supervisors. Zachary Warma, Associate Director of Policy at LA Family Housing, calling on items 4, 26, and general public comment. On item 26, implementing a new framework to end homelessness in Los Angeles. Thanks to your leadership, Supervisor Hahn, and that of Supervisor Barger, we have a clear, streamlined, and comprehensive vision for how we can more effectively combat homelessness in LA County. Under Executive Director Sheree Todoroff, the County Homeless Initiative undertook a thorough examination of Measure H funded strategies that was inclusive of cities, COG providers, and critically, those with lived expertise. The final
final report powerfully centers the importance of permanent housing, reducing barriers that limit one's ability to exit houselessness, and addressing the ongoing racial inequities that contribute to the growth of our unhoused population. The new framework lays out clearly defined roles rooted in best practices for all stakeholders, which if fully implemented will lead to a robust countywide response system. We urge a resounding approval of this motion and that HI be provided the necessary resources to begin immediate implementation. On item four, the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness. We are concerned that the motion in its current form will hinder the success of the new framework and the commission's stated purpose to improve accountability, transparency, and inclusivity. Should the board develop a new county entity and leader, we urge you to uplift HI and Executive Director Todorov to this role. For the Local Solutions Fund, these dollars should be available exclusively to jurisdictions willing to co-invest in programs spelled out in the new framework while being reviewed annually based on the same metrics we are developing for the rest of the system. On recommendations three through five, any consolidation of losses governing bodies must center the voices of those most intimately connected to the crisis, those with lived expertise and service providers. Lastly, regarding data, excluding providers from recommendation six while granting HMIS access to city staffers not directly engaging unhoused individuals and not trained in HMIS raises both programmatic and privacy issues. Lastly, on general public comment, Chair Mitchell, your Senate Bill 1380, the state's housing first law, remains truly historic as it enshrined effective human-centric policies at the heart of our rehousing system. Housing first is an evidence-based approach that recognizes having a secure roof over one's head is an essential first step towards regaining personal stability. Through housing first, individuals become housed faster, participate in supportive services at a higher rate, and most critically, are more likely to remain stably housed. LAFH was proud to testify before Senate Housing last week as a primary witness in opposition to SB 1284 because the last thing we should be pursuing are policies that make it harder for people to come off the streets. For that reason, we also wish to express our resounding opposition to the utilization of Measure H funds for local police and the Sheriff's Department. Taking limited Measure H dollars from service providers and redirecting them to law enforcement will result in reduced levels of service provision while increasing the, percent, but the potential for traumatization and criminalization for a population already disproportionately justice involved. This potential reallocation is also fundamentally misaligned with best practices, the county's care first vision, and the ongoing efforts to develop on unarmed crisis response systems. Thank you for your time. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Genevieve Clavrol. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, uh, this is Dr. Genevieve Clavrol. I'm going to speak to item two, four, 18 and 47. On item two, you know, we need to reopen. Please reopen. I mean, you are losing a lot of connection with the people, with the public. And please go back to weekly meeting on the item four about the Blue Ribbon Commission. I like a lot of the recommendation, but I think it's time that you really move on and make sure LASA leaders are not part of the solution because they are the one who have main management problem and those need to be dealt with. On item 18, I understand the worry about the strike, but I think to leave Carte Blanche for uh, Dr. Kelly is very scary. And I hope that you don't do that. And on item 47, you know, as usual, I've been complaining about Gardner. I still cannot believe what every year we pay governor to supervise further work when we have an information technology management ourselves. That should be the one that will survey further to make sure they were doing their work. To pay governor many millions every year really upset me. Anyway, have a good week and I hope you reopen, please. Do that soon. Take care. Love you. Bye. It's open. Paul. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Marcel Rodarte. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm going to be addressing uh, items 426, even though it was uh, pulled, and uh, general public comments. 
uh, this morning. Good morning, Chair Mitchell and members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Marcel Rodardi. I'm the Executive Director for the California Contract Cities Association. As I said, I'm speaking in support of items 426 and in general public comment. Uh, first, I applaud and encourage the adoption and implementation of the seven Birch recommendations. I'd also like to encourage you all to support the three amendments being proposed by the California Contract Cities. Those amendments proposed giving cities a seat at the table with the proposed new county structure. Uh, our local cities deserve to be heard on these critical issues. They also to allow for hosting funding that would provide a critical need in how we interact and reach our homeless population and providing a mechanism for the monetary or in-kind fund matching for underserved, uh, providing a mechanism for the waiver uh, of those in-kind or matching funds for underserved communities, uh, which you all can uh, define. And I wanna add on a little bit, I've heard a couple comments about the host teams. Uh, host teams are a crucial component to ensure the safety of outreach workers. These specially trained deputies have been effective and positively impacting our homeless population when deployed correctly. Allowing cities to use Measure H funding for additional host teams will give those cities leverage to prevent these teams from being used for political or other purposes. I'd also like to thank the rest of the BRCH uh, uh, Commission and the BRCH staff especially for all the hard work they've done to get us to this point. We now know, thanks to the work of the BRCH, that our existing system is not effective as it should be and the status quo needs to be changed. I urge your yes vote today on item four and encourage uh, future amendments uh, to item 26 when we see it come back. Thank you all, have a great day. Thank you, next speaker please. Our next participant is Councilwoman Adele Andrade Stadler. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, my name is Adele Andrade Stadler and I'm Vice Mayor of the City of Alhambra and a director of the San Gabriel Valley Housing Trust. I'm speaking on item four and public comment. Thank you both to Supervisors Barger and Solis for bringing forward this important motion to implement the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission on homelessness. Um, I particularly want to recognize and recommend the seven critical um, uh, recommendations. They're a critical step in improving how we address homelessness across the county, but particularly in our smaller cities. Despite our efforts, we need every opportunity. And we thank you very much, um, the opportunities to improve our responses, right? Thank you very much and I urge your support on item number four. Thank you, next speaker please. Our next participant is Richie Sergianco. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, yes, <clears throat> this is Richie Sudranko from the People's City Council. I want to call in about item 26 and general public comment. Um, for item 26, I just want to say that, you know, uh, you know, why are, why is Measure H money going to the Sheriff's Department? Um, it's supposed to be going towards like housing stuff and the host team doesn't, they admit that they don't do housing, they don't have housing. Um, so we're urging the board to pass item 26 as it is without the amendment. Um, as it stands, it's actually something that we support. Um, we just don't think that the uh, amendment would allow Measure H uh, or, or that it should allow uh, Measure H funds to go towards the Sheriff's Department. Um, in 2017, voters passed Measure H for the explicit purpose of services for the unhoused communities and housing for unhoused residents, not for subsidizing law enforcement. Um, the Sheriff's Department and other city police agencies already have the funding so sources for their core functions, which do not include addressing homelessness. I've seen the host team in Venice and they just showed up um, in full uh, riot gear, basically. Um, not, not riot gear, but they, they, they came all tooled up to the beach to, to do quote unquote outreach uh, with unhoused folks. And what, what exactly were they doing there? Because they didn't offer housing and they didn't have services. They didn't bring food, clothing, um, you know, so 
they were just there to scare people and move them away from Venice. Um, allowing these dollars from Measure H to go towards law enforcement is a step in the wrong direction. Uh, best practices and evidence-based research have demonstrated that the presence of law enforcement in homeless services is not trauma-informed and actually Excuse me? undermines the ability of Your time has expired. to strong relationships. Can we have the next speaker, please? Thank you. Google is beginning. Our next participant is Gwendolyn Julian. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you will address on public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Gwendolyn Julian, Executive Director of the Probation Oversight Commission, speaking in favor of item 23 and general public comment. Thank you, Supervisors Kuehl and Solis for including this important motion on today's agenda to support Assembly Bill 2417 and establish and implement a powerful Bill of Rights for incarcerated youth in Los Angeles County. The closure of the state's Department of Juvenile Justice presents an incredible opportunity for the county to keep young people close to their families and for us as a county to fully implement our Care First Jail's last vision by providing trauma-informed rehabilitative care to young people who were previously sent to state institutions. The phased closure of DJJ began 10 months ago and our progress has been painfully slow at the expense of now over 30 young people who are sitting at Barry J. Nidorf who had previously have gone to DJJ. Progress in selecting two sites and discussions about programming have moved forward, but new obstacles seem to come up every week. The health and well-being, opportunities for growth and rehabilitation, and preparation for re-entry for these youth hang in the balance, making the need to press forward urgent. This motion is a step forward by implementing a powerful Bill of Rights. If the motion passes today, the Probation Oversight Commission looks forward to ensuring that the department implements, embraces, and fully executes the Bill of Rights. We'll follow up through our inspections, site visits to the facilities, meetings with department staff and leadership, and regular conversations and surveys of youth about implementation, and then report that progress back to you and the public. Given that over 70% of the currently incarcerated youth are at Barry J. Nardorf Juvenile Hall, I agree it's right to start the implementation of the Bill of Rights there and then extend it to all facilities. I look forward to the benefits it will have on the humane and dignified treatment of youth in our facilities. Thank you for supporting item 23 in advance of that goal. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Veronica Lewis. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Veronica Lewis at our regular topic. I will be addressing agenda items number four, number 26, and general public comment. Supervisors, thank you for your willingness to take bold action to make sure that we're starving. I'm a vulnerable folk in an effective strategic and thoughtful manner because something does need to change and we need transformative change. And I appreciate all of your efforts. With that said, um, on agenda item number four, I just want to offer up some considerations and concerns related to some of the seven recommendations. And so for the recommendation number one related to the new county entity, I hope that and we need in order for this to make sense and to actually change some of the dynamics and the pain points that we have as providers and as people experiencing homelessness. Um, we need to make sure that the county department has meaningful authority and have the ability to really drive what our homeless service system looks like, including holding other county departments like the Department of Mental Health, Department of Health Services, and others that receive Measure H funds accountable um, to be in line with the framework. We also uh, need to make sure that it's a homeless initiative. I'm concerned about the murmurs I'm hearing related to what the structure may be like. It makes most sense for it to be the homeless initiative who has done a lot of the heavy lifting and just needs to be expanded in their role. Some of the other pieces, I know that the county currently has a um, like contracting equity work group because there's a recognition that it's very difficult to contract with the county. And so my only concern related to the new county entity is just all of the bureaucracy and unnecessary administrative burden that it creates. And so I'm hoping that some of the principles that are coming out of that work group will be applied as we, as we think about this new county entity. And I'm really concerned about the smaller agencies that have become a key part of the safety net accessing Measure H funds either as direct contractors or subcontractors will still have access. Because what we do know is the county is always looking to completely indemnify itself and that creates lots of burden. So I'm really hopeful that you can be thoughtful about that process. The other thing that's concerning is the county, as much as you try, you're not the most collaborative grant, grant administrator. And so I'm really hoping that separate from two minute public comments and listening sessions, that this new county entity continues the work that we've developed with LASA to have a meaningful collaborative process and really allow for some joint decision making. 
And the last thing I would say that needs to be considered as you're doing the analysis of creation of this top uh, new entity is that you also need to look at the competitive bid processes. And again, all of this is just looking at some of the main barriers people have to accessing county funds. In terms of recommendation number two, I wholeheartedly do believe that the city should have some money to address the, these nuances. However, it needs to be within the framework that's covered under agenda number 26. And cities need to be able to use Measure H money in line with the framework and not to criminalize homelessness. And so I do not support host teams or sheriff's department funding at all. In terms of recommendation number four, I think it would be detrimental to collapse all those teams. Seven, five to seven years ago, I was on the first ad hoc committee um, looking at governance, which created the COC board. And while I do think that there can be some consolidation, to have only one body where you have maybe one or two people with lived experience, maybe one provider, is not going to allow for um, the decisions to be made with all of the different nuances that we now have with multiple me? people at the table. Your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Our next participant is Roy Humphreys. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on public comment. You may begin. Uh, Roy Humphreys, agenda items uh, 425, 26, and 30. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission of Homelessness uh, is uh, 10 years in the making and reflecting governance in disarray and dismay. A congresswoman notes a million border crossers uh, should be blamed on uh, President Trump. So just uh, blame President Trump for th this. The commission will never realize, be realized its goals due to a profound lack of funding and failure to provide uh, secure transient uh, campsites for the homeless. Your proposed uh, 25 and 26 uh, homeless, so when you have uh, not got the funding for existing strategies and safe uh, homeless uh, camps as per the sheriff, uh, as uh, above and in, uh, insist on choking the courts with hookers instead of criminalizing uh, uh, sex, uh, blame uh, President Trump. Uh, the court system is in a profound state of uh, decay. Where's the plan? Where's the money? Blame uh, Trump. The general comment, the radar search for the public safety of Roland Heights are still lacking and Julian uh, Garcia still has a job. Blame Trump. The pro Martinez House on uh, Otterbein has not been red tagged and condemned for demolition, blame Trump. Joe Gadosh County Roads is taking one year to do a six month job on Otterbein uh, street cleaning, uh, still employed, uh, blame Trump. The uh, works app process, and I talked to uh, Ryan Serrano about this, does not have a number which can be called to clear problems with that app and uh, function, blame Trump. Homeless insurrection uh, a la uh, Venice Beach, blame Trump. My YouTube channel, which is now 300 subscribers, and I encourage you to subscribe, blame me. Sanctuary anything is criminal, blame yourselves. Posting of a Bill of Rights means nothing without enforcement. The big issue here Excuse me? is money. Where Your is time money? has expired. Next speaker, please. Budget of six billion dollars. Our next participant is Alexia Cena. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, my name is Alexia Cena and I'm with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. I'm speaking in full support of agenda item number 23, safeguarding the rights of incarcerated youth. As someone who works closely with directed impacted youth, I know that most of them are not aware of their rights. Youth who are incarcerated in LA County deserve to have the rights acknowledged and communicated to them with language that young people can understand as well as rights that are enforced. Supporting this motion and this bill will ensure that youth are living in a safe, healthy, and clean environment working towards positive youth development and healing. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Richard Corral. Please state the agenda items you will be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. My name is Richard Corral and I'm the Homeless Service Coordinator for the City of South Omani. I am speaking on agenda item 426 and general public comment. 
Thank you, Supervisors Barger and Solis for bringing forward this important motion to implement the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness. The Birch listened to over 280 stakeholders to improve how the county governs its homeless services system and the seven recommendations significantly improve how we address homelessness across the county, particularly in smaller cities like South El Monte. Most importantly, the recommendations give cities outside the city of Los Angeles a seat at the table to more effectively impact homelessness locally. The city of South El Monte has been addressing homelessness in innovative ways through a regional collaboration with El Monte and Baldwin Park called the Mid-Valley Collaborative on Homelessness, prevention and diversion programs, local housing continuum that includes emergency housing provided at local motels, bridge housing, and increasingly permanent housing solutions. However, we need resources to continue and expand this important and impactful work through improved partnership with the county. To this end, the proposed local solutions fund is essential to sustain our local efforts and therefore I'd like to propose the following enhancements to the local solutions fund. First, small cities like South El Monte would like to utilize Measure H funds to fund the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Homeless Outreach Services Team like HOST. We currently do contract for sheriff services as well as cities with their own police departments that actively partner uh, with the host teams would like to utilize Measure H funds uh, to continue this work. Clearly outline how disadvantaged communities will be able to benefit from the fund and participate in matching contributions programs. By defining a process that waives disadvantaged communities matching contribution, diversity, equity, inclusion will be at the forefront of the program's mission and design. Also, the motion proposed to increase collaboration across the county by providing cities the opportunity to be part of the strategy and vision for addressing homeless countywide. Therefore, let's increase city leadership representation across all committees mentioned in the Burgess recommendation, including the single body that will be consolidating the Lasta Commission, Kachima Care Board, CS Policy Council, as well as the executive uh, level action team. Uh, item number four is a critical step forward that will improve our response to homelessness for all residents in the county, and thank you for your leadership. Regarding item number 26, implementing a new framework to end homelessness in Los Angeles County, um, we're supporting the, implement, the implementing a new framework uh, to end homelessness, championed by Supervisors Hahn and Barger. The County Homeless Initiative under the Director, Executive Director uh, Todorov, conducted an exhaustive process, engaging a variety of stakeholders um, to help streamline the county process uh, to get more people off the streets and into housing. The proposed framework offers a powerful regional vision, includes cities, COGS, space-based organizations, uh, et cetera, as well as governments um, to determine how we can collectively better support tens of thousands of mentally ill people without stable housing today. In discussions about the homeless uh, rehousing system, community members emphasize the need for more interim and per permit housing, which I think is essential to the work that we're doing locally. Um, once this item returns for consideration, I encourage additional amendments and um, item number 26. Excuse me. Critical step forward. That we'll Your time on. has Thank expired. You. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Sophia Cristo. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Sophia Cristo. I'm speaking on item 23. Um, good morning. I'm a youth advocate with the anti recidivism Coalition. And as a youth who was incarcerated from the ages of 14 to 24, I know firsthand how important it is for youth to have rights as well as being informed of exactly what they are. Being incarcerated at a young age is already scary and traumatizing enough, not to mention the trauma the youth have experienced before incarceration. Making sure the youth have rights as well as knowing what they are allows them to feel safe and secure in such an unfamiliar and damaging environment. Ensuring these youth know what should or shouldn't take place, what they are allowed and what they can do if their needs aren't met gives them a voice and a chance to defend themselves. It's extremely important and makes a huge difference to our youth and for our youth to have rights in such settings. We want to make sure our youth are safe and taken care of at all times, and then having rights only strengthens and makes that want and need for them a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Hakan Williams. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Hokan Williams, speaking on uh, speaking in support of Agenda Item 24 on the Santa Susana Field Lab. Uh, the Santa Susana cleanup was supposed to be done by 2017, still has not even really begun, and the state now seems poised to allow the polluters to break out of the cleanup agreements that they signed. I very much appreciate the county's unwavering commitment to the Santa Susana cleanup. I ask that you vote to approve the resolution on the Santa Susana Field Lab. 
Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Joseph Lyons. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Joseph Lyons. I am speaking to items 426 and open public comment. Uh, and I want to begin by thanking uh, Supervisors uh, Solis uh, and Barber, my two favorite supervisors, for uh, remaining faithful to the local um, implementation and uh, uh, projects uh, and uh, for their, um, uh, again, support for moving the, um, the recommendations of the uh, committee commission forward. Uh, correcting the dysfunctional and ambiguous relationships that exist among the numerous entities and stakeholders named in the Blue Ribbon Commission on homelessness and the attendant lack of accountability this causes are both critical to the successful implementation of the recommendations contained in the commission's report. And we are all aware of the urgency associated with the restructuring and repurposing efforts and the need to expedite achieving an objective whenever possible. To that end, I offer the following uh, for your consideration uh, and action at today's meeting. Firstly, bring into alignment with the 2017-2017 HUD regulations losses role uh, as the LA Continuum of Care's collaborative affiliate and the LA uh, Continuum of Care and its board. Being recognized as the governing and oversight entity with the responsibility to manage and administer HUD's funded programs and in collaboration with its designated uh, collaborative affiliate LASA, which through its commission has assumed a quasi governance role over its own and other independent entities, including the Continuum of Care Board. Doing so would establish the right and legal relationship among the four entities that are the primary source of confusion associated with the governance and accountability uh, for HUD funded programs and by extension would provide a framework in which to establish the right and legal relationships among the entities and stakeholders currently recognized as participants in the homeless initiative, as well as those that are expecting to be uh, included based on the recommendations implementation. Secondly, uh, name the housing, uh, the homeless initiative as the entity to administer and manage the remainder of Measure H tax revenues and all the grants and awards designated to address homelessness at the countywide level using county staff and resources and the procurement of the necessary ancillary and specialized technical assistance from LASA as appropriate. Doing so would establish the right and legal control over the use of the, of the county homeless funds and the accountability for the programs and services uh, provided uh, with these funds, including adding local solutions as a priority addition to the implementation of Measure H strategies. And with regards to the local solutions, I think that the reference to requiring recipients to provide matching funds is not only demeaning and exclusionary uh, to those recipients that would be awarded funding, presumably based on the merits of the project and its contribution to ending and preventing homelessness locally. Excuse me? Matching funds requirements Your have time has expired. Can we have the next speaker, please? A program expansion into local. Our next participant is Sarah Garfinkel. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. I am addressing item number four on general comment. Chair Mitchell and Supervisors, good morning. Again, my name is Sarah Garfinkel and I'm calling on behalf of VICA, the Valley Industry and Commerce Association. We are in support of implementing the Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness Recommendations motion. Our county needs the Blue Ribbon Commission's recommendations, specifically that the county strengthen its involvement in cities and councils of government by establishing multi-year local solutions funds for jurisdictions that commit to providing in-kind or matching contributions for the development of service programs or housing. Additionally, recommendations that address revamping homeless services governance are essential. Throughout our homeless services offerings, we are lacking leadership and accountability. We strongly support this motion and believe that the seven recommendations named within it will result in significantly improving the efficiency and efficacy of helping people experiencing homelessness. Our local taxpayers deserve to see their dollars at work in their own communities. We urge you to support this motion and thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Jose Usuna. 
Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. I'll be addressing item number 26 and general public comment. Um, first of all, I am the housing justice manager for Brilliant Corners, one of the county's strongest housing partners. I'm also the fourth district appointee for the public safety realignment team. I wanna remind the board that law enforcement does not equal housing services. Although we support item number 26, we do not support the amendment that would allow funding to go to any law enforcement agency. We cannot continue to criminalize our unhoused community members and that is what law enforcement does when they engage our unhoused community members. That is their job to enforce laws, not to provide housing or social services. Let's remember that. I have not heard any service providers or any unhoused community members express any kind of interest in law enforcement being funded uh, by Measure H funding. I voted for Measure H with the idea that this would fund housing services not continue to build up the war chest for law enforcement agencies to continue to fund their war on our unhoused community members. Um, I am in favor of local solutions just as long as they are not law enforcement based solutions to deal with the crisis around those that are unhoused. I urge the board to remove the amendments that would allow funding to go to any law enforcement agencies. I urge the supervisor from the district that I live in, Supervisor Han, I urge you to pull the amendments that would cause, that would allow law enforcement to be funded by Measure H funding. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Jenny Mack. Please state the agenda items you will be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, <clears throat> I am addressing uh, agenda item number 24 and um, general comment. First, I'd like to thank Chul and Barger for proposing this motion to ensure the complete cleanup um, of the Santa Savannah Field Lab honoring the 2007 and 2010 agreements. Um, your legacy of championing this cause is greatly appreciated um, by our community. And some of the cleanup's strongest advocates soon leaving office, we must act quickly and aggressively to bring the responsible parties into compliance, especially as we expect the EIR to be finalized this summer. Um, we look forward to working in cooperation with the LA City Attorney and Ventura County Council and NGOs to take legal action. It will take all of these entities working together in a timely manner to hold the responsible parties to their obligations at this site. Um, the concerns, as you know, of the responsible parties are strictly financial. They intend to in avoid investing in a comprehensive cleanup by any and all means necessary. Um, we hope that as a united front, uh, we can show them that you intend to protect the health of our communities with the same resolve. We hope that you approve the motion of agenda item 24. Um, many families like mine uh, that can't be here today because of work and other obligations. I want to thank you for taking action to ensure that this contamination at SSF, SSFL is finally remediated and that the cultural resources preserved and protected and the land and habitat is restored for future generations. Um, so thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Sharon Stand, please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address a general public comment. You may begin. Hello, this is Sharon Sand from Trust for Public Land speaking on item 74A and general comment. We want to thank Supervisor Solis and her leadership for introducing the motion to support Governor Newsom's 30 by 30 initiative. This proposal will help close the nature gap that exists in California especially in LA County. We also want to applaud the work initiated by LA County Parks for the Regional and Rural Park Needs Assessment to give LA a leg up in competing for funds. And we want to thank LA County Parks for their vision and diligence in preparing 
for this. We ask for a unanimous vote in support of this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Roxanne Hoge. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, my name is Roxanne Hogue, um, and I'll be addressing set items two um, and nine, a little bit of 19, and general public comment. Um, I just want to make it very clear that what's been happening to our children and on public transportation under the dictatorship, really, of Barbara Ferrer is absolutely unconscionable. She needs to be questioned directly about why she is not aligning with the state. Um, she recently said in a presentation she made to USC's public, uh, School of Public Health that uh, it's very complicated telling people the truth, and I think we need to have her address that. Um, in addition, it's a bit spurious to proclaim May Mental Health Month when almost all of the steps she recommended and the board agreed to harmed our children's mental health and that of young people in Los Angeles County egregiously. Forced masking, forced vaccination, and shutting them out of school for over a year in public and private school at the behest of public sector unions was actually a criminal activity. In addition, just a quick note, um, we should not support housing first model as it's been shown to be an absolute disaster everywhere it's been tried. A note about the budget is that we definitely do not need four new departments unless we're going to eliminate some of the duplication of departments we already have. And so when we're looking at our proposed budget for the future, I want to point out that we have more than enough money to have clean streets and safe streets, and we should make an effort to at least pretend we're spending money on public services. Lastly, it's wonderful that there are new and open offices uh, for the Board of Supervisors, and I can't wait to join you as I'm running in the third district, but open meetings and the consent of the governed and the will of the people mean that you should be accessible to all. COVID is endemic, not pandemic, and those restrictions no longer count. Please allow the people of Los Angeles to address their concerns to you. Hope you all have a wonderful day and look forward to meeting you all very soon. You can find me at superroxanne.com. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Doug Forbes. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. My name is Doug Forbes. I'm addressing item 10 in general comment. I'm, in, I'm the founder and president of Meow Meow Foundation based here in Los Angeles County. Our mission is to make camps and aquatics safe for children nationwide. I'm pleased that the County of Los Angeles would introduce this proclamation in honor of my daughter, Roxy, who was killed by preventable drowning at an Altadena summer camp, and in support of millions of children who deserve long overdue protections that will help eliminate the number one injury-related cause of death for children one to four, and number two for children five to 14. I would to thank Supervisor Solis and Barger for introducing this proclamation and our forthcoming drowning prevention and camp safety motion. I want to make sure, however, that all of us understand how proclamations and ordinances are only as worthy as their real-life application to protect hardworking families throughout this mighty county of ours. Last year, we successfully persuaded the state to adopt uh, Roxy's Wish Drowning Prevention Week for Children as a perennial resolution, and we, are already, we already see its impact. We've introduced the same in other states. We are here to do the work that will protect millions of young lives right here in our county. I want to thank you and wish you an early happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Eric Previn. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, I'll address on all items in a, uh, a general public comment. How much time do I get? Three minutes, please begin. Your Honor, how much time do I get? Three minutes, please begin. Three total, two on the items and one on uh, general. Correct, please begin. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Let's, let's go along with that. Let's, let's try to be appropriate. The, um, 
I want to just call out the Santa Susana callers. I am very concerned about this situation as well. What we've got is toxic uh, matter all over the place. Not all over the place, but in that area. And Rocketdyne and these big corporations are responsible and we're supposed to clean it up, haven't cleaned it up. The federal government was supposed to help clean it up. And then Andrea Orton, the former LA County Council, who has been a dogged and veteran fighter, uh, took it all the way up to a high court and they rejected her uh, and said, no, unfortunately, we will not be able to force the federal government to do it right. So then Mike Fuhr and Paul Krikorian and Greg Smith of Waste Management decided, let's spend 600 and something thousand dollars of city money because the city wants to help the county and the county wants to help the city sometimes when they're not going to battle over the homeless crisis, for example. And here, uh, a great firm by the name of Myers, Nave, Reback, and Silver were brought in to eat up the $650,000 chasing down the lane that was not the right avenue, apparently. Now, we don't want Greg Smith's guys and all the trucks, he's a lobbyist and a council member who filled in for Mitch Englander, the FBI, and Didi before John Lee, who seems to be glancing right past getting indicted, but it's unclear, um, to get the job to move the stuff. We don't even know that moving the stuff is the right way to handle it. Isn't there a way to, like, suppress it through some clever way? Because turning it into a transport mission is a terrible, terrible idea. And I know that the county and the board and the people who live in and around the area don't want that, but we don't want our children exposed to this toxic stuff for very long, any longer. It's intolerable. It is intolerable. And, you know, we've got a lot of lawyers who are gonna make a lot of, you know, money, but we've got to take care of the task at hand. That seems to be one of our big problems at Board of Supervisors is we don't mind endless litigation, and then we bury the litigation report. Why hasn't that been brought forward, by the way? How come, you know, instead of the new litigation report, we've got the county council stepping off, uh, and we've got a new uh, county council in there, Don Harrison, who's not what I would describe as new. She's one of the old veteran uh, insiders. And I, you know, no disrespect to her if she would put the Covington and Burling uh, records on the table. And we can't have Kubata and Shalman also chasing the sheriff if they're being the honest brokers trying to look at the county's inside fraud. And no disrespect to Mr. Gabay and the CEO's office in real estate, but what a horrifying reveal that exactly what we fear, that people are doing dirty and taking payments here and there, which is what they showed with that guy Shepos. Uh, this is why we really need to have independent look at, this, at the county by transparency. Excuse me? You need to show all the legal... Your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Our next participant is Gina Thornburg. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, this is Gina Thornburg of Coalition for Valley Neighborhoods. I'm speaking only on agenda item number 24. The Santa Susana Field Lab should have been cleaned up years ago, but various private, federal, and state agencies have failed the communities adjacent and near the lab site. The radiologic and chemical contamination at the SSFL have led to countless cases of cancer, including in children. I urge the supervisors to support agenda item number 24 to ensure comprehensive cleanup and remediation of the SSFL contamination to protect public health. Enforcement of a cleanup conforming to the 2007 and 2010 agreements can be done safely. The technology, knowledge, and skill exist. We need the political support. Thank you, Supervisors Kuhl and Barger, for placing this item on the agenda. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Michael Webb. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you. I'll be speaking in favor of item 25 in general public comment. I'd like to thank Supervisor Hahn and Chair Mitchell for uh, bringing forward this motion in support of Assembly Member Mirasuchi Bill AB 2220, which would create a pilot program for homeless courts throughout the state. It's based on the success that we've had in Redondo, uh, in San Diego, in Sacramento. It would set up a statewide pilot program administered by the Judicial Council and would provide grant funding for um, eligible uh, programs. 
Our outdoor homeless court brings the justice system out of the courthouse and into the community in a non-threatening, less intimidating way. It's entirely voluntary. It's free plea. Uh, typically, as prosecutors, we would want a plea first um, so that there'd be some sort of punishment hanging over their head. We deliberately set this up um, as to not have that because we wanted to provide resources to help people who are motivated in, in obtaining permanent housing. And so we bring all the resources that could be needed, additional mental health and addiction counseling services, um, all the services to become doc, document ready, job placement services, and of course, we provide transitional housing and permanent supportive housing. This bill would set up a statewide program that would fund um, for, uh, homeless courts that provide these necessary services while still allowing flexibility for local jurisdictions um, to address their uh, particular needs. So I thank you very much and I urge support of um, item number 25. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Sean Gage. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, I'll be addressing item 23 for general public comment. My name is Sean Gage. I'm with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, Hope and Redemption Team. I'm a supporter of item 23, the Youth Rights Bill. Honestly, when I was in juvenile hall, I had no idea that I had any rights. Therefore, I had no way of advocating for myself or that there was someone even really that I could address my issue with. With this youth rights, with this youth rights bill, our youth would have access to their rights in one place and in understandable length. I believe that when they know their rights, they know their voice matters, and they have an advocate for their voice, it gives them accountability, paving the way for successful rehabilitation and successful reentry to our society. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Sylvia Burleson Brown. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, this is Sylvia and I'm addressing on general public comment. I've been going to Catherine Barger's office because I'm in her district, but this reflects all Los Angeles County. I really am asking for Los Angeles County and you as our leaders in your position to stop all what's going on in county employment, all the uh, authoritative oppression, social, economic, political, legal culture, and institutional oppression, and also that they allow for social oppression that goes on this office. I tried to resign out of the rest yesterday and return my equipment, and it was horrible how I was treated over in that Lancaster um, DPSS office where I used to work there when I came to return my equipment. Then I went into a panic attack. They didn't try to do no wellness or anything. Uh, then I tried to uh, uh, call them on the way home. I put myself and my grandchildren because they went to me to help return that office to the district office. Yes, I transferred to Northridge, but they said we will get accommodated. Excuse and me. We're not, the, the employees are not Your getting time has expired. So Next I'm speaker, please. Out on the behalf of the employees, that they're not getting accommodated. It's a two way contract, but they only Excuse me. fire people. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is William Harrison. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. I'll be addressing general public comment. My name is William Harrison. I live in District 1. I spoke to uh, the council on 419 regarding the issue with my school districts. And as I finished my study, I want to go over this with you. In the Walnut Valley Unified School District, 10 of the 15 schools have no blacks on staff at all. That's from the principal to the maintenance. Uh, three of the 15 schools have two blacks on staff. The district office has no one black on staff. World Unified School District has nine of their 19 schools have no blacks on staff. Again, from the principal to the maintenance. 
Seven of the 19 have two on staff. District office, nobody black on staff. Now, who are these black kids role models when they go to school? I've been fighting this battle for a few years. So I'm coming to the county supervisors. I know that you cannot make the school districts do anything about this, but I would hope that you'll look into it to see if I'm right or not. I do hope that I'm wrong, but after doing my study, I'm, I'm positive I'm right in a very sad situation where in Southern California, County of Los Angeles, that we have numbers like this, schools with absolutely nobody black on staff, Excuse me? no black teacher, no black Your librarian. Your time has expired. Black principal, black we have the next center. speaker, please. That was it. That was quick. Next speaker, please. May we have the next speaker, please? Yes. The next speaker will be Michael Villega. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. Michael Villegas, Community Preservation Manager and Homelessness Liaison for the City of Santa Cruz on the Community Task Force on Homelessness, and I will be speaking on item four. On behalf of the City of Santa Cruz, I'd like to express support for item four and urge you to support the item. Following an extensive series of meetings, presentations, interviews, and listening sessions with stakeholders, subject matter experts, and community members over a six month period, the BRCH has developed a comprehensive set of recommendations that will significantly enhance transparency, inclusiveness, and accountability of Measure H funding and homelessness services. We are appreciative of the board's updated motion to increase representation for cities across the committees mentioned in the BRCH's recommendations and to allow for Measure H funding to be used for local initiatives, including the Los Angeles, Los Angeles County Sheriff's host team. We'd also wanted to express our appreciation for Supervisors Barger and Solis for bringing these recommendations forward, and the BRCH's commissioners and staff who worked tirelessly the past six months to, to develop these recommendations and framework. Thank you for your consideration on this matter. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Elliot Katz. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Yeah, I'm just gonna address uh, item 26. Um, I, I, which one of you guys are gonna get up and tell your constituents that you lied to us in 2017 when you told us that Measure H money was gonna go to services for the homeless and you know were you lying about that then and knew all along that a lot of this money was going to go to law enforcement you know so you guys look terrible you're making la look bad you know and and i i i just don't understand what's going on with you guys um it's a bad look your images are are, are absolutely um ruined for all of this shit. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Donald Harland. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Oi. Hello, this is Donald. Uh, I'd like to comment on consent calendar no, uh, number four. General agenda items number 24, 31, 41, 55. Uh, and I need to know if the special district agenda will get its own comment period um, and a general public comment. To clarify, no, it will not. Okay. This uh, is I'm all general public comment. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number four, thank you. I'll continue. Uh, just a, a, rec a recommendation. Uh, to hire people who do due diligence on properties that don't just try to steal properties, uh, say, hey, that's vacant land, uh, let's try and claim that, uh, and hire people that aren't criminals for a uh, consent calendar agenda item number four. Uh, agenda item number 24, uh, no. Uh, definitely uh, Santa Susana Field Lab cleanup has already been completed uh, for the parks that, that, that was due for that. Uh, people have uh, polluted more areas. Uh, you shouldn't try and fix... Uh, defense companies illegally with uh, um, cleanups for stuff, people that commit crimes there and do stuff like the uh, uh, supervisor members who uh, recommended this agenda item. 
uh, West Los Angeles Courthouse, agenda item number 31, uh, 1633 Purdue Avenue. Uh, it says 2010, there's an unverified parcel sale uh, and uh, that you guys are trying to do a lease agreement. Uh, if you guys want to do some development or something, uh, uh, yeah, why don't you secure that deal? Make sure that, that I think what they did there is they modified the assessor report. Try it. Those modified assessor reports where these are uh, properties I'm, I'm, lay, I'm listing that are illegal. Uh, they tried to pay somebody for these properties that it didn't belong to. So uh, definitely they should continue development with government money on these properties. Agenda item number 41, uh, purchase agreement for default tax properties. This is a, a tax default scheme. They create a false accessory report, trying to claim the property. They default the taxes. I mean, they're trying to claim this property over uh, $24,000 or $6,000. I'm not even sure what those guys are up to. Uh, and then they get somebody uh, crooked in the government to uh, sell it to them. Just agenda item number 41, no. Uh, just uh, go over that one a little more. Uh, agenda item number 55, uh, Ford Theaters hiking trail project. Uh, there's questionable exchanges uh, three times of the uh, county assessor reports around 2005 and 2007. Uh, I would really look at that. I, I can't imagine why they'd be moving that back and forth, handing it back and forth. There's something going on over there probably. Uh, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, bringing people to those hills over there is gonna help anything. Probably that they would create a problem. Probably no on number 555. Uh, People are gonna hike over there or whatever, but uh, uh, you shouldn't try and develop anything over there or do anything like that. Uh, you're just enabling those people over there for more crime. Uh, special district agenda 1D um, and uh, CS5. Uh, I think that they probably should do more due diligence on those. You know, uh, these uh, real estate companies in there, uh, there's five of them, uh, there's contracts, or uh, for them to do contract, I, I would really take a look at these companies. Uh, uh, Excuse me? The owner of the, who's your time has expired. Can we have the next speaker, please? Thank you for your time. Our next participant is Gene Plum. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, uh, Gene Plum in Chatsworth, owner of Legal Equestrian property zone for horsekeeping. I will be talking on general comment only. I want to address land that strides between uh, Supervisor Barger and Supervisor Kuehl. At this time, it is the four fabulous county parks that were uh, secured by Supervisor Antonovich and Supervisor Barger that front Browns Canyon. Uh, they. Their only access is from Browns Canyon Road. That is the Antonovich Park, Hidden Creeks Park, the Quarry Project, and the Browns Canyon Park, offering our area in the Northwest Valley thousands of acres of riding, hiking, and bicycling land untouched and unmarred by a civilization. My question is, Supervisor Barger, your $3 million commitment to uh, construct horse facilities, minimal at best, but still appreciated, in Browns Canyon Equestrian Park have not been seen. The land has been cleared, and this park is a central point between the Hidden Creeks Trails Project which is almost complete, and the vast Excuse me? Porter Ranch Trails Project. Your time has expired. Where is our uh, We have the next speaker, please. Park? Our next participant is Daniel Hirsch. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. My name is Dan Hirsch from the Committee to Bridge the Gap. I'm speaking in strong support of item 24, the Santa Susana Field Lab cleanup, plus a general public comment. In 1979, while teaching at UCLA, students working with me uncovered documents showing that a partial nuclear meltdown had occurred in the Santa Susana that had been kept secret for decades. I've worked over 42 years since then to get the site cleaned up from that accident and numerous other radioactive and toxic chemical releases. In 2007 and 2010, Legally binding agreements were signed requiring full cleanup by 2017. But we're in 2022, and the required soil cleanup has not even begun. This resolution would add 
carrying out those agreements through the county, state, and federal legislative agendas and direct county council to explore cooperative legal action with LA City and Ventura County, as well as non-governmental organizations to finally get the site fully cleaned up as promised. It is critical to the health of the three quarters of a million people who live near the site, and I support its adoption. Now a general public comment and a little personal. I want to thank Supervisors Barger and Kuehl for their long work together on this issue. And I particularly want to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to Supervisor Kuehl, who has worked persistently on it for 20 years since she was in the state legislature. I've known her since she was an assistant dean at UCLA, and I cannot put into words the appreciation and admiration we have for her decades of committed and effective work in the public interest. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Next speaker, please. As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one then zero a second time or you'll be removed from queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Para dirigirse a la supervisora, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione uno y luego cero en este momento. No presione uno y cero por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Harry Samerdijan. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning, honorable supervisors. My name is Harry Samerdijan and, and I'm a senior manager with the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to speak on item number four, please. The LA Chamber fully supports the recommendations presented in the Blue Ribbon Commission governance report adopted on March 30th. 2022. Uh, this important report entails seven recommendations that reflect the urgency for refined governance models that can deliver improved and accelerated results incorporating the diverse needs of the region, its 88 cities, and the unincorporated areas of the county. This report was generated as a result of the growing humanitarian crisis of homelessness in our county and the need to reform the existing system. The report is the product of comprehensive testimony received over the past six months. Stakeholders, including the LA Chamber's president and CEO, Maria Salinas, provided important feedback to the commission to better address the homelessness crisis. We commend the members of the commission for their hard work and strongly encourage the Board of Supervisors to implement these recommendations. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Anne Miskey. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. I'm Anne Miskey, CEO of Union Station Homeless Services. I'm speaking on agenda items four and 26 in general com public comment. I would like to begin by thanking the Board of Supervisors for their ongoing commitment to the issue of homelessness. As someone who has worked for many years on this issue nationally and locally in both LA City and LA County, I am somewhat concerned by this motion. While there can be no doubt that our system is far from perfect and that there continue to be many challenges, we've worked hard over the past few years to build a system that has effectively and permanently housed tens of thousands of people in spite of the many challenges. The fact that we've not solved homelessness is not because of failings from our homeless system or approach but is in fact because of the myriad of deep-seated issues that continue to go undressed in our communities, housing, low wages, and racial inequity. There is no doubt that there are inefficiencies in the system and the Blue Ribbon Commission has addressed some of these in ways which will be helpful. But I am concerned that we may also do away with the progress we have made in building evidence-based and effective practices that focus on ending homelessness for people rather than sweeping them off the streets or criminalizing them. And while I, we all agree with the importance of working in partnership with local communities and support their need for increased funding, we also must not move away from a regional approach and must continue to provide resources based on need. I am also strongly opposed to agenda item 26 to remove funding from organizations who deeply understand and practice evidence-based practices which end homelessness 
To fund law enforcement, which already receives county funding, is misguided and will not be effective. We work closely with the police as valued partners, but their purpose is different, and using them to end homelessness is not effective. It will take funding from where it is needed and return us to a system where those experiencing homelessness will be increasingly criminalized without providing access to housing or services. We all know what it will take to end homelessness, which is to stop the inflow, allow and create affordable housing in every community, and provide the services to get and keep people housed. We thank you again for your attention to this matter. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is George Pancake. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, um, good morning, supervisors. My name is Mr. Pancake. I'm with LA Can. I'm speaking on the agenda item, general comment um, 26. Uh, asking the supervisors to fully reject any amendment to Measure H, Measure H, I'm in support of the original Measure H for what it was intended to divest in incarceration, more jails, and policing, and invest in housing, the homeless, and um, homeless services. And I, I'm going to say, tell you like this, law enforcement definitely cannot be trusted in light of the recent um, disclosed unacceptable practices and so i'm asking the supervisors to fully reject amendment any amendment to measure h and i have a little song then an but came to venice riding on his pony he said he was there the house of folks but the help is image only then an but you must go then an but you must go then an but you must go so ride off on your pony thank you very much Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our, our next participant is Paul Rudenstein. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. Good morning, members of the board. I'm Paul Rubenstein, Vice President of External Affairs at St. Joseph Center. I'll be speaking to items 4, 26, and general public comment. St. Joseph Center appreciates the time and the dedication of the Blue Ring Commission on Homelessness. We also have concerns with the next steps to the Commission's recommendations. Our concerns are around timeline and implementation. For recommendation number one, a new county entity, we know that developing an entirely new office or department would require multiple significant shifts and a major allocation of time and resources, all while we are in the middle of a crisis. We urge you to not discard the leadership we have at hand in the Office of the Homeless Initiative, because now is not the time to reinvent the wheel. In recommendation number two, local solutions. We're deeply concerned about the impact of the local solutions fund on the efficacy of our overall efforts. It is vitally important that the permitted uses of this funding align with the county homelessness strategies. We must also take care to ensure that the local solutions fund does not result in duplicative contracting processes or create additional administrative burdens for service providers that will inevitably take away from direct services. Additionally, it is critical that the county both measure and illustrate for all cities where measure H resources are currently being deployed. We must establish this factual baseline to ensure that future shifts in funding are actually grounded in equity and need. On recommendation number six, data and metrics, as the commission's report made clear, our systems must improve access for data for providers, the government, and the public. However, expanding access to data is distinct from personal access, uh, per access to personal information, which is confidential and protected. Only members of a person's care team need or should have access to their personal information. While the Blue Ribbon Commission's recommendations suggest major structural changes, the motion to implement a new framework to end homelessness in Los Angeles offers us a way forward now. We urge the board to adopt language to prioritize this path and ensure the progress it offers is not impeded by the inevitably slower process of implementing the Blue Ribbon Commission's recommendation. Finally, I would like to address the question of allocating Measure H funds for law enforcement. Our successful interventions result in housing placement, not simply the clearing of spaces. LA County Sheriff host teams cannot house people or retain them in housing. Please do not divert any of this unique resource to provide additional funding to law enforcement agencies, which are already among the most well-funded public entities. I thank you for your time this morning and for your thoughtful consideration of these vital issues. Thank you. Next speaker, please. 
Our next participant is Greg Thompson. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, honorable supervisors. Uh, my name is Greg Thompson. I'm the executive director of the public authority. We want run the IHSS register for LA County. I'll be speaking on item number 29, item number 33 and general comment. Um, for item number 29, I encourage you and fully support taking a look at the Commission on Disabilities and looking at the role of the membership and their duties. I think uh, IHSS and others with living with disabilities work is critically important and that commission has been doing an excellent job and I hope that you will appoint some people to represent IHSS. Item 39, we are extremely excited about the new LA County Department on Disability and Community Services. And again, we are hoping that you will, this new department will work in collaboration with the Department of Public Social Services and uh, PASC so that we can develop a stronger and more effective registry. I'd also ask, would like to ask the board if they would consider writing a letter in support of assembly member Carla's budget request to restore funding for the IHSS public authority governing boards and advisory commissions. It's a $26 million state investment, which would be matched by the Fed federal government and should be no cost to LA County. This is a critical advisory group that provides information to the central departments on how IHSS is being run in LA County. And I would also consider uh, the board supporting an increase to the state allocation for public authorities. Again, this is a state and federal funded program and should be no additional cost to the county. Thank you very much for the great work you're doing. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Camillo Loxi. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, my name is Camilo. I'll be addressing item 26. I uh, voted for measure H uh, with zero uh, forewarning or intent that elected officials or city managers would use that, uh, would try to use that money for the sheriff. Uh, the host program has not been proven to be effective. It's been proven to be a political tool used by the sheriff for PR. And I do not see why something that voters voted for uh, should be manipulated to go towards the sheriff. We support the measure as is and do not think that these blue ribbon recommendations for extra funding to go to the host team is necessary or fiscally responsible. Um, it is not something that the voters were ever intending for, for these funds to be used. And I think it is uh, quite shameful to manipulate a voter approved measure to send more money to the sheriff it is unnecessary and unconscionable, especially at a time where the sheriff is out of control and spending on the sheriff's department is out of control as well. So I urge you to please reject that amendment and go forward with Excuse me? this as is. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Eurico Ruzi Sparza. Our per please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on the general public comment. You may begin. Hi, um, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Eurico Ruzi Sparza and I'm with the city of Baldwin Park as well as the lead um, applicant for the Mid, Mid Valley Collaborative on Homelessness. And we are calling to, to urge the support of 
item number four. Um, the city of Baldwin Park, along with our cohort cities in the San Gabriel Valley, have stepped up in, a, in an innovative way to address homelessness locally. And we urge um, and thank the supervisors for all of their hard work and dedication to this effort. Uh, we would also like to support uh, the seven recommendations that were brought forth by the Blue Ribbon Commission and thank them for their hard work on this issue. We would like to once again um, call for the support of the uh, strategies to streamline LASA and to give local cities and local jurisdictions a seat at that table. Uh, the city of Baldwin Park has specifically addressed homelessness in a very innovative way with the creation of the Esperanza Villa Tiny Home Village, which um, has created 25 units of bridge housing in an astonishing amount of time of just a little over four months. Excuse me? We, mm, excuse uh, me. Yes. Your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, Thank please? You. Our next participant is Victoria G. Please state the agenda items she'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Victoria Gomez and I'm working with the Young Women's Freedom Center. I will be commenting on motion 17 and 23. Um, I first wanna say thank you to Supervisors Quell and Mitchell for um, promoting motion 17. We are in support and believe that women need and deserve access to resources that are safe and trustworthy regarding their personal health. Um, we believe that women should make their own decisions and have self-determination and agency um, for what happens to their bodies. So we are in support of motion 17. We also are in support of motion 23 and thank uh, Supervisor Quallen Solis as well. Uh, I am a constituent of Supervisor Solis and I am a young Latina woman um, and believe that youth deserve to know their rights and have them protected. They also deserve to know how to call on their ombudsman to receive support. An important piece of um, this bill would also create a mechanism for, sur for surveying youth on their, ex on their experience and evaluation of the Bill of Rights, um, which is important to continue to make sure that rights and laws are appropriate and relevant to those that they are intended for and impact. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. May we have a next speaker, please? Our next participant is Shane Hayes. Please state the agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, my name is Shane Hayes and I am speaking in support of agenda item number 24 and on general public comment. I live four miles from the famous Santa Field Lab and I urge you to vote in support of agenda number 24. Uh, agenda item number 24. Thank you for your continued support uh, of the full SSFL cleanup. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our time our next, for our time for you. public speakers you, has you. ended. With the hour of 1108 having arrived, our 90 minutes um, has lapsed. We want to thank all who called in to speak. If you were unable to provide your comments, you may still submit written comments as indicated on the agenda. And we'll continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of our official record. Executive officer, please indicate the agenda item numbers on which we will be voting today. The following items are before you. Item 3, 5 through 10, 12 through 15, 18, 19 with Supervisor Barger voting no, 20 through 22, 24, 27 through 29, 30, with this item being removed from future agendas, 31 through 73, 74A and 74B, 77, 79 and 80, and 1D through 3D. I'll make the motion, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl, to approve these items with the exceptions noted by the Executive Officer. Please call the roll. Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Colleagues, we're going to begin with set matters one and two, then items four and 26 together, which will be, ta which will be taken together, followed by items 11, 16, and 17, then items 23 and 25, 
and finishing with public hearing item 81. In again with set matter one, our American Rescue Plan funding report. I think Dr. Scores, Executive Director of our Racial Equity and, and Fire Chief Osby, are here to make a presentation. Dr. Scorza? Good morning. Yes, good morning, Madam Chair and Supervisors. It's an incredible pleasure to see all of you today. Um, really happy to be here. Today's presentation marks the ninth update in our series of regular presentations on the county's progress implementing your board's American Rescue Plan Phase 1 spending plan. Next slide, please. As is our regular practice, this slide previews the topics we intend to cover today. I will provide a global program overview detailing the current status of projects in the design, development, and approval process. Chief Darrell Osby will present on the Fire Department's Advanced Provider Response Unit program. Next slide, please. Uh, as of May 2nd, uh, um, I'm sorry, as of April 30th, 2022, there were 45 projects in the design and development phase. This entails a process to clarify the goals and outcomes of the project, its potential mm. impact on reducing disparities caused or exacerbated by the pandemic, and how to measure that impact. A total of 30 projects have been approved for launch and implementation. Uh, a total allocation of $495 million, $495 million, $120,000, more than half of the project funds. Dr. Scorza, could I get you to pause a minute? It sounds like sure. we have someone else with an open mic. If everyone would mute their mics other than Dr. Scorza, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. While there are currently no projects under RD or County Council approval review, RD is working directly with departments on a pipeline of project designs. So I'm proud to note that of the 45 projects in the design development phase, RDTA providers are actively partnering and meeting with departments on 29 projects to support the design and equitable implementation of those projects. 18 project design submissions are undergoing revisions by the departments following an initial review which means that there are quite a few projects in the pipeline and are close to approval. Next slide. Next, Chief Osby will highlight the department's advanced provider response unit program. Our funds will be used to support the existing initiative launched via board motion in late 2020. The program seeks to unify efforts to provide youth and, and small businesses in impacted communities with the direct access needed um, for modern technologies and support uh, of their health. Uh, Chief Osby. All right, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Thank you. Okay, well, good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Scarza. Good morning, Honorable Board. Uh, Daryl Osby, Fire Chief of the Los Angeles County Fire Department. I asked Dr. Kashani to join me later if there's any technical questions regarding our presentation. But thank you for allowing us to uh, present this morning. Um, just a, a little backdrop. Myself and Supervisor Hahn, before COVID, spent some time up in Sacramento trying to get some legislative changes um, for the scope of paramedics to expand the scope of paramedics and also to enable them to transport patients other than going to a, an emergency room, which is legislative law right now. Um, we were unsuccessful in that endeavor. So since then, the department has pivoted to the program that I'm about to give you a quick overview right now. Um, for decades, the call volume for the fire departments across the country have been increasing, and um, and also the call volume, the impact in emergency rooms has been impacted significantly in a way that we believe that it's not a sustainable um, process. Just as a quick backdrop, when I got appointed as fire chief in 2011, the Los Angeles County Fire Department was the seventh busiest department in the nation. We're now the fourth busiest department in the nation behind uh, New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. And our projections are that in a decade, we'll be second only to New York as it relates to call volume. Currently, the Los Angeles County Fire Department responds to over 400,000 calls a year. 85% of those calls, those 911 calls are emergency medical services calls, which we call EMS. In order to address the impact of that, in 2019, the Los Angeles County Fire Department implemented with the support of Supervisor Barger in the Antelope Valley, an advanced provider response unit, which we call an APRU. And in order to do that, since we were unsuccessful 
and advancing the scope and modifying the scope of a paramedic, we staff that unit with a nurse practitioner or a physician's, a physician's assistant with a paramedic with the objective of reducing the impact of our paramedics in Antelope Valley um, to treat low acuity patients and that reduce the impact of 911 calls. And the reason we chose Antelope Valley is because that's one of the busiest uh, aspects of our organization. And we have some of the busiest fire stations in Antelope Valley as it pertains to the number of calls they receive in the nation. So that's why we chose Antelope Valley first. Um, next slide, please. So the patients that we look at um, as it relates to the APRU are patients that have um, minor injuries or just need a physical exam or need prescription refills or they need, manage, they need wounds that need to be managed, just to name a few. But these are not the type of calls that we need to send our precious paramedics to as it relates to these types of patients. With the APRU, we've been able to treat about a thousand patients per year since it's been in, in, implemented in the Antelope Valley, which frees our paramedics up for more serious calls like heart attacks, strokes, et cetera. And also because of this and the expanded scope of the nurse, educate, nurse practitioner or the physician on the unit, um, the unit is able to direct patients to the appropriate facility and keep them away from the emergency room. An example of the success of this unit is, and I got this information from our, our the unit, is that they were able to triage a patient that we responded to over 200 times in a year. They were able to triage the patient, spend several hours with the patient to uh, to address their needs, to assure they had the right medications, and also to educate that patient on the proper use of the 911 system. From that, that patient went from 200 times a year calling us, which most likely if the patient needed to go to the hospital, our paramedics by law have to take the patient to the emergency room, to from 200 calls a year, which is now down to one or two times a month, which you can see the impact of the APU, APRU on that one particular patient. Next slide, please. Additionally, our APRU is able to triage patients that have psychiatric needs, psychiatric needs, or patients that need to go to urgent care. As an example, we were able to divert 500 patients to psychiatric urgent care units, including the Exodus Recovery, or Star View Behavior Centers, um, which both locations are on our jurisdiction. But as a ask, although separate item, we need more of these centers to lessen the impact on our hospitals. The APRU is also um, really important as it relates to helping our patients and residents with these challenging needs. With, through the ARP funds, the department plans to staff the APR unit in Lancaster, but then also expand it into El Monte and, and Inglewood. And with that needed and additional funds to the department, our goal is to expand it by the fourth quarter of 2022 with the understanding that we have the proper vehicle and equipment to staff the vehicle. That's our plan for the expansion. We've been challenged as it relates to funding the current APRU that we implemented in Lancaster. Therefore, the $8.1 million that we received from ARP is really critical in funding the needs to continue the mission of the APRU, which I indicated earlier, is to reduce the impact on our paramedics, um, provide better care to our patients, um, address the repeat 911 callers and lessen the impact on the emergency rooms. We look forward as a department and continue our APRU, um, APRU program. And our goals are to maintain the fact that we can reduce the call volume on our hospitals, lessen the impact on the paramedics, 
We really want to thank the board for their continued support of funding this program and the continued support of the Los Angeles County Fire Department. And thank you for your time and attention in this important issue. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Chief. Board, that concludes our presentation. Thanks uh, to you both. We've got questions from um, Supervisor Solis, who will be followed by Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you uh, to uh, uh, Osby. I, I really want to commend you for all the work that you've done over the last few decades, and especially um, this is one program that's very outstanding, but I remember, I recall a few years ago, you also provided paramedic service and training our most heavily industrialized areas. And that was kind of on the cutting edge because in particular business zoned communities in areas, that one station had, I forget how many calls that came in because of hazards that uh, surrounded uh, the different businesses, particularly the city of industry. And I wanna thank you for that because that was groundbreaking then. And this is another product of that. And I really wanna commend all the staff the men and women, uh, you all have been our heroes and sheroes, especially during the pandemic. I want to thank you for that because you were out there helping us put up our COVID testing as well as our vax sites, and you did so much more. And I don't really know that the public has really heard that from the board, and I'm sure all of us feel the same way. But I particularly want to, want to thank you for that. This advanced provider response unit uh, that you launched back in 2019 was also recognized by our county quality and productivity award. So we know that uh, the success is very evident and it's based on the data that you're sharing with us. Um, this is a great example of effectively expanding the county safety net resources to our residents in need of services and right sizing that response. Uh, the program, as you know, especially critical given, given uh, across our healthcare system, including county hospitals and our emergency departments, and you've already outlined some of that. But just the uh, fact that you're able to respond uh, so quickly and minimize uh, interruptions at our trauma centers and all our, our sobering sites, Exodus and others that we serve, we know how compounded uh, that can be and how stressful it is on our staff. And I'm especially happy and pleased that you're gonna be expanding to the city of El Monte. I'm sure they're gonna be very pleased and whatever we need to do to help you and I'm excited that you are gonna be able to use some of the ARP money, but that's only one source uh, and we do need to look at how we continue this uh, funding for your program. So I'm thrilled about the program and really happy that uh, to hear that the programs, uh, during the program's inception, that uh, you've been able to safely discharge over 2,000 patients on the scene. That is saving the county hospital system funds. And I'd also uh, wanted to ask you if you can share if the demand of these on-site lower acuity services exceeds the current capacity for APRU, and how many units would you estimate are required to meet the existing need? Well, thank you for the, those comments, Supervisor, and, and the support. Um, this, we're going to expand it, like we indicated, to um, Del Monte and In Inglewood, but I would just say on a low estimate, um, we have 22 battalions in the Los Angeles County Fire Department are spread geographically throughout the county. So minimally, I would say one per battalion. So ideally, it would be nice to have 22. That's a goal. Okay. Yeah, that great. is a goal. Great. The, our biggest challenge though has been funding. So we'll continue to work with the board and the CEO and that endeavor. But ideally, ideally and I say minimally of 22. And, and not only is that a good fit for the patients and, the, and lessen the impact on our paramedics, but it's also a better cost-effective way to manage our resources. You mentioned that the unit that we put in the city of industry, which goes on about 4,000 calls a year now, so thank you for that support. But a paramedic unit costs us over $4 million a year to staff, so this is a lot more effective way to use, utilize our precious resources also. Perhaps in the future, we may look at how our cities, uh, municipalities might be able to also help out, because I think if they were to get a presentation, they would probably see that this is so efficient in cost savings, cost savings for them and our residents in so many ways. Perhaps that's discussions that we can have later on. Thank you so right. much, Chief Osby. Thank you. Supervisor Hahn. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Scorza and, and Chief Osby, uh, for the presentation. I'll echo uh, my colleague, uh, Supervisor Solis's remarks in the beginning about how supportive uh, we are of you uh, and uh, uh, the great men and women uh, in our LA County Fire Department. I was um, uh, honored to go Friday night to our annual Medal of Valor awards for the men and women in our fire department and uh, the stories uh, and the bravery and the uh, courage uh, that w was exhibited just in those that got honored that night was really staggering and uh, amazing uh, of, of our men and women who go really beyond the, the, their normal call of duty uh, to, to respond to dangerous situations. Uh, I, I do like this program at Chief, and I like uh, that we're, uh, our fire department is always uh, ready to adapt uh, to meet the different needs of the people that call for help. And uh, you know, uh, as well as I do, that our paramedics um, had to take, have to take people uh, to the emergency room no matter what, uh, even if they were having a mental health crisis and could be better served by going to a psychiatric urgent care. And you recall that, of course, was part of the law that my dad actually helped to write uh, back in 1970, because that was the only way uh, the paramedic uh, program got established, was to guarantee to all the, those who were, who were skeptics that uh, indeed the paramedics would eventually transport the patients to a, a hospital. But um, we've learned a lot since then and we realize that's not necessarily the most efficient way uh, to get people the help they need is just to immediately take them to the ER. Uh, so uh, I was one of those uh, along with you that lobbied the state to try to get this changed. Um, and we didn't totally get the law changed, but we do have this EMS alternate destination pilot program uh, to take qualifying people in crisis uh, to psychiatric urgent care centers, sobering centers, and as you said, respond to uh, some of the uh, medical needs out there that really don't need uh, the intensity of a, a paramedic response. Uh, so this is another way that uh, we, we can we use our resources more effectively, um, and more importantly, get people the help they need uh, where they need it, uh, and, and not necessarily taking them to an ER. So it's a great program. I'm glad to see we're using the American Rescue Plans uh, plan funds to expand it. But I guess my, my question, and I, one of my questions was to talk a little bit about what you really are encountering out there in terms of medical needs, but you, you Chief, you kind of uh, told us uh, what they're encountering out there. Um, so if this is a pilot program and uh, we're using our uh, one-time uh, ARP funds for this, wh what are you envisioning um, going forward? Uh, when do you think we're gonna end this pilot program? Um, are there any plans to make it permanent? What, what should we be looking at as, as the Board of Supervisors to, to make this permanent and find um, an ongoing revenue stream? Thank you for your comments, um, Supervisor Hahn. Also, thank you for attending our, our, our Meadow of Valor event. And one of the things is, is, is kind of hard to measure too for the uh, members of the Los Angeles County Fire Department, it's just the impact that the increased call volume is having. Um, you know, unsu we unsuccessfully did not pass the ballot measure that we attempted. And so we're, you know, continue to, to have this increased call volume, the same number of staff that we have. And we do a comparative analysis to the other departments I mentioned, like Chicago, New York, New York and Los Angeles. They're, they have way more staffing than we do. So this heads off to the firefighters and paramedics of our department. Um, we, we're grateful that we have this ARP funding for the next three years, but we're trying to collect data that just shows the impact and the benefits of this program. And so we're gonna to continue to collaborate with the board and the CEOs as it relates to looking for funding streams, potentially another ballot measure, but also too, with that funding, I mean, with the, with, with the data, and I wanna thank Supervisor Solis for indicating we should look at cities, but we're also I'm trying to collaborate with like the Kaisers of the world, 
or some of the insurance agencies for them to see the benefit and the cost savings that we provide uh, by not transporting, transporting patients to ERs because when you look at the cost of a patient being transported to an emergency room via a paramedic, it's the most expensive way to go to a, to a, a hospital, which is almost $2,000 a call, and not to take in consideration the cost as it relates to the emergency room visit. So we're also trying and, to- and they, don't, and, they, and they don't always get the help they need. It doesn't always yeah, have, don't. it doesn't it, have a, the outcome that I think we're all hoping for. Correct, and so we're trying to partner with them to try to help them have them share the cost with us. And you're absolutely right, um, as it relates to like our mental patients, uh, we go in about 2,000 calls a month. And um, in many instances, and I would say to the high 90 percentile plus, those patients are not transported to the appropriate facility because of the lack of facilities or the inability for our paramedics to transport outside of an emergency room. So the expansion of this program would also help us to alleviate that challenge. So there's a lot more work, as you can tell, that's necessary for the department to coordinate and collaborate to find additional funding in the future. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Barker. I, I, I echo what my colleagues are saying, Chief Osby. Um, this truly is a program that when I first heard about it, I was very excited, especially when you look at the Antelope Valley. Um, the geography and a lot of the areas are isolated. And if I'm correct, I think Station 33 is the only one in the county, um, in, in Lancaster. Is that correct? That's absolutely at the time, Supervisor Barker. Station 33 was the busiest station in the nation. So, um, but because of this program, and as you can see in that area, we reduced their call volume by approximately 1,000 calls per year in Antelope Valley. There are no, no there are no longer number one, but they're still the busiest station, one of the busiest stations in the nation. I, and I just want, and I think, I don't know if you mentioned it, but Dr. Kazan, who I know actually went up and was staffing um, when they were doing the calls uh, going out, um, and I appreciate the work that he's done on this. You know, I agree about collecting the data, and I think that LA City also has a similar program that they're doing. I think it would be beneficial for us to put together that data, but also work, for example, AV Hospital, um, their waiting room, I mean, for the paramedics up there that I've talked to, um, the wait time for them um, has been incredible. And so this actually um, frees up them needing to go into the ER for something that, quite frankly, they would have been treated and then sent home. Um, but it also provides an opportunity for Antelope Valley Hospital to decompress, if you will. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity for us to, to work with the hospitals, Supervisor Hahn, um, because there is a narrative there as it relates to the impact it has on the ERs. And right now, just with this one pilot that you did, you, you see the benefit um, beyond just um, uh, the benefit to the individual, but to the system as a whole. So I, I'm, I'm all in for this. I'm excited. It's something that, you know, I think we should roll out. And when you talk about um, the, the mental health component, having these um, mental health urgent cares is great. But I hope that we can, because I know LA City approached us to put the therapeutic bands on site at some of their stations that get the highest number of calls. I think we should look to do the same in LA County with LA County Fire. Um, so we're parking a couple of the therapeutic bands um, at locations where um, the call outs tend to be high with mental health. I'd like to see us, you know, charity begins at home as well. I think we need to partner with you um, have a high use um, on the mental health calls to also do that um, because I think we have five vans that are I think at least I know I have one up in the Antelope Valley that I would be more than happy to to um, work on as a pilot for that as well because I think we have incredible opportunities to get them from ER into or appropriate um, treatment but I just I applaud you and your entire team I can't think of a better use of funding um, and I think it's an exciting time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Supervisor Barger. And thank you, Supervisor Han. You answered my question as I listened to um, the chief talk about the efforts to change the state law. I thought about the sobering center. I know the one downtown that I toured it. I didn't know if it had been excluded from that rule. So I see that I heard from your, your presentation. It's a part of the um, pilot. So that's great to hear. 
seeing no further questions, thank you both, Chief Osby, Dr. Scorza. Um, this standing item is very helpful um, as a way to remind us of the wonderful programs that we are being able to fund, thanks to our ARPA dollars, um, to inform the board, um, as well as the general public, so they know where those ARPA dollars are going. So thank you both very much. Appreciate you. All right, thank you. Colleagues, we'll move on to set I matter number two. So we'll hear from Drs. Ferrer, Director of Public Health, and Christina Galley, Director of Healthcare Services. We'll start with Dr. Ferrer. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank you. And hopefully you can see me as well. And we can see you too. Thank you. Okay, great. Good morning, uh, and thank you, uh, Supervisor Mitchell, and to the entire Board of Supervisors for your strong leadership as we navigate the ongoing pandemic. I do appreciate time at today's board meeting to provide you and the public with an update on our response. Uh, today, I'm going to share current COVID-19 metrics and mitigation strategies, uh, but mostly I want to focus on the disproportionate impact of COVID over the course of the pandemic. So we'll look at some trends by race and ethnicity, geography, and poverty levels. And then I'll close uh, with post-surge goals and recommendations for actions uh, that we can uh, take to really address the longstanding health inequities. Uh, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, as we look at the COVID-19 metrics over the past week, uh, we can see that the number of COVID cases has continued to increase. The average number of daily new cases reported over the last seven days has increased now to over 2,000 new cases a day. Uh, last week, we were at about 1,500 new cases a day. I think that's an increase of close to 30 percent. Uh, and while the cases have been steadily increasing uh, for the last month, uh, we do remain relieved that COVID-related hospitalizations, deaths, and test positivity remain relatively stable. Next slide. On this slide, we'll just look at the trends over the past four weeks. Um, this is the seven-day average daily cases by report date. That's that green line. The seven-day uh, average daily hospitalizations by admission date. That's the orange line. And the blue line is the seven-day average daily deaths. Uh, and as you can see, uh, with that green line, you know, pretty steep increase now. But it is still far lower than it was uh, during our winter surge, which remember we topped out at about 45,000 cases a day. Um, since the end of March, however, as you can see, there's been over a 200% increase in the seven day average of cases. Um, hospitalization rates, uh, orange line, death rates, the blue line, they're stable. We had a small increase last week in hospitalizations that goes up and down but it's basically stable. Um, and um, and uh, we think that that uh, reflects a, a couple of things. Uh, first is there always is a, a small lag between cases and hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, but more importantly, we think this reflects the protective effects of vaccinations, boosters, and now therapeutics. I do wanna note that many other communities across the country are beginning to see increases now in hospitalizations even here in California, uh, associated with the highly infectious BA.2 and BA.2.12.1 variants that are circulating widely across many regions in the United States. And, and here uh, in California, the State Department of Public Health has indicated that they believe that BA.2.12.1, that's sort of a, a subtype of BA.2, uh, is thought to be uh, circulating at about 50% of, of what is causing infections here. And, and you know, unfortunately, BA.2.12.1 looks to be more infectious than even BA.2, which would explain uh, why we're all seeing uh, significant increases in our cases as well. Next slide. I do want to note that, you know, throughout the course of the pandemic, uh, we've had a lot of different mitigation strategies and tools that we could use. And depending on uh, what was going on and what tools we had at the time, uh, really dependent on what strategies were most helpful. 
but we've always relied on what we call non-pharmaceutical invention interventions. This includes masking and infection control uh, to layer in safety. This was especially important, as we all know, during the first year of the pandemic, when these were often the only protection measures that were available. Uh, but I want to note the strategies continue uh, to offer protection, especially during these times where we're seeing some increased transmission. Testing, vaccinations, and now therapeutics are the most powerful tools that are available to protect against both spread and severe illness. And our recent strategies are focused uh, really very significantly on creating easy and widespread access to each of these interventions. And as we all know, throughout the past two years, we've relied heavily on our healthcare and social service providers to provide care and support for residents and workers that have been dealing with the devastating impacts of this pandemic. Our clinics, our quarantine and isolation sites, the nearly 700 community health workers and promotoras, and the dozens of faith-based and community-based organizations have and continue to serve as trusted emissaries of life-saving information and services. Next slide. Uh, it has been important uh, with the new tools that have become available to build out access. Uh, and I wanna note that the first um, tool that we had that required a, a vast network was testing. Uh, now we actually have both a vast network and much easier access to over-the-counter tests that people can use in their homes. But testing continues to be an important strategy for us. And I, I wanna acknowledge that uh, you can see there's about 330 testing sites across LA County. Unfortunately, these gains uh, that we've made uh, really under the leadership of, of Dr. Galley and uh, the Department of Health Services are threatened by the elimination of federal dollars to pay for testing for those who are insured. And I know Dr. Galley will talk more about this challenge in a few minutes. Next slide. With the help of hundreds of partners, uh, we've also been able, as you can see on this slide, to build out a vast network of mobile and fixed sites throughout the county. There's anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000 vaccination sites open weekly. Vaccines are free. There's almost no requirements to get vaccinated. And residents can request either transportation to vaccination sites or in-home vaccinations for those who are unable to leave their homes. Every week, there are hundreds of vaccination clinics at community events and hundreds of schools. We're at churches and temples, and we're still at lots of work sites. Anyone can request a mobile team, and there's a call center that's open seven days a week from 8 in the morning until 8.30 at night to help residents get their questions answered, connect to vaccinations, and to booster doses. Next slide. Uh, now, uh, with improved availability of therapeutics, we're working to build out a vast network of sites uh, where patients can access therapeutics. So we're up to about 625 sites that provide antivirals across the county. Of these, more than half, or about 332, were located in uh, our under-resourced communities, and those are denoted with those pink dots. And while we have many more sites now where residents can pick up these antiviral medications, given the importance of starting these medications within a few days of someone uh, testing positive and experiencing mild symptoms, uh, the Public Health Department is also offering a telehealth option, which improves easy access to these oral medications. Residents can call 833-540-0473, seven days a week, eight in the morning, till 8.30 at night. Uh, they will be assessed for eligibility for antiviral medications uh, with a clinical provider. And if they're eligible, the medication will be sent overnight to their homes or if they wish to a nearby pharmacy. To date, over 600 residents have been able to use this service. Next slide. In spite of our efforts to ensure easy and widespread access to testing, vaccines, and therapeutics, the tragedy of this pandemic is not just the huge number of lives lost, about 32,000, but also the huge disproportionality, most pronounced during the surges, which suggests that factors contributing to the gaps are related to much more than individual choices. Next slide. When we look at case rates by uh, race and ethnicity from the very beginning of this pandemic, 
we can see that throughout the pandemic, black and brown residents, those are the green lines and the blue lines, have consistently experienced higher case rates. Unfortunately, during each of the surges, and we've had four, the disproportionality in case rates, as you can see on this slide, is exacerbated, with case rates generally rising between two and four times among black and brown residents when compared to white and Asian residents. At the peak of our summer 2020 surge, case rates among Latinx residents were nearly four times higher than they were for white residents. Next slide. On the next slide, you see a similar pattern when we look at hospitalizations with black residents and Latinx residents seeing hospitalization rates that are three to four times higher than rates for white and Asian residents. And this is particularly uh, important to note during the Omicron surge. Next slide. And tragically, the trends uh, followed when we looked at death rates with black and Latinx residents seeing death rates that are two to three times higher than the death rates for white and Asian residents. And this was in our most recent winter surge. Next slide. We look at the cumulative case hospitalization and death rates, which you can see on this slide. The differences are stark with Latinx residents that's highlighted in green and black residents highlighted in blue experiencing much higher rates when compared to white and Asian residents. These huge differences in case hospitalization and death rates reflect in part exposures, community conditions, and health status. Where people live and work really matters. Uh, and as we all have learned, essential workers never got to stay home. And many were returning to very densely populated communities and overcrowded housing. All of these conditions contributed to this disproportionality. Next slide. Not only have COVID health outcomes varied by race and ethnicity, they've also varied depending on where people live. On this map, you see the case rates. These are cumulative case rates uh, from the beginning of the pandemic through now uh, per 100,000 residents per city and community. The light green areas have the lowest case rates, and these are generally the better resourced communities. The dark green areas, which include areas of central and south LA, areas of the San Fernando Valley, the San Gabriel Valley, and Antelope Valley saw higher cumulative case rates. Next slide. And unfortunately, we see a similar pattern when we look at the death rates by city and community, with the darker air, with the areas in darker blue seeing the highest COVID-19 death rates. These are almost the exact same communities that experience the highest case rates. Next slide. On this slide, we quantified the differences uh, between communities with low and high burdens of poverty for cases and deaths. As you can see, the case rate among individuals living in the highest poverty communities is about one and a half times higher than the case rate among individuals living in the wealthiest communities. And the death rate among individuals living in the highest communities, highest poverty communities is uh, devastatingly three times higher than the death rate among individuals living in the wealthiest communities. Next slide. Because we know that the vaccines are a powerful tool and continue to demonstrate uh, protection against infection and a lot of protection against severe illness, it is important to look at the impact of vaccinations on disproportionality. On this slide, we can look at hospitalization and death rates by vaccination status and race and ethnicity for the most recent three month period through April 15th. For all racial and ethnic groups, the vaccine provided a great deal of protection from hospitalization and death when compared to unvaccinated residents. For example, fully vaccinated uh, Latinos and Latinas were more than four times less likely to be hospitalized and nearly eight times less likely to die than unvaccinated Latinos and Latinas. Fully vaccinated black residents were nearly three times less likely to be hospitalized and nearly four times less likely to die than uh, unvaccinated black residents. However, it's clear from looking at this table that vaccines are not equalizers. Vaccinated black and Latinx residents are two times more likely to be hospitalized than vaccinated white residents and more than three times more likely to be hospitalized than vaccinated Asian residents. And vaccinated black and Latinx residents are one and a half times more likely to die from COVID than vaccinated white residents and three times more likely to die from COVID than vaccinated Asian residents. Next slide. 
And we see these differences when we look at case death and hospitalization rates by vaccination status and poverty level. Fully vaccinated residents in the wealthiest communities were more than two times less likely to be hospitalized than those vaccinated and living in communities with high rates of poverty. In fact, those vaccinated living in communities with significant poverty were almost as likely to be hospitalized as those unvaccinated living in the wealthiest communities. It's also important to note that those unvaccinated living in communities with high rates of poverty are 11 times more likely to get infected than those unvaccinated living in the wealthiest communities. And sadly, we see a similar gradient around deaths. Those unvaccinated living in high poverty communities are almost 12 times more likely to die than unvaccinated people living in wealthier communities. And among those vaccinated, those living in communities of high poverty are still two times more likely to die than those in the wealthiest communities. Next slide. Not surprisingly, these enormous gaps in COVID outcomes have had an impact on overall death rates. When we look at trend lines for overall mortality rates, we can see that all groups experienced a significant increase in death rates during the pandemic. And this does reflect the very high death toll from COVID as well as smaller increases that were seen in deaths from other causes, likely associated with delays in seeking or obtaining care. And while there is a focus on the big increases in death rates associated with COVID, it's also important to note that disproportionality in health outcomes is not new. Mortality rates have always been higher for black residents. And during the pandemic, there was a dramatic increase in mortality rates among Lat Latinx residents which we can see on the next slide. This is the percent increases uh, in this all cause mortality rates over the last two year period of the pandemic. And you can see that Latinos and Latinas saw an increase of 48% uh, in their death rate, all cause death rate over the last two years. Next slide. These gaps in health outcomes by race and ethnicity have been documented for decades. This table captures some of the detail for the 2020 mortality rates. On nearly every indicator we're tracking, including heart disease, lung cancer, diabetes, and infant mortality, black residents have the highest death rates. The only exception is for COVID, where Latinx residents have the highest death rate. And for many of these mortality metrics, Latinx residents, as reflected on the previous slide, uh, experience the second highest death rate. Those are those numbers that are highlighted uh, in black. Next slide. A lot of times when we look at this data on health outcomes, many will assume that these higher rates are associated with poor individual choices or bad behavior. This is a dangerous and false narrative since there has been evidence for decades that our health is most influenced by what we call the social determinants. This acknowledges the need for us to have these health affirming, the health affirming resources that promote optimal well-being. On this slide, for nearly every indicator, Black and Latinos and Latinas face significantly more challenges, with Black and Latinx residents experiencing the highest percentage of food insecurity, housing insecurity, and discrimination at work and when seeking health care services. Next slide. The Healthy Places Index, and we've shown you, you know, sort of a lot of uh, maps that have the Healthy Places Index sort of embedded in them, but this is a metric that combines 25 community characteristics, including pollution levels, access to health care, safe housing, quality education, healthy foods, and more into a single index healthy places score. The healthier the community, the higher the healthy places index score. As we look at the map of LA County, we can see that the lower scoring dark and light blue shaded communities are the same communities of Central and South LA, parts of the San Fernando Valley, parts of San Gabriel Valley and the Antelope Valley that had the higher COVID case and death rates. The communities shaded in the uh, lighter green and uh, are actually the communities that had greater access to health affirming resources. Next slide. I'm sharing the data on the disproportionate impacts of COVID and the longstanding health inequities uh, to help us think about what it means for us in this post-surge period of the pandemic. Next slide. As a public health department, uh, we have an obligation to prevent and reduce serious illness and death. 
among residents of LA County. And as we continue in this different phase of the pandemic, our goal has not changed. And we work with all our partners to reduce serious, and Ill serious illness and death from COVID-19. It's really not appropriate to tolerate disproportionality that results in higher rates of illness, death, and long-term disability among some residents and workers when there are collective prevention strategies that can mitigate spread and serious illness. I know many people are tired of the pandemic, they're tired of wearing masks, and they want life to go back to normal. And they believe that the responsibility now lies with, the, with each individual to take actions to minimize their personal risk. But we do have a collective obligation to take public health measures to protect our most vulnerable. And this in LA County is a significant number of people that ought not be left behind. It includes those who are of older age, those who have underlying health conditions, those who live in communities with high poverty rates, those who are black and brown, those that are unvaccinated or not yet fully vaccinated, and the many that face multiple exposures every day at work and in their community. Next slide. And a return to normal doesn't really work for all of those who have for decades experienced the disadvantages and allocations of health affirming resources, the disinvestments, the racism and discrimination, and the marginalization. Our post-surge plan and our expansive mitigation strategies can best address the disproportionality exacerbated by COVID-19 when we also address the root causes of inequities in health. And I wanna thank the entire Board of Supervisors for their leadership in this work. Our efforts require targeted investments, and I wanna highlight a few areas that remain critically important. We do need to continue to ensure barrier-free access to testing, vaccinations, therapeutics, and PPE. And we've gotta work with our partners to better need, meet the needs of some of our residents and workers by connecting these COVID specific efforts with services that address food income and housing insecurity. And I wanna again, thank the board of supervisors, many of you who layered in these other services at our vaccination sites. Part of this work means helping our healthcare providers in hard hit communities provide testing, vaccination and therapeutics to their own patients. It costs money to stand up testing, vaccination, and distribution of therapeutics, particularly to deal with your entire membership, your, all of your patients within a very short period of time. And our smaller providers need resources to be able to do this work. And this work is not over. We need to lift up the work of the network of trusted community-based and faith-based organizations in our hard hit communities because they're the backbone of a public health response. Oftentimes, we neglect to acknowledge that the public health system is not equivalent to the public health department. Our infrastructure, especially for essential pandemic mitigation, really depends on building and resourcing uh, a whole network of public health providers. Sorry. Um, and it relies uh, extensively on those trusted ambassadors who are in our communities, our promotoras and our community health workers. The board has directed us from the beginning to ensure that workers, particularly our low wage workers and those that are not unionized, to, that they're as safe as possible at work. And this work also isn't done and we'll need to ensure that there's compliance with ventilation and infection control standards and with public health safety measures. And also appreciate all the support for paid sick leave for workers. It is almost impossible to mitigate during a pandemic without paid sick leave. And I wanna also thank and commend the board for recognizing the importance of vaccination requirements for those in service of our most vulnerable. This too remains important in the months ahead. Next slide. In closing, I wanted to elevate uh, that closing the gaps is gonna require uh, more of a focus uh, than what we've just uh, been doing to mitigate the immediate effects of the pandemic, which while critically important, are not gonna be sufficient. We've noted uh, over and over, and, and I wanna thank our providers for also lifting this up, that although it's so hard to imagine that in 2022, we have communities in our county that don't have the needed network of healthcare services. 
And this would be the opportunity to actually make sure that we fix that. That wherever people live, they have access to high quality, culturally appropriate health and medical care in what have traditionally been under-resourced and underserved communities. We've also learned a lot about the importance of creating the networks and that we should um, figure out a way to uh, extend the work of these uh, teams that we've developed in response to the pandemic uh, to help us address all of the other threats that exist to op optimal well-being. These are having our public health um, uh, employees really embedded in community teams in these partner teams with our CBOs, our faith-based organizations, and our residents. Uh, this is particularly important in addressing issues related to environmental health injustices, issues related to proliferation of uh, unhealthy um, um, uh, businesses uh, disproportionately in some of our communities uh, that impact quality of life, and it remains important for all of us in securing uh, sort of safety in our communities. Um, we've learned a lot from how to wor work with each other during the pandemic. It will be important to carry those lessons over into the other important work that, as we know, affect the root causes, the root uh, in, that have a root impact on people's health and well-being. I want to also thank the board uh, for the support for the worker councils and for our worker centers. We think these have been enormously important and uh, would like to continue supporting worker councils and worker centers so that our lower wage workers can organize for health and safety at their workplaces. Because this issue, again, is not just important during a pandemic. Um, and there are a couple of other areas where we're working with our partners to make sure that we acknowledge that we need to create pipelines uh, for health career programs so that black and brown students use, see themselves and gain the skills that they need to enter into these sort of life-saving and for critically important health careers. Uh, and finally, I want to again thank the board for their leadership in insisting that we all work to change systems, policies, and practices that perpetuate racism, discrimination, and marginalization. So thank you to the board. I want to thank the county departments that are also doing just a really critically important and um, high-quality work to get us to a, a better place uh, for all of our LA County residents. This concludes my presentation and I'll be available for questions after Dr. Galley's presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Galley. Thank you and good morning. Uh, I'll provide brief updates and then more than happy to take any questions that you might have. If you could go to slide three, our COVID hospitalizations in the DHS hospitals, the four of them, have remained steady and relatively low in the 30s over the past several weeks. Still, the overwhelming majority of COVID positive patients in DHS hospitals uh, are still there and hospitalized for reasons that are unrelated to their concurrent COVID infection. If you go to the next slide, Slide four, our booster shot compliance for our healthcare workers within DHS facilities is sitting right now at still around 91%. We continue to work with our staff toward full compliance and compliance with the state and county health officer orders that mandate booster shots for healthcare workers. Slide five, DHS manages still two quarantine and isolation sites that are specifically focused on individuals who are medically fragile. Utilization remains low at these sites, as you can see in the slide. I'll now shift to an update on community testing. If you could go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Slide seven shows the overall testing capacity and utilization over the course of the pandemic at the fixed and mobile community testing sites. You can see that utilization has remained steady and low over the past two months. Our goal is to keep the capacity at the county's community testing sites at at least double the current utilization to allow for some cushion and ensure access. Slide eight shows a similar type of data on capacity and utilization, but this one is for the test pickup, uh, test kit pickup and distribution drop off sites. Uh, the utilization of this service is also low. Most recent weeks, we are distributing under 500 tests per week over the last couple of months. Slide nine shows the current footprint of those pickup and drop-off distribution sites. We remain steady at 28 sites. 
Uh, we are now staffed with disaster service workers at these sites as needed that are committed through at least the end of May. Slide 10 looks at the overall footprint of community fixed and mobile uh, sites. The sites listed here include all community testing sites that have agreed to serve all individuals, including those who are uninsured. And on that note, on slide 11, since the last update that I provided to the board, there has been no change on the availability or rather the lack of availability of funds to cover COVID testing for the uninsured. The federal government has not yet proposed or taken any action to replenish the pool of funds that has been historically administered through HRSA that reimburses governments and providers or other entities for testing that's provided to individuals who lack insurance. And just to put the, the magnitude of this problem into context, in 2021, over half of all of the tests that were completed at the county managed community testing sites were provided to individuals who stated that they lacked insurance and then were billed to this HRSA pool. This creates a fiscal challenge for the county uh, and will require additional revenue sources to be able to cover the cost of community testing, COVID testing for the uninsured if HRSA and federal government does not take action to replenish that pool. And finally, on the next slide, slide 12, I'll close with just recent operational updates on the community testing program. So as I just mentioned, we have extended the disaster service worker terms of service through the end of May to cover the pickup and drop off locations at the libraries. I'm very thankful to the Office of Emergency Management and DHR, as well as all of the county departments that have staff deployed to these departments, to these sites for their assistance. We've also altered the script and the registration process uh, when people register for testing through the community testing platform in a way that encourages and supports individuals who do have health insurance to be able to enter that information successfully up front. This is really important for allowing the county to bill health plans and our vendor to bill health plans wherever possible, while also maintaining funding and access that is needed for individuals who do lack insurance. We have also updated and will keep updating the COVID website so that individuals without insurance can see which sites in the county uh, are able to serve them. And just as a reminder, all of the directly managed county sites and state sites serve individuals without insurance, as well as a number of other community based sites. For all individuals who receive their test results through our health, our health on a platform that includes all of the pickup drop off sites, including the libraries. If they test positive, they receive information on how to access treatment options, including access to DPH's test to treat program and their telehealth option. To reduce the need for ongoing DSWs on site, we're going to keep working on the rollout of our online and phone request process that will allow individuals to seamlessly obtain the tests at the pickup drop off locations without the same need for the number of staff at those sites. And we will continue to work with DPH and are really grateful for their partnership in expanding those test to treat sites. And right now the work is ongoing uh, to have that opportunity available at the two existing Optum sites. I will close there, but please let me know what questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Galley. Uh, in a, a meeting with uh, Secretary Becerra last week, in addition to uh, talking to him about LA County's need for a IMD waiver, I raised the issue about uh, HRSA's decision to no longer fund um, testing for the uninsured. And I, I was saddened that it would there, from his perspective, you know, he did not think that additional resources would be coming from this Congress. Um, and I laid it on thick in terms of the impact that was going to have on LA County's budget. So it's really devastating news um, to hear. Here, the percentage you shared with us, it's we are as a board are really going to have to take um, decisive action to make sure that's available. One quick clarification for you, Dr. Galley, and then I'll go to Supervisor Kuehl. Your slide that showed 91% of our health. Um, care personnel have received um, the booster. Is that the second booster or the first booster? That is the first booster. Healthcare workers in California and LA County are required to have received the first booster, but there's no similar mandate for any subsequent boosters at this point. Thank you very much. Supervisor Thank you. Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I have several questions. I want to start with uh, Dr. Ferrer, if I may. Um, first of all, Dr. Ferrer, I want to thank you for all the 
work that you've done since the very beginning when we didn't even know what was happening with the virus. Um, you are clearly the woman of the year, and I look forward to celebrating you on Monday at the Woman of the Year luncheon, um, along with others. I want to start with the notion that we are post-surge. Uh, I do understand that the number of cases that we're seeing per day is quite a bit lower than what we saw after the holidays and during the holidays. However, there's been kind of an alarming increase in infections, I think, uh, even though we see so far less serious, not a, not a huge increase in hospitalization or death. Uh, we hear about new strains, not only the, you know, all the letters and numbers that you name, but uh, some new strain in South Africa that had been covered, and uh, hearing that um, it's even more transmissible, or even the ones that we're suffering here are more transmissible. Can you clarify some of that? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Supervisor Kuehl, and, and, you know, thanks also for your support and kindness. I, I do want to acknowledge that, you know, there's an amazing team in this county. I have an amazing team here as well, and, um, you know, everyone has been working extraordinarily hard and doing their very best. So, um, you know, I want to extend uh, all that appreciation to, to everybody, to all of you, your teams, and, and obviously all the other departments, because None of this would have been possible uh, if we hadn't had uh, such high levels of partnership, collaboration, and cooperation. Um, I do, I, I'm really glad you brought up the issue of, you know, our cases are increasing and, um, you know, whereas before it seemed like, you know, every few months we heard about a new variant and a potential new variant of concern, um, now this is a really frequent uh, notation, you know, within weeks, of one variant of concern dominating. There are reports from other parts of the country or other parts of the world of other either subtypes or additional st different strains. Um, and this has been especially true with Omicron. So yes, we have here in the United States begun to see the proliferation of what I call this BA.2.12.1 Variant, you know, again, this is really a sub variant of Omicron BA.2. But in South Africa, they're seeing a huge increase in cases that also now is resulting in an increase in hospitalizations with a very different uh, mutated virus that they're, that's been labeled uh, BA.4, BA.5. Um, and again, you know, it's for some of these variants, they have moved from other countries. Um, across the world. Um, so uh, when folks ask why public health remains cautious, it is because every time there is a new variant that is more infectious or potentially more infectious, that means it can spread more easily. You have to be super careful about those that are most vulnerable in our communities. And here in LA County, that's millions of people. It, it's not a tiny number. Uh, there are lots and lots of people who when there's lots of, particularly if it's unchecked transmission, can in fact still, even if they're back vaccinated, even if they've been boosted, uh, but certainly we've got a lot of people uh, who haven't uh, done that yet, they can still suffer a, a severe consequence should they get infected. Uh, we also, you know, as we note, every time we have a new variant of concern, it takes a while um, for the clinicians and the scientists to really assess what the relationship with that new strain of the virus is going to be in terms of illness severity. And that's because it's a little bit complicated to figure out that relationship. Um, so, you know, I, I think at the moment, uh, we do urge people to be cautious, to keep those masks on when you're indoors. We do know that the state is estimating that 50% of what's circulating in California is BA.5. 2.12.1, which it doesn't have a name yet, but it is more infectious than BA.2, which was more infectious than the original strain of Omicron that circulated and caused a significant surge last winter. We're in a better place, so we can remain hopeful, but we shouldn't lose all uh, of our caution. We can remain hopeful because lots of people have a lot of protection. Lots of people 
are fully boosted, lots of people are vaccinated, lots of people uh, were recently infected and have some natural immunity. Um, not sure how durable that is and how long it will last, but it certainly will offer some protection, uh, different than where we were when we started the Omicron surge uh, last December. Uh, but it is time for people to go get boosted, uh, go get your first doses of the vaccine if you haven't yet been vaccinated, and be careful, uh, particularly if you're around others who are at higher risk or you're at higher risk yourself. Thing I also wanted to, I want to thank you for lifting up the workers' councils. I think the notion that at our work site, we have the ability to say, you know, action. But I think it is so not the case in 99% of all the work. Um, and I think about the strong recommendation to us to wear masks inside. Um, and it's kind of lost on people who go into restaurants, who go into department stores, who go into any kind of commerce, um, who go into markets, because we think, well, it's strongly recommended, but we don't really have to wear a mask. We're not at danger. I wish there was a way, and maybe if there's a new ring of signs, that the notion is we're not just protecting ourselves, we're really protecting that person at the checkout counter who is coming in contact with 500 people a day. I'm not. I'm coming in contact with her. And the other issue I think that we don't want to think about, but we all talk about, is this issue of, of racism. I think we understand something about race. There's a, there are differences. And racism is really an attitude of discrimination or something overt. But what you're pointing out is ignorance or denial that there's a disproportionate impact. It's also a form of hating in that. And people really don't want to. So I think it's very important to call people's attention to who is behind the checkout counter, who are these essential workers, who are the people we're relying on every day in every place we go. Uh, even when we see the people stepping out of the Amazon trucks, you know, um, we don't come in contact with them as much, but still. And how this impacts communities, that's one thing. People have to Exposed, they come home. As you indicated, probably more people living in a smaller space. Um, but really, uh, the, the third thing that you mentioned is also important, and that's the interplay between issues like air pollution or other ways in which lungs are affected, because this also weakens your condition and makes you more susceptible to having a worse response. So I don't know any way. I mean, we talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And we have done what we can to pay attention to impoverished communities, which are always communities of color. Um, but the last question I wanted to ask was about the meds. Um, just to understand about what the, the sort of telemedicine issue is here. So, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm a regular person, but I managed to get a couple of home tests. So I take a home test and it's positive. Is that sufficient for me to do yep. something in terms of telemedicine and say, I need some meds sent to me right now, please? Uh, what, yes. what happens after I see those two lines on my test? Yes. Well, you can call us seven days a week from eight in the morning till 8.30 at night. Uh, somebody will screen on the initial call. You'll, you'll actually, uh, you know, they'll screen to make sure you, you have that test. In other words, some people are just calling. Am I showing you the, the two lines like on my? You'll, you'll, yeah, exactly. Um, they'll have a way for you to share your positive test results. So no, you don't have to go somewhere else. You don't have, you really are self attesting that yes, I tested positive. We do have a lot of people that call us and they haven't tested positive, but they just want the medication to have when they do test positive. That's not possible. But for people who tell us I tested positive, um, they actually will then get a, what we call a telehealth appointment with a physician. Um, and that physician will then do a full assessment because, you know, there are contraindications to this medication. People do 
they need to go through a screening. Everybody is not a good candidate for these uh, medications. So that screening will happen if they are a good candidate for the medication. Uh, we'll go ahead and either overnight it to their house, or if they prefer, we can send it to their a prescription to their local pharmacy that they can pick up. But how do, obviously, how do they pay for they those meds? Home. They don't pay for them. The medication. I think that's an important point too, because yeah, everything. I can do this on my phone. I can do this on my computer. I'm at you home. Don't have to leave your and home. I don't have to pay for the meds. You don't have to pay for anything. Not for the visit. Not not for anything. Because it's really important that people get these medications right away, as soon as they are testing positive and developing symptoms. This is an antiviral medication. It doesn't work after the first few days. Um, so, you know, we're making it easy. Now, I will note that we've set up the telehealth option to give time to the provider community uh, because most people have health insurance and most people have a customary provider for the provider community to put in place their symptoms, so, I mean, their systems, so that people can go to their, their provider uh, of choice and get the same very quick response. But we know this takes time. And in the, in the meantime, like we don't want anybody to lose out. We don't want anybody not to have access. And this is especially true in some of the hardest hit communities. Uh, we also want it to be super convenient because you could see a situation where you may have to go to three different places uh, or you get your medication, somewhere to get tested, a provider to do your assessment, and then a drugstore or pharmacy where you pick up your medication. So we're trying to avoid that because not everyone has a car, and uh, and that would be a huge burden uh, on uh, on some members uh, in our community. Uh, but something, we are hoping. Yeah. I, I, oh, think, I think that's something that we need and, and have, really, the five of us in our own uh, districts uh, to keep saying, you know, this yes. is something you can do on your phone or on your computer. You get a visit with a doctor. The meds would be delivered to your house, and it's free. This is all free. Everything. The county free. has provided free testing, you know, free meds, free. Everything's free. Um, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have one question for Dr. Galley, if I may. Um, Dr. Galley, we were talking about training and um, training of um, doctors and other medical professionals uh, in terms of the uh, impacts of race and poverty uh, in, in, and access to uh, medical treatment or health. Um, I spent a long time in the legislature trying to do something about the training of medical professionals, but we were told that, you know, it, kind of every school decides for themselves what they're going to teach, whether they're going to do this or not. But I just wonder, is there some centralized way to impact medical schools so that, or is it happening already, so that there's some additional recognition that communities of color, that communities of poverty, um, do have all of this elevated, all these elevated numbers, and not just about the pandemic? Because I honestly don't think medical students, when they start out, know this unless they come from those communities and then it's kind of like yeah it's the water we swim in um but i just don't know whether there's a real way to impact training yes supervisor it's a good question both for medical education in medical schools and i would say for a variety of other disciplines as well including tax nursing across the board in healthcare. Uh, there's a variety of entities and authorities that regulate the content of those training curriculum for medical school. It's, it's the ACGME, and they have put in additional requirements that tries to give some, um, uh, uh, that's for residency programs, some degree of training in medical school and then in residency programs, act, uh, exposure to some of the topics you're talking about. Uh, but I think really what's one of the main ways that that can be successful is first by having training program locations, whether it's in medical school or residencies within at risk and vulnerable communities so that during the training, uh, individuals who are receiving training are working in communities of need, working in vulnerable communities and have that experience rather than just being taught it in a classroom, which I think is less effective. Uh, and then secondly, also ensuring that we're diversifying the candidates themselves that are in those training programs. And you made a, a, a reference to this in terms of having the candidates have those life experiences or come from vulnerable communities or be individuals of color themselves. And I think by diversifying the workforce 
by investing in training programs that are committed to recruiting individuals from the communities. Uh, that's how we're going to make, I think, a, 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 a sizable dent in the problem that you're talking about, which is training a future workforce across the board that is familiar with communities of need, committed to serving communities of need across racial and ethnic lines, across geography, uh, and all the rest. And I would say here in Los Angeles County, there's a variety of commitments to that, and most notably, uh, the, the Drew Medical School does an outstanding job uh, of training um, a diverse, extremely diverse set of medical school candidates and offering them also residency opportunities. Uh, a lot of those individuals are from communities of color, born and raised in various parts of Los Angeles County. They have those life experiences. And we've seen again and again that after the completion of their residency training, they return in higher numbers uh, to the communities that they came from and work in those communities. And that's an incredibly important uh, contribution uh, that Drew makes to the entire Los Angeles County. Of course, you know, I mean, I'm certain that you know from your own experience how difficult it is when you are the person. I mean, the two women of color on this board, the one queer person on this board, and all five of us who are women can tell you when if you're the one saying no, no, no to your entire class. From my experience, you know, this is what it is, and they all like, it's, it's a lot to put on any of the students themselves, though representation is a really important thing. But I, I think... Um, I don't know any way that here in the county we can actually impact training, but it's a, it's a really important piece. Um, I don't know, continuing education, uh, whatever we might require. You know, the bar requires that you take some class every other year uh, on, you know, on diversity and understanding uh, how these things impact the law. But I don't know how seriously people take it. I just know that when you're one of the people that you're trying to get people to pay attention to, I remember in the early days, and now that Roe v. Wade is at risk, maybe even again, people would say, well, what is it you women want? You know, like, you're the representation of all the entire female population. Just tell me what you want. It's, it's too much of a burden. So I hope we uh, find a way that we can maybe impact training, even if it's only for our own make certain that they really understand these communities. Um, I have thank 17 you. more questions, but thank you very much, Madam Chair. <laughs> thank, thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. You know, and, and, I, and I would argue, I follow, followed you in the legislature and carried a bill that turned out to be surprisingly controversial when we looked at the African-American maternal morbidity rate in this state and simply asked that all health professionals who are involved in, in birthing um, have implicit bias testing. Because I think the issue is not just medical schools. We have to address the current um, um, group of healthcare professionals as well. Um, serious opposition from usual suspects. And I think that we as a county have an opportunity to have a different kind of conversation as an employer, because one of the hiccups, if you will, was that hospitals don't employ doctors. But we as a county do employ our healthcare professionals. And so to figure out a way in which we can begin the process, because the, the, the point was not necessarily a training, but to put people in check with their own bias. Yep. And so even if they were to self-regulate um, um, and 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 dispel the myth that black women have a higher pain threshold, dispel the myth that our skin is more difficult to penetrate, the horrific things we heard from medical students by surveying them. And so I think that we perhaps have an opportunity as an employer of healthcare professionals to talk about that in a meaningful, tangible and way. And Dr. Ferrer brought up that other important point, which you just mentioned about blaming the people. You know, well, your community has a higher getting sick rate it must be your own fault, you know, you're, you're not eating right, you're not protecting yourself, you're not getting vaccinated, whatever it is. Uh, and that's an important piece that we have recognized. That's our responsibility. We're not gonna say, oh, everything is your fault. Um, it was almost, I remember when we were in law school, there was one um, professor, not, you know, that we read, not at our school, that said that the best way to deal with air pollution is just for everybody to wear a mask. 
because then you don't have to clean up the pollution, which was very expensive. <laughs> it was only, you know, $2 for each person. And um, cheapest cost avoider was what the legal theory was called. So we want to be careful not to engage in that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supervisor Solis. A very lively discussion, and um, I want to thank uh, Barbara Ferrer and Dr. Galley again for presenting information that just reminds me again how we have many gaps and holes in our healthcare system, and it's very clear and evident that disparities continue to be exacerbated, so to speak, and I want to draw your attention to one of the slides, uh, Dr. Ferrer, that you pointed out that to me is still very alarming. Even after we've gone through the worst, or we thought the worst of COVID, we still see among the Latinx community 25,543.9 case rates. Uh, these are hospitalization and, and then case rates and then hospitalization rates very high again, 1,983.8, and death rates highest amongst all the different groups that you've you've showed us here. Of uh, 452.6 uh, deaths, and this is, I guess, up to uh, March the 1st through May 1st. So these numbers, to me, continue to be staggering, and they're they're not acceptable. They're just not acceptable, and I really do think that the alarm has to be sounded. And it, and you know, I agree with my my colleague, Supervisor Kuehl, that you can't blame the people for the high rate of death or hospitalizations because it's more than that. It's about job insecurity and continuing to face lack of access to health care. Even when you do have health care, you have to provide a co-payment or your doctor or your person that you'd like to see may not be available to treat you. They're overwhelmed too. And I keep seeing this occurring and I, I want to just continue to push our county family, our staff, to uh, continue to look at those areas that we know are most impacted. And, and Dr. Ferrer, you pointed those out. It's not just the San Gabriel Valley in my district, it's East LA, unincorporated areas, and even Hacienda Heights, I would say. And that's amongst the minority communities there. But we really need to do more to make investments because our, our private sector uh, health systems don't always reach our communities. So I think we, I really want to just continue to, to press ahead on that. And, and also just to ask again, the high number of Latinos that are, that are uh, going to the hospital, fully vaccinated, okay, I can see that that's great. And that, that's a good trend. But when they're unvaccinated, oh my God, at the slide I'm looking at right now, Fully vaccinated, 83. Unvaccinated, 351 hospitalizations. So that means they're out. They're not working. Somebody has to pay that bill, and perhaps many of them, I would, I would, I don't know if I could even say that. I don't know if they have health care coverage. And so they may, may end up uh, coming to our hospitals or may not even be coming to a hospital at all. And then the death rates, again, for Latinos continue to be the highest amongst all the groups, 181. And those, those are the ones that are not vaccinated. And I continue to say, what are we doing to make sure that this gets out to them? And I can't, I can't underscore how important it is to use live radio, to use systems that people listen to at their work sites. I continue to receive a lot of calls saying, why are we not reaching our workforce, the essential workers that we know their, their names aren't shown here, but that's probably who these people are. And we really do need to spend money, funds, to target in, in, a, in a more, um, could I say, strategic manner, especially where these workplaces are right now, where we see our, our workforce coming back and uh, having to work, but yet maybe their employer isn't giving them time off. They're afraid to say anything. They're fearful they're gonna lose their job. And I keep hearing those stories over and over from my staff. I, I want to say also that I'm very concerned about <clears throat> what they call long COVID amongst these communities. And I've yet to see any information. I think our county, I've asked the county before to look into this, and I think we're waiting for some feedback. So I'd like to know where the status is and if we're working with UCLA 
or any other institution because I believe they were conducting studies, but to really take a closer look at the disparities in terms of the populations here as well. Um, what I continue to be concerned about is that uh, the reinfection rate and what does that impact have on people that are from low-income, uh, disadvantaged communities that don't have access to health care. What does that mean for us going forward? And then also for our young people, and I don't mean necessarily the secondary uh, students, I'm meaning, I'm really thinking about the, the younger ones, the infants that are maybe, they can't get the vaccination, but what is happening with them, and especially with communities of color. Those are, those are my questions. I agree with much of what has been said, that we have to increase our efforts to get more uh, funding from the federal government. And I think we should have our lobbyists ready in, in uh, Washington and Sacramento, and we need to raise hell. We need to raise hell, because this is unacceptable. We're the largest county, the largest county in the country, and we can't seem to get any, um, any traction. And at least, perhaps, maybe some other uh, regulatory relief might be provided. If you can't get it through the House, then there might be some other ways of getting that funding here. So I would just, I would just ask for that. So Dr. Ferrer, D Dr. Galley, you want to respond? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Solis, and, and for all your support as well. Um, so long COVID, I, I, you know, again, there's, we've got a couple of academic medical centers that are setting up to actually provide care for patients with long COVID. We're obviously talking with them. Uh, there's not much uh, that's really been published yet, um, a, you know, that's sort of population based. I, I share your same worry that if you have disproportionality in the number of, uh, in the case rates by race and ethnicity, by people living in communities with high rates of poverty, you're gonna see disproportionality for sure in the long COVID cases. Um, and again, that can get aggravated, as you noted, if some people who uh, live in communities with less resources have a harder time uh, getting access to uh, any kinds of support for or treatment for long COVID, because there is, there's no standardization on that treatment. People show up with uh, many different um, symptoms that affect many different uh, systems in their body uh, for long COVID. So it, it's a complicated um, diagnosis. It's a complicated, uh, you know, disease to treat um, because folks don't know everything they want to know about it yet. Uh, but I do want to note that we have submitted an application to be a site uh, with CDC that will actually track uh, patients over, I think it's a three year period so that we would be in on one of the larger studies that really is looking at trying to develop a much better understanding of all the questions you asked. Who gets it? Why do some people get it and other people don't? When people get it, what are the best treatments uh, for them? Uh, how do we make sure that folks are able to access services and support for long COVID? Because you'll hear lots of nightmare stories. You know, I went to the doctor, they told me they can't, there was nothing they could do about it. They told me to come back in three months, but I'm not able to work. You know, this is untenable. Um, so, you know, I share your concerns. I think over time we'll we'll get more and more information. I, I also want to, you know, sort of use it as an opportunity to just say why people should be cautious. When we don't know everything we need to do about long COVID uh, and who gets affected and how, you know, what is the, the course of, um, of someone's experience with long COVID and how much of that results in some more long-term disability, you really don't want to take, you don't want to go like just go out and get infected. I, I talk to a lot of people who say, no big deal. I'm just going to get infected and I'm incredulous because there's so much unknown here, um, especially around long COVID. Uh, and, and that includes long COVID and children. So, um, so I appreciate your concern on that. In terms of the reinfection rate, uh, the, Many, many people who have been already infected uh, have in fact been reinfected. So you're right to note that um, contrary to what many people had hoped, being infected once does not prevent you from getting 
uh, reinfected at a later date. Um, this was particularly true for people who had been infected with Delta and then found out that uh, they weren't vaccinated and found out that they got reinfected with Omicron. But it also happens even among people who have been vaccinated. There are people vaccinated and boosted who have now were infected initially, now have been infected again. Um, so again, um, there is a possibility for everyone to get uh, infected a second time. A little bit of disturbing early news out of South Africa is that uh, folks who were infected with, you know, the Omicron variant BA.4, BA.5, some of them had been previously infected with the earlier strains of Omicron. And uh, that would actually be hugely problematic um, because, again, you know, we, we generally count on people having uh, at least a couple of months of immunity, but we also count on there being less reinfections within uh, one type, one strain of the virus. And if that's not going to hold true again, which it might not, then we again have to reemphasize how important it is for people to get vaccinated, even if they've been infected. And lastly, vaccination for, for younger, for our youngest children, uh, the timeline has been set by the FDA to review the Moderna application. If the Pfizer application is complete by June, I'm assuming that will get reviewed as, as well. They've set three dates in June to go over the data that was submitted. We're preparing, obviously, to be able to roll out opportunities uh, for parents to get children uh, under the age of five vaccinated as soon as those approvals uh, come through. It will be an emergency use authorization uh, for that age group. I, I want to note we continue, as you know, supervisor, to work hard to answer parents' questions about vaccine safety for the pediatric dose that's used for 5 to 11-year-olds. That's where we've seen the least number of children vaccinated, the least number of any group, age group vaccinated, uh, and are doing a big campaign right now are urging parents to make sure their children are well protected as they're going into their summer activities. Uh, but we do, as, as you noted, we do have a lot of promotoras out there. We do a lot of interviews. We do a lot of town halls. We do a lot of sessions. We have our community ambassador program, which now has thousands of ambassadors in it so that we could do peer-to-peer -peer education. Uh, so we are trying, uh, as you noted, that important strategy of making sure we're available to answer people's questions, give them good information, and connect them uh, to appropriate uh, resources. I think I got to all three of those. I think, I think so. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Dr. Galley and Dr. Frere, for your continued work uh, to uh, inform and protect our residents particularly as it relates to vaccines, to testing, to treatment. The great takeaway today was uh, Supervisor Kuehl, you just really reiterating, let me, let me uh, say this one more time, it's free, right? You can, you can do it from home, you can do it from your phone, your computer, drugs will be delivered to your door and it will be free. I think that's gonna be a big relief to a lot of people who are still uh, concerned about uh, going out. Um, you know, uh, I do think, I'm glad we're still talking about vaccinations, and, and, and um, I think that's still really a key uh, provision to making sure whatever comes our way this summer, or the winter, that you know, the more people we can get vaccinated, uh, the more we're going to be able to withstand um, any kind of a surge or uh, a variant that maybe we haven't even given a letter to yet. Uh, I have a vaccine van, and I'm uh, having it stop at, at cities, at events, at art festivals. It's um, going all across my district. It's in Commerce, Southgate, Linwood, Bell, Maywood, Walnut Park, Pico Rivera. Um, this, Saturday, this Thursday, again, we're going to be in downtown San Pedro at the first Thursday art festival. We're trying to meet people where they're at, making it convenient and easy, um, even for someone who may not have thought about it, but they see uh, our vaccination van and they see how easy it is and maybe they'll consider protecting themselves. I was going to ask about how ready we are for children under five should that vaccination uh, be authorized in June, but I think you answered 
of that. Um, I got to tell you, I give big kudos to our public health nurses um, all across the board. But uh, when I visited a vaccine site in Commerce, uh, the public health nurses had gone beyond and above and did this whole room that was just for kids, right? It had balloons, it had children's books, it had stuffed animals, it was colorful, it had lights. And immediately, um, if a parent came in with a child, it was a completely different atmosphere than just kind of a scary, here's where, the, here's where you're gonna get your shot. And I'm hoping uh, that we can replicate that um, at all of our vaccine sites. And, um, but again, I, I, I was just so impressed. I'm always impressed with our public health nurses, but I really appreciate the way they tried to put at ease the parents and the kids when it came to um, vaccines. Do you think um, that's feasible, uh, particularly before June, when we think that the under uh, five will be authorized? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Hanna. And especially thanks for continuing to make it so easy uh, for folks to get vaccinated. I, I totally agree with you. That's, you know, we, we can't we can't lose sight of how important that is. And, and getting people vaccinated remains the most important task in front of us. I do think all of our sites have a, a special area for children. I know for sure uh, Ted Watkins does and um, I know for sure Obregon Park does. Um, I have to check, I'm, the, the sites I'm not sure are the smaller sites that we have up in Antelope Valley, but I can get back to everybody on that. It might, it's not always a room because as some of you know who go to our sites, we don't always have multiple rooms that right. we're able to use at a site, but we always have a special area for children. Uh, we always have books, we always have toys, we always have, you know, sort of our, our pediatric uh, team um, that's, you know, uh, spends sometimes half an hour uh, with a family making sure that child is comfortable and, and can get vaccinated. So I, I too applaud them all. They've been amazing. I've, you know, obviously every time we've opened up for a new age group, uh, they've been swamped and uh, their patience and kindness and just sort of ability to, to really reassure both parents and children, uh, I find uh, extraordinary. So I, I thank you for that shout out for them. I, I agree. They're, Our public they're health so nurses amazing. are are the best. Um, yeah. Some of my other questions were already um, answered and um, I just wanted to, again, thank you. I don't know if I've uh, really heard us dwell down on the idea of connecting residents to services, housing, whatever at our at our testing and vaccination sites. I think that is exactly right. Um, and I think that's a lot of what we're uh, going to talk about in a later agenda item as it relates to our homeless initiative is just making sure all of our county departments are kind of touching people wherever we find them, wherever we come into contact with them. Uh, it's never just about the vaccine. You know, it's never just about the test. It's never just about a roof over your head. There's so much more than I think we can help provide to the whole uh, resident of LA County. And so I appreciate your focus on that. Let us know how we can help at these sites to further that uh, initiative of uh, uh, getting them services just beyond uh, a vaccine or a test. So thank you. Thank you to both of you for the work that you do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. Supervisor Barger. Thank you, and, and I'll be short. I, I want to also thank you, Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Galley, um, and your entire team. Um, there's no question that these last couple of years have been very trying for all staff, and everyone has stepped up to the plate. I just want to get a clarification on the, um, what I couldn't see it in the slides, what is the vaccination rate right now for Los Angeles County? Um, we're we're at uh, slightly over seventy five percent of uh, individuals five and older. Those are those who are eligible, obviously, uh, are fully vaccinated. Um, we've got about fifty seven percent of those eligible for their first booster dose. Obviously, we just started rolling out the second dose, but 
of those eligible for the first booster dose, 57% have received their first booster dose. That those rates uh, vary significantly, especially on the booster doses by age, um, so that older people have a higher rate of getting boosted, obviously, than younger people. So uh, that's a, a rate across, again, for boosters, uh, those 12 and older. Um, so we, you know, we continue, uh, as noted, work to try to make sure people uh, still have that very easy access. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, our team goes to anybody's house if they want to get vaccinated at this point. Like, we'll do, we'll do anything to get people uh, comfortable with getting that vaccine dose. Um, and, uh, you know, because we, we think it's so important, and at this point, every additional person that gets vaccinated helps all of us, and, and we know that, you know, provides protection to themselves, their family, and everybody around them. So. We're going to continue to work hard on that, but it's very slow going at the moment. Very well, slow going. And I and I appreciate that. And I think you know, to Supervisor Hahn's um, point about taking the bans out to any activity, um, yes. it's an opportunity. And for every one that we get to do it, that's one less that is vulnerable to, to hospitalization. Um, regarding the test, and thank you for talking to the secretary about getting the reimbursement um, and knowing that they don't plan on doing it. I guess my question is um, more about the cost per month that we're paying, and maybe that's to Fesia, um, because are we budgeting it? I mean, my concern is, is that we are very focused on access to testing, um, and I think that it's important for continuity that this board be aware of what the costs are going to be so that we can prepare, recognizing that if, you know, during the holidays we saw the numbers go up and people getting more access or uh, looking for testing and getting more testing, I just hope we're prepared and financially um, are ahead of the curve as it relates to budgeting for that. I don't know if it's Fesia, Dr. Galley, whomever wants to answer, because it comes Mr. out of your Rucker, budget. I can speak to the, to the average numbers. So what we have budgeted and, and we've submitted to the CEO, and I know they're working through this along with a number of other requests and, and demands on those resources. Uh, is approximately $7 million per month to maintain the community testing program, which would include covering the cost of the uninsured. Now, the expenditure is lower in quieter months and higher in surge months, but what we project at this point to be the average expenditure over the next year, barring any major changes in the pandemic, would be about $7 million per month. Thank you, Supervisor. This is uh, Fisia Davenport, Chief Executive Officer. So we are going to be released working with your offices and the health departments on ARP tranche two. Uh, we have identified a figure that we uh, have placed in our preliminary planning as a plug, but we need to refine that number. And as Dr. Galley said, uh, we will be working with her staff closely. And we also have a written request from Dr. Ferrer. Uh, so our teams will be meeting to refine our number. But at the end of the day, the answer is yes, we are planning uh, to recommend to your board an allocation that uh, we hope that will cover uh, the health response uh, to COVID. Right, and, and, and then a follow-up to that question, as it relates to the testing, do we have a percentage that are billing insurance and are the insurance companies reimbursing? Because I've heard stories that some have denied, and I just want to make sure that we are coordinating and and, and being a watchdog as it relates to companies and coverage on this? Yeah, Supervisor, it's a great question. Where we receive complete insurance information, we are uh, have very high success rates with billing and with reimbursement. There's always a few cases where it's rejected. We do work and our vendor works to appeal those. Uh, but the vast majority where we have complete insurance information ourselves or our vendor are able to um, bill and receive reimbursement for individuals that also don't necessarily have their insurance information but they provide us with sufficient demographic information we're often able to look up whether they have insurance and often can identify that insurance information and then also bill in those cases so that's been a successful effort as well there are exceptions there are some some cases and, and, and situations where insurance um, and plans have pushed back and we, we work through those and our vendor works through those as much as possible. But really the biggest challenge is the number of individuals who don't have insurance 
Uh, though with the recent expansion of Medi-Cal to all individuals who are age 50 and over, regardless of documentation status, that's a huge win uh, for a number of individuals who don't lack insurance, um, who lacked insurance prior to that May 1st implementation date. Uh, and then also the number of people who do have insurance, but for various reasons aren't able or willing to provide us that information. We then also don't have a recourse or ability to build the plans if we don't have insurance plan information or sum sufficient uh, demographic information to look them up. But where we have the data, we do pretty well at billing. Right, and then and I'll just close with this. I mean, in, Dr. Burr, I remember early on in, in the pandemic when, well, not early on, like six months into it, um, you started to track um, uh, lack of access to testing, to healthcare. <clears throat> and this pretty much mirrors what you've seen, um, only it's grown exponentially as it relates to um, the number of people impacted. So I guess what I would say is there are lessons learned, and I'm looking forward to you all putting something together for this board that addresses um, lack of access to healthcare in certain communities. I know um, that. Uh, when I first started, we used to do um, mobile healthcare clinics out in the Antelope Valley to areas that didn't have access to healthcare. We now have the uh, ambulatory care center there, um, but clearly there are um, deserts as it relates to healthcare. So I think it's important for us to begin to lay that groundwork. Um, we did it with the 1115 waiver when we started to expand outpatient care, um, recognizing that if we did that, they were less likely to come into our emergency room. Um, but as you know, the numbers have grown and the emergency room is back to being over overflowing. So I think we have an opportunity there. Um, and I think it's important for us also to recognize that we put testing in areas where there were not access to the pharmacies that we partner with, Walgreens, CVS and all. I think it's important for us to put that also as one of our um, uh, to-do list, if you will, um, in those areas where individuals didn't have access to um, testing, uh, where we didn't have something set up, and to, to your credit, Spudges, I know early on you focused on that, um, where we didn't have the pharmacies and all. Um, but I think it's important for us as a board uh, to look at the private sector as well in terms of how we need to encourage them um, to be I don't want to say better partners, but for lack of better thought, um, a word, better partners um, in getting access to services in areas that are disadvantaged. And I think it's an important message, but this is consistent, Dr. Furrow, with what you've said from six months into the pandemic when you were following um, areas that there was serious impact, um, and it was in the areas that are, are on this graph. Um, and I think it speaks volumes to the fact that we have a lot of work to do um, and our lessons learned and I look forward to doing it. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor, for all the leadership. And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that's, that's why I tried to highlight some of the places where we just, you know, we, we just, there's some really big issues that need to get addressed. And, you know, I, I give so much credit to the county family for like stepping up to fill in these gaps, but we have some systems that don't really work for, for hundreds and hundreds of, of thousands of people right now. Um, so, you know, we need to we need to figure out what that strategy would look like. And, you know, again, uh, certainly for some of the smaller providers, they just needed help um, because they just didn't have the resources to be able to expand outside of their patient, uh, you know, their patients. They couldn't really do their community. Um, so, you know, I think we've learned a lot and, and again, appreciate all your support on this. Thank you, Supervisor Barger. And, and I would agree, we have learned a lot. When I think about, you know, how far this board and the previous board, you know, how far the county has come since, you know, March 2020, um, when we all recognized the importance of standing up those first five mega sites and then quickly pivoting to the community sites, hearing Supervisor Hahn and the work she's continuing to do. That's all important, those are lessons learned. Getting back to Supervisor Kuehl's point and Dr. Ferrer's data, there are populations. I, I believe that access in this issue is no longer a challenge. I think the county has come so far. If you want a vaccination or booster, you can get it wherever you live in LA County. The issue is, that is the harder issue is the issue around race and why that there are 
communities of people who don't trust the healthcare delivery system and why? Because they have been um, insulted, have received par, subpar care, and don't trust us, which is why the promotoris and those models are so important because those are peer-to-peer -peer conversations that will help us cut through the long history of systemic racism that brings us to the point where we see the disparities in the data, thank you Dr. Ferrer, that you continue to remind us of, and I hope that you will continue to remind us because we can't leave that part out. Great lessons learned, we expanded access, we pivoted the community-based partners, all good. We have to cut deeper into what is preventing people from trusting their healthcare provider, whoever that may be, um, to go in and access care. And that's the harder work, the work around training, uh, the work around expanding the diversity of the healthcare delivery system, all of the above. The CEO of our own Martin Luther King Community Hospital wrote a heart-wrenching article in the New Yorker about telling the story of her own college-educated 93-year-old black mother and why she, with a daughter who was a healthcare provider, refused to be vaccinated. And the, the CEO of a hospital talked about her mother's own experience in, later in life um, um, with the healthcare providers and how different it was, quite frankly, when she bought, brought her to MLK Community Hospital. And there were providers who not only were culturally competent and sensitive, but looked like her, quite frankly. Um, so we have to continue to figure out how we do that difficult work. Um, again, Dr. Ferrer, your data is a reminder to us, to me at least, that our equity-based investments, the lens we're using in shaping our ARP spending plan, are both timely and appropriate. And so I'm very glad about that. The one question I would have, and I think you and Dr. Galley both mentioned promotores, and we know how valuable they are, as Supervisor Hahn said. It, it's not just communicating where to get a vaccine or a booster, but how to access any service you might need. Um, I know that former Secretary Yolanda Richardson, in one of her trips here where she walked with community outreach workers that the state funded, talked about her aha moment where she realized we shouldn't just be funding them for this, this contract, for this, this rather narrow work, but we should continue their funding because we're going to need them for other things. Uh, it's my understanding that there's some of the contracts for the promotoris will be ending June 30th. They have historically been funded by the state level. Do either of you know if that state funding is going to come? Because what will not be helpful to us or the communities they serve or the organizations that provide that service is this start and stop. When government funding comes, then it ends. Then it comes back after you've already had to lay off all of those wonderfully trained and experienced people. So are either of you aware of whether the state is going to step up and continue the funding for the various promotoris contracts and organizations that are providing that work? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Mitchell, you know, for your leadership. And, and uh, this is a really important question. It's complicated in the response, um, and we can give you, you know, sort of a more detailed response in writing because there were, there's at least four different sources of funding for the promotoras and the community health workers in LA County that are working with us. And, and Dr. Galley uh, and the, you know, the Department of Health Services and the Department of Public Health have been jointly for funding some of this through some equity funds that we received through philanthropy. Uh, the state contract that I think you're referencing is the Choi contract, which was used uh, primarily in the past to help us make sure that people were being able to enroll in health insurance um, and uh, get connected uh, to the range of health services. And that funding, you know, uh, it's, it's like we're constantly trying to get the state to, to continue that funding. Uh, I don't think that uh, they have to date, you know, really definitively informed us that they will continue that funding. Uh, but we agree with you that, um, which is, you know, sort of one of our main focuses right now is these community partners that we have, because the way we're really working with the promotoras most effectively is they are hired through a community-based organization. Uh, and then they, they live in their communities and they get trained 
to do not just work around COVID, but really be responsive to the needs of that community. And we shouldn't be always worrying about how we're going to fund that uh, and relying on, you know, what I call, you know, uh, good money, but uh, not sustained money, which, you know, a lot of our philanthropic partners, you know, put, put some significant dollars into this. But again, it, it doesn't last forever. And, uh, and we don't want to lose them. So we're constantly scrounging around to find other grants that will replace this funding source. Uh, and again, you know, we think these are areas where it's worth uh, discussions with the board and with uh, the CEO about how to sustain these movements uh, over time. And I, I, you know, I think that's why I stress, like, it's not enough to fund the public health department. Like, our infrastructure for public health work are these community-based organizations. And, and we learned that lesson immediately in this pandemic. We cannot do this work without those partnerships. And for some of that work, we need to have sustained funding moving forward. Can I just add on that? There's a variety of state bills and opportunities that I think are coming on the horizon that offer a chance to think about funding for CHWs and Promotoras. CalAIM represents some of those opportunities. The uh, pre-release, post-release re-entry services will provide a potential opportunity to fund CHWs and Promotoras. Uh, and there's some bills also out there which um, uh, we, uh, the departments and, and the AHI are working in partnership with CEO's Legislative Affairs Division on. Uh, unless we think HRSA isn't funding anything, they also have, HRSA has put out a grant opportunity to fund about a quarter of a billion dollars in funds to put toward training for community health workers and uh, DPH and DHS along with AHI are looking at that potential grant opportunity, which would provide uh, additional resources to train our own county CHWs on as well. So it's a it's a very active front. There's a lot going on, but I know we both uh, firmly believe in the model and know the potential that it has for certain vulnerable uh, groups of people and being able to do more effective outreach. I appreciate that. Um, sometimes, you know, good money late is, you know, equivalent to no money at all. So I, those are wonderful opportunities. I'm glad to know that they're in the works. I just hope that we don't, uh, that, that they get to us on time so these contracts don't end. And these community-based organizations are expected to kind of start up all over again. Uh, I want to lend my thanks to both of you, echo the comments made by uh, my colleagues about the stellar leadership um, you have exhibited. Uh, on behalf of all of us who call LA County home, we appreciate you very much. Can you there? Yes. I, I'm sorry. It's okay. I, I, no, but I do want to say that this board did vote for $30 million for the Prometoras program. And that was through our, you know, through our recovery money, but it clearly isn't sufficient. And I do agree with everything that has been said. We really do need to, you know, look strategically where we can get other funding sources here. And I know that Planned Parenthood for many, many years used the model of Promotoras, and they actually didn't just talk about enrollment into our healthcare system, they talked about prevention, they talked about everything. In fact, Dr. Ferrer, you, you recall, you had some of our Promotoras out there in uh, the East LA Exide uh, incident. 12, I mean, we had many of them coming out there talking about healthcare overall. So it wasn't just one thing, but certainly we need to take advantage of training them. Adri, I think of well over 7,000 in the state of California right now. And we should be able to use at least those that are here in, in the county to work strategically with our department. So I am looking forward to doing whatever we can to, to continue to grow that. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to the board and to Dr. Frere and Dr. Galley for your leadership on this. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Seeing no other comments, thank you both of you for joining us. This report is received and filed, and such will be the order. Moving on, colleagues, to agenda item number four, implementing the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness. It will be heard in conjunction with item number 26, implementing a new framework to end homelessness in LA County. It was held by, uh, item four was held by Supervisor Barger, um, and item 26 was held by Supervisor Hahn and Barger. We have a group of people who will be making a presentation, but Super Supervisor Barger, we're going to ask you to speak to agenda item four first. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I thought, it, rather than hearing from me, I thought it would be beneficial for us to have the presentation by um, the Blue Ribbon uh, Commission's Executive or Director, Mary Wickham, huh? who I believe is on. I thought it would be beneficial to have that kind of set the stage, if that would be okay with my co-author. So you'd like them to speak first, or you want to give your remarks first? I want them to speak first, oh, please. That's what I asked you. No. <laughs> All right. Ms. Thank Wickham, you. Executive Director of the Blue Ribbon Commission. Hey, you're muted. Unmute. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and Supervisor Barger and the entire board. It's good to see you all again. Um, and thank you for inviting us here today. My name is Mary Wickham. I'm the Executive Director of the Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness. And thank you for inviting me and my team to present to the board today on the recommendations made by the Blue Ribbon Commission. With me, I have Amy Park, who's a Deputy County Counsel from the Office of County Counsel, who will be presenting, and Brandon Young, who's a partner in the law firm of Manat, Phelps, and Phillips. Um, also uh, uh, available are the two co-chairs for the Blue Ribbon Commission, Sarah Dusso and Christian Horvath. Uh, we're all here to answer questions after the presentation. Um, we have about a 15 minute presentation that we'll quickly go through. We'll provide background on the commission meetings and the process we went through. And then Brandon will walk you through the recommendations. And then we're all here to answer any questions you may have. So thank you for this time. And I'll turn it over to Amy. Thank you, Mary. Uh, may we go to the next slide, please? Good afternoon, Supervisors. My name is Amy Park, and I'm an attorney with County Council and a member of the Berg staff. So as you know, on July 27th, 2021, the, your board established the, Ruben, the Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness to, among other things, analyze various homeless governance reports and other governance models in the state and throughout the country, and to provide recommendations for a new governance model appropriate for LA County, recommendations that include how the unincorporated areas of the county cities, COGS, and regional representatives can be incorporated into the governance structure, and recommendations that seek to enhance accountability, transparency, and inclusivity. Next slide, please. So in order to develop these recommendations, the commission and the Birch staff underwent a tremendous research and fact-finding process. Over a six-month period, the commission held 20 public meetings from September through March 2022, and during the six month process, over 280 individuals or groups, including but not limited to advocates, people with lived experience, service providers, and cities participated through the public meetings, presentations, and interviews to, to assist in developing the recommendations put forth by the commission. And I will pass it over to Brandon. Thank you. Can we uh, go to the next slide, please? So good afternoon, Brandon Young, partner with Matt Phillips. Appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, what I, we're going to do for the next couple slides is go through the seven recommendations that were unanimously approved by, by the Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness. And the intent here is to simply focus on the primary components of each of the recommendations, just reduced to the essence um, what was approved by the commission. So beginning with recommendation one, the county entity and leader. The primary components of this recommendation is to create an entity with responsible charge, accountability, and authority over homelessness within the county. What does that mean? Well, there would be a focus on prevention, rehousing, housing acquisition. In fact, there's a proposal for a centralized housing acquisition unit within this community. Access to medical care, including care for mental health and substance abuse disorders, ensuring accountability for timely contracting and payment, and urgent access to services, whether that be 24 seven outreach, housing services, work over the weekends, uh, ensuring that there's a single point of contact for our homeless response system. In addition to the entity itself, uh, there would need to be the identification of a county leader. Uh, the intent from the commission is to not reshuffle the deck, nor create a new loan brief bureaucracy, but to work to enhance the current uh, system and break down siloing within that system. Attendant and also related to the county entity would be the creation of inter-county work. So this is kind of the main point of coordination 
where there would be work groups focused on things like access to treatment, discharge planning, criminal justice, working across county silos. And then establishing some regional leadership infrastructure or regional committees, which is a gap in the current system. And this part of the recommendation focuses on the creation and convening of regional committees uh, staffed by or contributed from uh, leaders of cities throughout the region to help form decisions, policy, uh, and solicit feedback. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide just focuses primarily on what that would look like. Uh, so I urge uh, for those who are interested to uh, evaluate the slide. Next slide, please. So recommendation number two, measure each local solutions. The primary components of this recommendation are in order to improve and create relationships with cities and colleagues, establish a multi-year local solutions fund within Metro H. That fund would use an algorithm or be funded at amount to be, to be determined at the discretion of the board and to be made available to jurisdictions that are willing to make to provide an in-kind or matching contribution for the development of service programs, housing, and the sharing of data. And I'd like to emphasize that it's in-kind or matching contributions, meaning it's not just money that would be uh, contemplated through this recommendation. Of course, any, any local solution program should not detract from, take dollars away from the successful work from their stakeholders and must ensure equity. Next slide, please. This is another schematic that just simply summarizes the main concerns and recommendations of work to measure each local solutions. Next slide. Recommendation number three, streamline LASA. So in this recommendation, there are two parts. One is the role LASA is to play. And the second is the governance within LASA. So beginning with the role, the primary component would be for LASA to transition away from direct services in order for the county entity to coordinate urgent access to direct services. Now, of course, the recommendation here doesn't uh, specify uh, how that would be done um, and would be, you know, a piece of this would be subject to further evaluation and study. Relatedly, a primary component of this recommendation would be the studying of allocation of certain, certain measure H funds between LASA, county departments, and the county entity, recognizing that in a world where there is a county entity, there may need to be a study as to how resources are allocated. But of course, even in that scenario, it should not disrupt from service delivery or undercut successful programs. So a very important guardrail with respect to how the Blue Ribbon Commission viewed this particular recommendation. The intent here is to ensure that LASA is focused on its role as our continuum of care lead. So that means our lead in the rehousing space, as well as the point in time count, the homeless management information system, and the annual application to HUD with respect to the continuum of care. With respect to the governance of streamlined LASA, the primary component is to maintain the current number of seats on the LASA Commission 10, but change who sits on them. So that would involve an analysis with respect to having perhaps county department heads or the head of the county entity. So there's a synergistic interconnectivity between the county, the county's mainline mainstream systems and homeless service services delivery system, as well as persons with local expertise, hogs, or other cities. Next slide, please. Again, in the spirit of just summarizing what this could look like. This slide kind of identifies at a very high level what the streamlined LASA would be. Next slide. Recommendation number four, modifying the continuum of care leadership. So with this recommendation, the primary component is to begin the process to consolidate the LASA Commission, the continuum of care board, and the coordinated entry system policy council into a single board. This process would include the analysis of the size, composition, and equity pieces of what that body would look like, and would have, but not be limited to, representation from hogs, persons with experience, subject matter expertise, business, and faith-based organizations. In the interim, as the process to move toward consolidation, which would be an involved process, um, comes to be, 
the recommendation from the Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness is to at least appoint county department heads to the CES Policy Council. Now, the CES Policy Council is a body that sits within our continuum of care that is responsible and helps drive policy for bed prioritization and service prioritization. So the intent of that recommendation is to bring a greater connection and accountability for our mainstream county systems into the decision making and coordination that relates to the coordinated entry of the policy council. I'll just point out here that with this particular recommendation, it would require a majority vote of six of 10 loss of commissioners to begin the process and could, depending on the final shape of that consolidation, involve the amendment of the loss of powers agreement, which inevitably would involve partnership with the city of Los Angeles, as well as changing something called the COC charter, which is a governing document that applies to our region's continuum of care which in and of itself would involve a discussion with HUD. Next slide, please. Again, in the spirit of summarization, simply this graphic is just trying to capture the, the multiple governance boards within WASA and the continuum of care and how it would be consolidated into a single board. Next slide. Recommendation number five, improving losses operations. The primary components here are first, Defining decision making responsibilities, including but not limited to between those with the loss of commission, the loss of executive director, and the various boards within WASA and the COC, as well as other entities. In addition, the recommendation calls for the embedding of an ops team to improve losses operations, focus on contracting, procurement, and payment systems, technical assistance, improving communications, weekend work and ensuring that LASA's executive team has the depth, resources, and support to operate an organization of its size and complexity. This particular recommendation is motiv motivated by, among other things, prior audit findings, not of reports from the county. So the intent here is to help LASA accelerate the work that's already being done to implement those findings. Next slide, please. Recommendation number six data and metrics. So at a high level, the primary components of this recommendation is to require data sharing, whether it be through HMIS access, between county departments, between cities, county, and loss. So to break away and break down artificial barriers to data sharing. Relatedly, part of this would include the establishment and the implementation of quality standards for data input, data sharing, access, and reporting obviously to be compliant with law and as a means to protect uh, privacy as well as the accuracy of data. Of course, another component within it relates to some of the other recommendations, including but not limited to the Measure H Local Solutions Fund, would be the defining and implementing, implementing metrics of success and tools for accountability. So obviously, how money is spent needs to be key to positive outcomes and that those outcomes should be tracked. And then finally, developing formulas for tracking, whether it be measure each funds at a county department in a, on a city by city level, something that through our review does not exist. Uh, the use of all funds system wide, which there are pieces of that throughout the system, but not um, in a comprehensive way. And then ensuring and really thinking about when we do define metrics, to have those metrics viewed through an equity lens and to capitalize on other things existing county systems, including CEO already, to ensure that we do have that level of view and rigor to our metrics. Next slide, please. The final recommendation is the creation of an executive level action team. So the primary components here were, would be for the county to support a centering form, a form that would be designed for the highest level decision makers in our region to convene and it's intended to define, to drive reforms requiring urgency, discuss issues of common interest, and to facilitate the, the, the data development and sharing. So again, the idea is we would have a county entity, but we would also have an executive level action team at the very top to ensure consistency uh, across the system and urgency across the system. Next slide. 
this is just another summary of kind of the more specific details of the executive, executive level action team and what that might look like. Next slide. So here is just a recap of the unanimously approved recommendations. And again, I'll just read them off quickly. Uh, one, again, is create a county entity and identify a known leader. Two is creation of a measure age global solutions fund. Three is to remove LASA. Four is to modify the continuum of care leadership and consolidate the governance boards into a single board. Five is to take steps to help improve LASA's operations. Six is to take the steps to ensure better data tracking, data sharing, data input, and metrics for success and equity. And seven, the support of an executive level action team. Next slide. So that is the, uh, those are the recommendations, and we're happy to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I, and I would like to start by conveying my thanks to all the individuals who locked arms with me to make this motion a reality. Um, in particular, thank you, Supervisor Solis, for partnering uh, on this motion. And a special thanks to Mary Wickham and the entire Birch staff and the eight commissioners who dedicated their time and service over the half, over this last six months to craft a Birch recommendation after extensive analysis and process. I'd like to thank Fizia Davenport, of course, Sharit Tataroff, and all of the LA County Department heads and staff that participated in the Birch robust planning process. You all were vital to really coming up with the recommendations that are before us today. Additionally, I want to acknowledge and thank our 88 cities for their participation and the wide array of service providers working to help people experiencing homeless in Los Angeles County each and every day. When I thought of creating the Birch, in July of last year, the commission's purpose was really partly to collaborate and engage as many stakeholders as possible to create a shared approach toward combating homelessness, because I do believe that collaboration is the key. The timing of the commission's report back is indeed really interesting in the sense that just a few weeks ago, our County Department of Public Health released their third annual report on the mortality rates of the homeless. Their report found that 1,988 people experiencing homelessness died in our county in a single year. That is a 56% increase in homeless deaths during 2021 in comparison to the prior year. That number, I think we would all agree, is appalling and unacceptable. It is urgent that we change what we're doing or not doing to help the most vulnerable individuals living on our street. To me, this is a call to action. Our county must address homelessness with sustained focus and commitment to fundamentally changing how our homeless support systems are managed. We've known for some time that we need to make big changes. Last July, I took a stand to reject the status quo and introduce the motion that established this Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness, which was co-authored again by Supervisor Solis. The Blue Ribbon Commission was charged with taking a hard look at the Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority and coming up with recommendations to reform the systemic dysfunction within Los Angeles homeless service system at large. And let me just say that it wasn't just about LASA, it was about all county departments. Every, everyone that comes in contact with homeless services, I believe we needed to take a hard look at. Initially, there may have been some skepticism about why we would want to create a commission to assess homelessness systems when they were already pre-existing reports on the topic. However, none have been quite as comprehensive and collaborative as the Blue Ribbon Commission's assessment. I'm proud of all the cities who participate in this process and truly appreciate their invaluable feedback. They are ready to partner up with the county and to get to work in their communities. Mary, you did an excellent job presenting the seven Birch recommendations with your team but allow me to recap and expand on what I am asking of this body today. There is no question in my mind that we need a new county entity specifically charged with tackling homelessness. However, I really want to be clear, this isn't about creating a new lumbering bureaucracy. It's about creating a nimble entity that will be directly accountable to this board. It's about creating a county department that will support flexible solutions that help people experiencing homelessness by meeting them where they are and helping them to heal. It, 
It would coordinate and unify the various efforts of county departments, such as the Department of Mental Health, Health Services, Public Health, and of course, Social Services. It would also be authorized and equipped to act as a centralized housing acquisition unit designed to get people experiencing homelessness a roof over their head, connected to support services, back into the workforce, and the goal off the streets for good. There is a second recommendation, creating a local solutions fund through Measure H, which we can utilize to partner with our cities that are ready to implement their own homeless housing and service plans. This is something that I'm sure some of my colleagues would agree is long overdue because we heard from our cities time and time again. They've been paying into Measure H since its passage, and it seems only right that they would establish a system, that, that we would establish a system that they could tap into and leverage this funding for homeless solutions that make sense for their communities. This is not a one-size-fits-all. Flexibility is going to be a critical component in establishing this local solutions fund since homelessness really cannot be solved by just one view based on what one entity believes is necessary as an approach. To be clear, I support having multiple models I support housing first, I support recovery, and there are many, many more. However, I believe we cannot narrowly prescribe these solutions to our cities. Every city should be afforded the necessary flexibility and choice to determine the best models for their vulnerable residents with the strategies and services that make sense to their homeless populations. The county will, of course, establish some guiding principles and parameters to our Measure H funded strategies, but these strategies should constantly be reevaluated and changed as needed. Our cities will play an active, collaborative part in determining these strategies, and I am looking forward to our continued partnership with our council of governments and our contract cities. Agenda item 26, which addresses the, um, this further by integrating our cities into a formal framework that outlines homeless strategies to be funded by Measure H. And then there's recommendation three, four, five, and six, which were derived from the commission's charge to analyze loss of structure and governance and LA County's continuum of care and provide detailed analysis with recommendations to reform and to enhance our system. The commission's conclusion shouldn't surprise anyone. LASA needs to be streamlined and clear role clarity needs to be established. Additionally, our continuum of care model should be strengthened by consolidating various governing bodies into a single unified board. As we've all heard, LASA's decision-making authority is very limited, and it is further burdened by little to no authority over funding, prevention, housing acquisition, and substance abuse and mental health treatment. This confusion on role clarity and acting authority was referred to as the LASA conundrum within the Birch Report. In order to address this, the Birch outlined some thoughtful considerations that would help alleviate its burden and allow it to do what it does best, function as Los Angeles County's continuum of care lead. By bringing LASA back into its pre-measure H role and transitioning direct service provision away from it, the agency can focus on ensuring that federal funding opportunities are aligned with state and local priorities. LASA could also lead uh, charge take lead in charge on seeking changes to federal requirements that would make it difficult to house individuals in Los Angeles County. And I know we've heard the hurdles that are in place. So we have an opportunity and LASA should take advantage of that and look at how we can work with our federal partners to break down those barriers. Specifically, LASA's role in the administration of our county's homeless management information system could be strengthened and better positioned as a data-driven approach, which serves as a pass-through, providing data access to governments, nonprofits, and other relevant partners, thus adding value to our overall system. Consolidating the various governing bodies and commissions down to a single decision-making entity is going to be an important and, quite frankly, and a difficult task. It will be something we need to work collaboratively with our city partners on accomplishing with great thought and care. Just as important will be the composition of the people appointed to this new board. And I would encourage my colleagues to take a very coordinated, fresh approach when making appointments to this body. On that note, I want to thank my appointee, 
um, uh, to LASA Commissioner Andy Bales for his dedication and service to the people experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles County. His leadership through the work at Union Rescue Mission is just an example of the kind of diverse stakeholders we need to engage and serve in the space. And then speaking of leadership, this brings me to my seventh and final recommendation put forth by Birch. Encouraging philanthropy to convene a small, action-oriented, executive level, quote, mastermind group comprised of leaders from the county, its city, the state, and other stakeholders. While many of these changes will need to make, uh, will need to make through adopting these recommendations are long-term, this small action could rally necessary stakeholders for more immediate change and solicit support from our state and our federal partners. And I want to thank Commissioner Sarah DeSalt, your appointee, Supervisor Solis, and Miguel Santana from the Committee of Greater Los Angeles for advocating for this centering forum. It will truly be exciting to see what kind of immediate actions can be taken towards uni uni uh, unifying Los Angeles in our efforts to end homelessness and help our brothers and sisters on the street. In close, yes, we do have a lot of work ahead of us, but thanks to the work completed by the Rubin Commission on homelessness, we now have a roadmap, and that path moves us forward. So I would humbly ask yes to enact the Blue Ribbon Commission's recommendations, which is taking that first step. And I'm hopeful that we're ready to start this journey because I truly do believe a lot of lives depend upon it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. We're gonna hear from um, Supervisor Kuehl followed by Supervisor Hahn. Of course, Supervisor Solis. Sorry, I was... Um, I got you, it's all right, I see you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and also I wanna thank Supervisor Barger and her staff, and I'd also like to thank my staff also for work that they conducted, and Mary Wickham, it's good to hear your voice. Uh, good to see you, Amy and Brandon, and also my commissioner, uh, Sarah DeSalt, as well as the many other stakeholders and individuals that participated in this uh, stakeholder event that took place in the past several months. I think it was really, really important for us to take a look back because it's been almost five years now since the passage of Measure H. And undoubtedly, we've learned a lot of lessons and we've learned about some of the gaps in our homeless service system. The Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness helped us to synthesize everything we've learned about serving unhoused Angelinos. And it provided the framework for building a transparent, inclusive, and accountable homeless governance system. And I wanna particularly thank all the partners, including cities, school districts, service providers, and community groups representing the first supervisorial district who made time to personally present to the Blue Ribbon Commission. And I wanna thank the staff of the Blue Ribbon Commission for going out time and time again to our communities and to our cities that we represent. Your input to all was invaluable and made the process as successful as it could possibly be. And I am excited about finally giving all our partner cities in the county at least a voice at the table to enhance collaboration and increase coordination among stakeholders countywide. One of the more critical lessons we've learned in the past few years is the importance of engaging our city partners. And before redistricting, I had about 24 cities that I represented. It's reduced a bit, but now I have a larger part of unincorporated, which quite frankly doesn't have a homeless infrastructure the way it's reflected in other parts of the County of Los Angeles, unfortunately. So with that, I, I think that we'll continue to work with the City of Los Angeles. This is not an exclusion in any, in any way because my footprint now is much larger in the City of LA. Not, I'm not as worried there, but I am worried about things that we need to do better. And I'm proud to say that the Blue Ribbon Commission and this, fine, this motion finally give our partner cities in the county the voice that they have been asking for for several years. The cities in my district are thrilled about the system changes that will be implemented through this motion. They feel that they will finally have that voice and the resources to support unhoused individuals living in their jurisdiction. And I don't make any pretensions here that somehow we're going to turn over 
an abundant fund of monies to our cities. That's not what this is about. It's being very strategic about it and working with those cities that want to work with us. And we'll continue to make those changes to improve our homeless service system. And we know how important it is to preserve the parts of the system that really are working. I don't want to avoid, uh, I, I, I want to avoid disruptions and I don't want to tangle up or duplicate. I don't think that's what this is about at all. And that's why the motion is methodical when it comes to implementation. And it's important for the Board of Supervisors to fully understand the implications of the Blue Ribbon Commission and the recommendations before implementing them. And I look forward to seeing how a new county entity that can provide leadership and coordination across our homeless service system, not to create another bureaucracy, but to make it more forceful and more strategic. This entity is much needed to ensure that we're directing our county resources in the most efficient and possible way. And I'm glad that we're considering the Blue Ribbon Commission motion alongside item 26 by Supervisor Hahn and Barger to implement the new strategies to govern the homeless service system. When the strategies revision motion was passed last year, I authored an amendment to that motion to include recommendations that would increase cities' participation in each strategy and strengthen opportunities for cities to augment Los Angeles County's investment in interim and permanent housing solutions within their own city boundaries for residents experiencing homelessness. The Homeless Initiative has included in this strategy revision examples of how we can co-invest with cities to strengthen our homeless service system. Many of these examples are initiatives that I have spearheaded, including the following, providing funding to support services at city-sanctioned interim housing sites, and some of those cities called in today. Quite frankly, I was very happy that after almost three years, five years of working on it, that they finally, some came to reason and said, I wanna, we wanna be a part of this. Supporting cities and tribal entities was another motion that we put forward applying to the state's project home key by committing county, county funding for services at those sites, which is very essential. Providing Measure H funds to cities and COGS for local homelessness projects. And you heard some of those individuals calling in and the hope and inspiration that has, that has also provided provided, but also responsibility and accounting for the COGS. Their actions also have to be viewed very carefully. This is a good roadmap, in my opinion, to continue to invest in our cities. And I'm glad that the Homeless Initiative, under Sherry Todorov's leadership, has recognized how important it is to work in partnership with the cities to end homelessness. I saw her at an event in my city in El Monte, where they had just purchased two home key motels to house over well over 100, close to 200 individuals, mostly women and families. And that for me was, was a, a change, a changing, just transformational moment. The homeless strategies recommendations also highlight, I believe, the important role our county departments play in tackling homelessness. And we've heard these stories over and over where DPSS touches homelessness, mental health department touches homelessness. For God's sake, even our public works touches homelessness. Uh, they highlight the need for county mainstream services to respond quickly and effectively to those falling into home homelessness and to be accountable for their role in addressing the county's homeless crisis. The motion to implement the Homeless Initiative Strategies Reassessment Recommendation, I believe aligns with the Blue Ribbon Commission motion in its goal to create opportunities that support local solutions to homelessness and to drive a stronger response to homelessness from our county departments. Despite our best efforts, we have continued to see an increase year over year in unhoused individuals across this county. I believe with these two motions, I'm confident that housed and unhoused residents across the county will begin to see the results that they truly deserve. So colleagues, I ask for your I vote on these two motions. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Thank you very much. I'm gonna to go to Supervisor Kuhl to speak and then you're gonna present on 26. And so Kuhl actually came up before you. So I'm gonna to go to Kuhl, then I'll come back to you. Fair enough? Supervisor Kuhl. Three before four, hey? <laughs> um, we're good at going in numerical order. 
Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to my colleagues. I, I think, um, you know, I did not vote to uh, even establish this Blue Ribbon Commission, and I continue to feel that the recommendations are not going to help in any way. And I apologize, or not, that I can't support this today. Apologize to my colleague, Christian Horvath, who I work with on the uh, Clean Power Alliance, who's great. But let me just say uh, why. There's no question that we all agree and we've all been working hard to do everything we possibly can to rehouse more people faster. Rehouse. I believe that this uh, motion is motivated by a sincere frustration with the progress we have not made on the homeless crisis, despite the fact in the past five years We've put over 100,000 people in permanent housing. That is not a failure. It's just not enough. And we put 80,000 people in interim housing. And our prevention models have prevented at least 20,000 people from falling out of their housing and into homelessness. Uh, of course, it's flawed. But I want to acknowledge that the system we have stood up has rehoused enormous numbers of people. It is making a dent in the crisis. The current system is exponentially more capable of rehousing people and preventing homelessness than it was five years ago. I mean, I've been here seven years. I can tell you what it looked like five years ago. So I just don't want us to overlook our successes Everybody says, oh, we're not bashing Lhasa. We just think there need to be changes, et cetera. So I think it's important to start there. I'm very supportive of item 26, which provides, uh, in my opinion, a thoughtful and practical and very specific guidance about how to stop more people from falling into homelessness and rehouse more people faster. Uh, the motion has a lot of moving parts, but in my opinion, most of the directives are really miles away from being able to actually rehouse more people faster or prevent homelessness. It's more like what my grandmother used to call re resetting the deck chairs on the Titanic and thinking that that might keep it from sinking. Um, because a lot of what we're doing is actually engaging in reshuffling. It engages the county and LASA and other entities in a good deal of chair swapping. Put this here, put this there, uh, expand this board, collapse that board. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of attention as well to engaging our cities, uh, which I know has always seemed like a good idea, probably more to some of my colleagues than to me, because I have at least one city in my area that thinks the solution to homelessness is moving their homeless people into another city. And so the money that they want to apply for is trans transportation money. But they also want the other city to pay for it. Now you'll say, well, that's not my city. But you know, one of the things that I think we've been somewhat critical of LA about is that every one of their council districts has the ability to say, don't build it here, don't build it there. I don't want this in my council district. And to me, it looks like 88 council districts, in a way, in our county, each of whom might have a different strategy. I understand we think that they know their cities better than we know them. And in some cases, they do. But city councils, they're even worse at figuring this out than we are. I mean, honestly, they are not experts on homelessness in any way. They need to look to their providers. They need to look to their experts. And so I look at the presentation, and Mary, I want to say I'm very grateful for your work. This is not about the work that you and the group have done, or any of the people. I want to thank Wendy Gruel, who has worked on homelessness on one appointment or another for me, and on her own for so many years, and did participate in this, in the unanimous decisions. But Cities, uh, one of the things in the presentation, it said the local solution, which is the money that we would allocate to the cities, should not take money away from work done by stakeholders. And we already have indicated over the past years, there's not even enough money for the stakeholders to do their job. 
not enough money to house enough people, and certainly not enough connection to making certain that there's more and more housing and places to house people. So I don't know how a local solution could fail to take money away from the work that's being done by stakeholders. Let me say very specifically, and I'm sorry this is so long, but I, I'm probably standing alone on this, so I just want to articulate the no position, <laughs> in case anybody wants to say it on the other hand. Um, the recommendation to establish a county entity and identify a leader, um, and was indicated this is not a department. Uh, it's an entity, which I don't know whether that has a description. However, maybe it is a department because I believe Catherine said uh, that it's a part, well, we should use the word department and it needs to be a department. So the question that I would put out, and not to you, but simply to raise into the uh, elements, was how do we believe that a new department would have any leverage over the budgets of other county departments? Say, I'm a department, like a super department. Sounds to me like the old agency solution, which we tried and like did away with instantly because it, you know, it didn't work. So it, it's not that anything can't be worked out. It's just that one department is not going to be able to say to the other, and you spend your money this way. Uh, secondly, I talked about the solution fund for the cities. Um, uh, thirdly, transitioning uh, some Measure H funding back to the county, moving outreach away from losses, um, HET teams, I think it's pretty, pretty tough. Uh, these uh, LASA staff are unionized, and we are pretty, I think, responsible to organize labor about it. Um, the, um, I don't know whether the outreach that they're doing in the unincorporated areas could actually be replicated uh, by others. I, I just uh, think that I, I had a I was at an event over the weekend for PATH, and they were really freaked out, really freaked out about what was going to happen if they didn't have this kind of help in outreach. Uh, fourthly, uh, the uh, improvement of data sharing, always very important. I, I think creating metrics is very good, but if you look at the directives in item 26, most of them are already in there about creating metrics and data sharing. Um, the executive level action team, recommendation seven, um, I think the recommendation largely came from LASA's governance report and the Weingart report, which, su which suggested that leaders need to meet to set system goals and outcomes. Um, and I think that um, President Mitchell and I introduced a motion last year to do that, but it didn't pass. So I think we're gonna to have to look very carefully if that's really what we want to do, but uh, it could be, I think, difficult. It's just saying we need another kind of structure and another kind of structure, but it doesn't feel to me like it builds or fills housing. Um, yesterday, I believe the New York model was elevated as an example, but the New York model currently costs taxpayers about $3 billion a year, and their count has not gone down on homelessness. Um, so it's not that it's a bad idea, it's that this is not necessarily a model that has worked. So I do understand the impetus. I don't want to say that anyone is wrong or doing this for all the wrong reasons. I just feel that when you're confronted with a hemorrhaging wound, you don't say, let's reconstitute our hospital board of directors and then restructure the way we send the ambulance out and then deploy our paramedics differently. And if you bleed out while we're trying some of this stuff, really sorry. This is not to say we don't care on this board. I know we do. I just don't think this is the right answer. It's it does look to me like deck chairs on the Titanic. I want to see more affordable housing. Uh, you know, putting direct the, the uh, department directors on a board instead of um, appointees. Frankly, every appointee that I put on every commission knows more than I do about that issue. 
And I have found, now at Metro, we're all on the Metro board. Metro's got billions of dollars to spend. And we are the people directing billions of dollars to be spent. That would not be the case with this group. So I don't know how directors would necessarily, you know, spend their time. Um, and if they would, and if it would actually be a gain for us. So I feel like I kind of want to apologize because I like the way this board works together. And I want you all to understand, I have no question about your motivations. Just think, looking at this item by item, honestly, I don't think it really helps. So thank you, Madam Chair. Roger Hahn. Well. <laughs> Although, you know, I, I do appreciate, because I do think some, I think they're not writing the stories anymore about five women on the board, and isn't it great, and don't you all get along? I think we've, we've read the last story about that, but, uh, it, you know, we're not the same, and, and we, we look at things differently, and we have a different perspective. But I will say, uh, Supervisor Kuehl, we, we agree on uh, it's, not, it's not going in the right direction. You referred to it as the Titanic. So that's a sinking ship. And you refer to it as like a gaping wound that's bleeding. So at least we agree that, uh, you know, I think we have a problem. And I'll say, um, you know, it was almost a year ago that I think we talked about the creation of this Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness. And I was a little bit there, too. I was thinking, are we just uh, rearranging uh, the chairs on the deck of the Titanic? I was a little bit on the fence. But then it just struck me that... Um, you know, it, what we were doing to me didn't seem to be working, and I was hearing uh, from so many of my constituents that also didn't believe like what we were doing was working. It seemed like we were spending more money, and our numbers were going up every time we had a homeless count. So I ended up voting for this. Um, I think I was the third vote that uh, got this t uh, uh, to pass um, because I thought. I just didn't feel good not doing anything. For me, the status quo is not acceptable. And uh, is this going to work? I don't know if we ever know if things are going to work. But I personally believed in this commission and believed in trying something again. Um, again, I appreciate the work that the Blue Ribbon Commission did. Uh, thank you, Mary Wickham. It's really uh, nice that you came back briefly. Uh, to to facilitate this commission. Uh, thanks to Christian and to Sarah uh, for your leadership. I um, uh, appreciate this. I think, I mean, I'm going to support these recommendations today. And I know there's still a lot of work that we have to do to get us to the place uh, where we really do begin uh, eradicating homelessness on the streets of L.A. County. Uh, but I think these reforms will add some accountability and some coordination. And I always believe uh, reform and accountability are two key components for any progress uh, that we attempt to make. You know, when Heidi Marston announced her resignation from LASA last week, she talked about how LASA never has had the authority to solve the biggest challenges in the homeless crisis. And that's why I'm hopeful about one of the major recommendations uh, that we're gonna be voting on today, and that's to create a new county entity that is empowered to take on the crisis, has the resources to do so, and is ultimately accountable for the outcomes. I think that's something we've needed for a long time. I think it's gonna get us in a better position to implement this Marshall Plan uh, that I know I've been talking about, and a lot of people have been talking about, uh, that actually will uh, start looking at this uh, like a, a, a major disaster that it is. Um, we're also considering item 26 uh, right now, and I think There'll be a presentation uh, on this. Uh, that was a motion by Supervisor Barger uh, and me to rework our Measure H strategy. We're about halfway through Measure H's lifespan. So last year, um, I authored this motion to reassess the 47 strategies, which were developed before um, I got on this board. Uh, and again, it seemed like it was a good idea then. Um, and I wanted to see, is it still a good idea? Is 47 still the right number? Are, are we... Are the strategies even named properly uh, this many years later? So the Homeless Initiative, led by Sherry Todorov, prepared a report back to us based on that motion that pointed out some of the problems we're facing and recommended a completely different framework. 
One thing the report said was that while Measure H is getting people into housing, it's been most helpful for people who have just fallen into homelessness, part of the rapid rehousing uh, that I think you were speaking about, Supervisor Kuehl. But it pointed out that we're still not doing a good job helping the people who are chronically homeless. Those who have been living in our encampments for years, those are the ones that I believe um, the public sees day in and day out and doesn't understand why we haven't been able to help them. And the data shows that we need to adjust our strategy there. We need to focus our Measure H resources on those hardest to reach individuals, individuals, the chronically homeless. That means we need other departments in the county to do more to strengthen our safety net and help people who are on the brink of homelessness with other departments doing more to prevent people from falling into homelessness. And as we said, so many of our departments touch people who are on the brink. Um, if they can do more of that work, then we can preserve our interim housing beds and permanent supportive housing units for those individuals who live in encampments and desperately need our help. Secondly, uh, they found out that having Measure H organized into 47 strategies has been a bit of a headache uh, for our service providers. I've heard from nonprofits that have spent endless hours on separate contracts, separate reports, separate invoices for each different strategy. It's a waste of their time. By consolidating these strategies, we can cut that red tape and allow our nonprofits to focus on the work that they do well on the ground. And thirdly, the report said that we need to increase our partnership with our cities. Over the past few years, I've seen cities in my district, from Torrance to Bellflower, step up and say yes to shelters and permanent housing. I know there's a lot that don't, but I, I've, I've found a lot of our cities and our city councils uh, who do understand this, this issue and are ready to help. It's no longer just a city of LA issue. I think we all started uh, at the beginning of Measure H thinking it was Skid Row. But I think what we found is in every single one of our 88 cities in the county of Los Angeles, everyone is seeing encampments. Everyone is frustrated by those who are finding themselves sleeping on the streets at night. Uh, Measure H really wasn't set up with the partnerships with the cities in mind. And we still don't have a reliable stream of Measure H funding for these cities, but we did allocate one-time funding for the Council of Governments to draw down from, and I think that's helped our cities with some of their interim housing projects. Mm -hmm. I think we need to allocate more funding, and it needs to be built into Measure H's annual allocations. The motion in front of us, colleagues, for 26, begins to implement this new framework, consolidating the strategies, focusing on housing chronically unhoused individuals, and co-investing with city partners. There's still some unanswered questions as we begin this work, but I just feel like we have to try something else. Um, and I think that the collaborative process, the homeless initiative will lead with county departments, will be important to our success. I just wanted to end, uh, Madam Chair, I know there's, uh, there's a presentation. I just wanted to um, focus on uh, contract cities uh, and many of the calls that came in uh, asking for three amendments that they wanted us to include in this. And I don't know if Mary or Christian or Sarah could answer that. Uh, it was my understanding that two of what they're asking for is already in uh, this motion. Uh, they asked for increasing city leadership representation across all committees mentioned in the Birch recommendation. That number two, ensuring disadvantaged communities will be able to participate and benefit from the local solutions fund. And I know they wanted Measure H funding to be allocated to um, the host team. On the first one, it looks to me like uh, recommendation one and directive three include the um, city leadership. Is, do you all read it the way I'm reading it? Yes, Supervisor, yes, correct. The cities will be represented throughout the model that's been presented. There's, there's uh, opportunities uh, for the cities and the COGS to participate 
in this model everywhere. So that's number one. Uh, I think another question was. Uh, uh, I think it was many. A lot of them didn't were concerned that they couldn't afford the financial match uh, contribution. Uh, but I think this local solutions uh, recommendation allows for in kind to be matched. That's exactly right. Right. And you don't need money in order to participate. You can bring something else to the table other than money. Do you have any examples of what some of the in kind um, services would, would be acceptable moving forward? Uh, real estate, you know, they may have a facility. Uh, they may have the commitment, just to the commitment to want to house their homeless. Uh, well, I know. like that. And in kind, mm -hmm. just the commit, just the heart. Is there in kind? Yes. Uh, okay, yes. I like that. Um, okay, I just wanted to highlight because I know many people called in this morning asking uh, for that, but it does look like two of their three uh, so called amendments uh, are embedded in what we're voting on today. Um, I think, in terms of allowing funds to be used for host team, don't think at, at this point. Uh, uh, there's support on this board to do that, but I, I think we are still going to look at uh, solutions uh, as it relates to that kind of outreach going forward. So, colleagues, I'm going to end by saying we've been doing this work for a long time. So is everybody else in the county. There are so many people that have had that heart, that have had that commitment, that have really been working uh, to end homelessness. I've been frustrated by how persistent the problem of homelessness and the human suffering that goes along with it has been. But I'm just not comfortable with settling for the status quo. I think we need to keep adjusting our strategies until we find the most effective way to get people the help they need and ultimately uh, off of sleeping on our streets at night. I'm not going to kid myself into believing that we've done enough today uh, to solve the homelessness crisis. But these reforms, in my opinion, represent progress, and I'm hopeful they will help. Thank you, Madam Chair very much. Um, let me just add my two cents, too. <laughs> I, I, too, want to extend my appreciation. You know, having served before I ran for office on any number of boards and commissions where, you know, we were asked to bring our policy area or direct service area of expertise to the table as a volunteer is actually what encouraged me to run for office. I'm like, you know, let me run for office so I can be in the decision-making position as opposed to having my expertise sucked out of my body and then maybe never seen it come to fruition. So let me thank the people who volunteered, the Cheryl Porter, uh, the second district appointee who works for St. Joseph Center for your time and commitment and what you poured into this process. I appreciate you. Um, like Supervisor Kuehl, I have, I have more questions than I have answers, and frankly, I think that's the case for all of us. You know, when I think about the Measure H process, I was not here, but as I recall, that was a two-year experience with hundreds of people who provided their expertise and perspective, which I think is helpful. Um, I, during that time, was the author of the Housing First bill that became law in the state legislature. I, at that time, was the author of the bill that created the state's interagency council on homelessness. Um, I believe in partnership. I believe in streamlining processes that are too bureaucratic and, and no longer work and are no longer relevant, which is why I introduced the motion seven months ago to streamline LASA. Um, is LASA perfect? No. Have they done work in supporting community-based agencies who do the work every day to get people housed? Yes. Um, and so I agreed that it needed some help and direction and refinement, but I won't call it broken. My concern today, and you all know I spend a lot of time talking about budgets, is what I don't see in any of these recommendations is a sense to me as a given my fiduciary, our collective fiduciary responsibility as board members, about the costs and funding sources of implementing the Birch recommendations and continuation, quite frankly, of Birch staff in our fiscal year 22-23 budget. We're in the middle of a budget process. This six-month activity has already cost all of us as county taxpayers a million dollars. And 
Like Supervisor Kuehl, I didn't support the motion, but I remained hopeful. And must say that I'm disappointed because I didn't, there is no um, golden ticket in these recommendations. When we discussed that failed motion, I heard lots of comments about how this issue has been studied and we needed to take action, and so that motion was voted down, and yet I see seven recommendations, many of which include report backs still. So when I walk outside of this hall of administration today or drive home and count as I have taken to do the number of RVs and tents I see, I can't say that my vote on this action today will have in, in an immediate fashion a direct impact on those women, families, seniors, veterans, black and brown people who are unhoused in our county. Um, there are far too many questions and concerns from people who have studied this way beyond six months, who do this work every day, our homeless spa leave, for me to be comfortable voting for this package as a whole. I appreciate the Birch voted for all seven recommendations, but they also had the opportunity to make adjustments to those recommendations as they voted for them based on our infrastructure, based on the fact that our um, motion authors weren't willing to bifurcate. We aren't, I'm not empowered to do that today. And that's unfortunate from my perspective because there are some elements that I would support. I would support the streamlining of LASA. Again, that was in the motion seven months ago. I would support LASA operations without question. I would support data and metrics. But there are other key elements that I have no idea in terms of um, budget, how we pay for it, how this will, how, how it will happen. That's problematic for me. Uh, what I believe we all need is, the ex, is to expedite the streamlining of services. And while we talk about our important partners and we use the term cities, we have to acknowledge the missing elephant in the Birch Room, and that was the city of LA. I appreciate that two council members came and presented to the second to the last meeting, but they presented as public members. They weren't involved in the development of recommendations. And so when we talk about streamlining and bringing these county departments together all under one, we all know I just got here, but I have heard repeatedly <laughs> It took some inordinate number of years for two department heads to come to some agreement on who was responsible for claiming the Medi-Cal funding to pay for ODR. So I'm not quite sure how under this process all these multiple department heads are going to come together and we're going to streamline funding silos. So much of this funding is federal and state and through regulation. And so it's challenging. It's, it's so much easier said than done how we streamline and bring all these departments together and just magically make it happen. And we know it is not that simple. I don't see in this process, realistically, anytime soon, how this one entity um, is gonna be successful in doing that. I understood the goal, the original goal of the motion was to focus on governance, but governance isn't the only issue. It's building. And when we talk about all these cities have now come to the table and their partners, all of the cities together are behind in building 340,000 housing units. I can't see, and I have read it repeatedly, <laughs> these seven actions, how that will make a difference for them. I appreciate they feel heard, they're at the table. I don't see the direct nexus between these actions and how those cities will move. It does not state how implementing these recommendations will get our unhoused neighbors into homes, how it will increase connection to mental health services, how we ensure equity and resources distributed to those, to those um, and solve for the fact that there are more unhoused black people and a growing undocumented and migrant unhoused population. I heard rumors, we talked about public comment and people have heard, I've heard rumors that there were entities that wanted to remove the equity lens with regard to this work. Please know that I will be tracking and watching that very closely because that is unacceptable. Based on the realities of who we know are unhoused, based on the realities of the data we just heard from Dr. Ferrer, 
Um, I'm not sure how Birch defined equity. We've had staff ask the question. We never got a clear answer. So I will ask that Birch get back to me to help me understand how you view and define equity as you proceed on this work. One of the major criticisms of LASA from the cities and the COGS and others is that we don't know how the money is allocated, who makes the decisions and where the money goes. Well, from my read, this motion is creating yet another system without us knowing how much money we're using, where it's going, nor the impact it will have. So we certainly don't want, want would not want to be in a position where we spent six months, a million dollars, and have built something that doesn't give us any more clarity, transparency than the existing infrastructure. I know that's not our collective or individual goal. I just think it's important that we fine tune and get clear to make sure that we're not simply creating one infrastructure that will be um, as hampered by bureaucracy as the one we're trying to improve and replace. While the motion brings forth consolidating committees and bodies for LASA to help with clarity of decision making, it simultaneously creates two county bodies that per the description overlap in responsibilities. I'm not clear on the contradictions I see in the motion. The Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness was very clear that their recommendations were not to slow down or take away from existing programs and funding dedicated to the unhoused. However, I fail to understand how we can accomplish building a new entity, transferring an entire workforce, workforce from Lhasa to the county, without indeed slowing down services and taking away from the existing strategies within Measure H. So again, um, I won't take up any more time. I do have questions of Birch staff. I have questions of Lhasa. I hope that, um, I know that um, the Homeless Initiative Sherry was here gonna make a presentation. Perhaps she will cover this um, when I'm done. Um, we wanna hear her presentation before we vote on item 26, colleagues. But again, um, too many questions. Uh, you all know that I've had to get used to the policy making process here where there aren't committees. We don't have an opportunity to flesh it out and include public comment. It moves a little fast for my taste in terms of the true integrity of the policy. And for me, this is an example. I appreciate this. the Birch Committee spent six months, but again, I've heard far too many questions and concerns from homeless agencies and advocates who are doing the work every day um, to feel comfortable voting on these issues in a block. And I certainly hope that the motion's authors or the CEO will include in the report back the costs and funding sources of implementing the Birch recommendations and continuation of Birch staff in our current fiscal year 22-23 budget final changes. Uh, we are in the middle of the budget process making tough decisions and we can't pass these seven recommendations, stand up these new entities and not be clear and clear with the public about what the price tag ultimately will be. Um, I don't know that we were clear that it was going to be a million dollars worth of work over six months when the motion passed um, that enabled their work. With that, I see first Ms. Barger. I see second Ms. Solis. No, I'll, I'll be very short. For, I, I want to thank uh, Theana Evangelist, who was my appointee. I didn't do that. But I also want, I didn't talk on 26, and I just have to say that I think that, you know, it, it, is paired well with item four as it relates to the feedback that we got about streamlining the process. And um, I just um, appreciate being a co-author on that motion. And then Supervisor Kuehl, I wanted to get a clarification. When you said New York City, that was Andy Bales that brought it up, but in fact, the comparison was Houston. Um, and, and in Houston, the chronic homelessness was reduced by 50%. Because when you said that, I thought, that's not what I remembered, and so I got a clarification, and in fact, uh, it was Apologies. Houston. Yeah, no, no big deal, but there is a difference, because I know that New York has a model that is often touted as well, so I just wanted to make that clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to um, bring up some, some items that I talked about earlier, and that was that 
you know, our cities, not all of them are, how could I say, as gun ho <laughs> in perhaps dealing with this issue, and some really may not have a good map or assistance, technical assistance. So my hope is that this process will allow for that, for those cities that haven't all fully appreciated the work that it takes. And part of it is also making sure that our that our providers that I know at least in the San Gabriel Valley that have been at this for decades, decades, um, we're not getting paid appropriately through their own contracting. They almost went under. And part of it was because the inattention, I don't know what exactly, but I can tell you that some of our key services out in Pomona, the San Gabriel Valley almost went under. I can't tell you how many calls I got my staff did late nights and on holidays when people were almost, staff almost had to be let go. And here we were standing up shelters, winter shelters and all that. And these are the people that I truly believe are our angels. And they are part, they're not part of uh, LASA, so to speak, but they get contracts through us and through Measure H. And they are doing outstanding work. We need to fix the contracting system. If anything, I agree that that has to happen. And I also believe that there should be sufficient funding available to those cities that can prove that they really want to meet us in the right place. And I mentioned El Monte, and I want to say El Monte actually did room key before anybody in the, dis in, the, in the whole county did. They were the first city to say, we're going to do it. And other cities were like, oh, I don't know about this. But they took the, they took the deep dive. And now they're, they're opening up more uh, housing units through room key and home key. And they're putting in their own money. And they want to know how they can partner with us. So I don't know that they're going to always ask us for everything, but they do expect some help from us. And I think part of it is our duty to provide them with uh, you know, partnering with Union Station, which does the wraparound services for the city of El Monte. That's something that we fund anyway. So it's not going to disrupt that. In fact, I want it to grow, because we don't have, in some of my cities in San Gabriel Valley and unincorporated areas, a, a structure that's there that you can point to. I can't even get in unincorporated areas a winter shelter set up yet. But I know it's going to take me, and it's going to take a lot of other people out there saying, we're going to do it. And now there's a will to do it. And partnerships mean a lot. And people do look to the county for that. So I just want to say that that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for our county departments to play a bigger role. They spend millions of dollars right now, and I get it. They may have formula that says, says they got to do something this way, but there's flexibility there too, and they could be more strategic. And, and I can see that happening in DPSS for sure, and even DCFS, because we asked for assistance there to provide housing for transitional age youth. We should be working with, with Measure H and everybody to see that we're all working on the same path. I don't think that's happened. And the department has said, Oh, well, it's, you know, we didn't have time. That is really upsetting to me. So I think there's a lot of things that all of us can, can point to for improvement. And I hope that when we do get our report back, that we'll be able to have those questions answered. And, and something I wanted to ask Mary Wickham, if I might. Mary, uh, I know you're still on there. I wanted you to, to please clarify what a county entity or a department uh, is in, in terms of this report. And what does that really mean? And how can the board be, ins be ensured that we're going to see success out of that model? Sure. Great question. Supervisor and other supervisors raised it. I mean, what the report identifies is the form of the entity. It could take different forms. It could be a county department. It could be something other than a county department. It could, for example, uh, the county could enter into a relationship with LACDA and create an entity like LACDA which is not um, you know, uh, a civil servant type uh, entity. Or another model that, uh, is, that we looked at was the Office of Emergency Management. You know, uh, one of the great quotes that kind of came out of this exercise is that we have a crisis, but we're not operating in crisis mode. So OEM, Office of you know, Emergency Management, operates in a crisis mode. They come together in a crisis and then have the authority to tell other county departments what needs to be done to address the crisis. So the next phase of this effort would be to report back to the board and the CEO to report back to the board um, on 
what form uh, this entity should take. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Following up on your question, um, Supervisor Sleese, Ms. Wickham, as you talk about the entity versus the department, did you or your staff at any time think through or prepare to share with us or the CEO um, ideas around costs of setting up a department or an entity? Was that a part of your charge or was any time spent thinking through costs, particularly in that we're in the middle of budget season and I'm assuming, because we all want this to happen sooner rather than later, that it will have, it'll have impact on our 22-23 fiscal year budget? A great question, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, that was beyond the scope of you know this this directive. The board's July 27th motion was to report back on governance, but um, of course we're mindful of cost. And I mean, I mean the, what the report touches on is that you know the vision is that it, what 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 the entity created is not a lumbering bureaucracy. It's something nimble and you know. Uh, staffed uh, well, uh, resourced well, but nimble, flexible, something that could, get, that could get stood up in a short amount of time and start addressing the tremendous amount of work that is, uh, you know, that, that's before us. I'll also add, if, yes. I, if I may, you know, the report does define or gives parameters around what it could look like. So as Mary mentioned, department, joint powers authority, or something like OEM. The importance of just identifying those, those options, we're mindful there's a difference between a department and OEM from a cost perspective. So the fact that the report even recommends, or not recommends, but suggests that let's say an OEM type entity might be something or a joint powers authority is motivated by the fact that there are gonna be differences between the two. We could have said, for example, or the commission could have said, for example, just a department. Uh, but it didn't do that. And the reason it didn't do that is, uh, Supervisor Mitchell, your precise concern, which is there are going to be cost implications that are going to need to be studied. But it was the charge of the commission under the board motion to identify models for governance that could be there. The ultimate uh, discretion, obviously, to the board. Thank you for that. So then, Ms. Davenport, then I'll, I'll pivot to you. Since that was the charge of the commission, and we're now poised to take uh, a vote on implementing seven um, recommendations from Birch, at, at what point will you then provide us, I'm guessing, us, or through the budget process, ideas about funding sources and costs for these seven specific recommendations? Thank you, Supervisor Mitchell and Board of Supervisors. <clears throat> um, so, uh, let me answer the question this way. Uh, the CEO's office is in the process of standing up four departments in fiscal year 22-23. And I think everyone on the board has come along on that journey with us. We have worked on the splitting of WEDOX for over uh, almost two years now. And even though we are able to split the department five months earlier than we told the board, there is a tremendous amount of planning and preparation that goes into standing up a new department. Uh, the same is true for uh, the work that we are doing right now on the Department of Youth Development, as well as the JCOT, the Justice Care and Opportunities Department. I do not anticipate, we have two more budget phases left in fiscal year 22-23. That's final changes budget in May and supplemental changes budget in October. I do not anticipate that uh, we will have completed the necessary work analysis uh, and budgetary forecast to be able to bring a proposal to this board in this current budget year. What I can commit to, however, is that we will do the work, begin the work necessary to the planning and the preparation so I think at the end of the day, if you look at the other four departments that we are currently standing up, if you've looked at that trajectory, it has taken at least a year uh, for us to get the planning and the analysis uh, and you know the necessary ordinance items, et cetera. Well, not, I'm sorry, not ordinance items, but at least the plan before we were able to come to the board to submit a recommendation. 
So there's a there's going to be a, a fair amount of work uh, to get that planning down. And that's going to also involve us working with your offices on the appropriate model, whether the board wants to move in a JPA model, whether the board wants the, the homeless initiative to be the new entity, or whether the board wants to move to something like an agency model. That will also have to be decided by the board, and then we will in earnest be able to start doing the appropriate uh, planning and preparation. <clears throat> and finally, I will also, so there are some legal components to this, and we will of course work with all the necessary departments, including county council, auditor controller, ISD, et cetera. Thank you very much. I appreciate that clarity. Supervisor Barger. Madam Chair, I just wanted to say that on item 26, and I think Supervisor Hans okay with not having the presentation, because I think we've talked about it, unless you all need it, because I think that our motion speaks for itself. I, the presentation, I would agree. You mean the presentation from Ms. Todorov? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, Ms. Todorov, are there any, like, one or two bullets you just want to share before we shut it down? I appreciate you coming and spending your time and giving us the PowerPoint. Any quick anything? I actually I want to thank the supervisors. I think you've had a very good discussion today. And during your discussion, you've actually covered all of the highlights of the strategy reassessment and the proposed framework. Um, so just appreciate listening to your conversation and also just want to thank everybody who participated in the process. It was um, a very collaborative process. We had very uh, a high number of community input sessions. We had hundreds of participants. Um, we had our homeless services providers, people with lived expertise. We had our county departments, we had our agencies like Lawson, LA CDA, we had um, our cities and COGS. It was just really wide participation um, and came back with a really good set of recommendations that will move our homeless system forward. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. That was comments for item 26. So seeing no other hands raised, my paper covers you all, but seeing no other hands raised, I think everyone has spoken. Um, item four is before us. We will take two separate votes. Um, item four, moved by Supervisor Barger and seconded by Supervisor Solis to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item four is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. No. Supervisor Kuehl, no. Supervisor Hahn. Yes. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Yes. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell, no. Supervisor Mitchell, no. Motion carries three to two. Item 26 is before us for approval. Approved by, ha moved by Han, seconded by Barger. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 26 is before you. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Han, aye. Supervisor Han, aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item 11, proclaiming May 2022 as Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month uh, and renewed commitment to stop anti-API hate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you, Supervisor Barger, for joining me on this motion. Happy AAPI Heritage Month. Chinese nationals were the first Asian immigrants to arrive on American soil in significant numbers in the middle of the 19th century. Since then, from helping to build the transcontinental railroad to protecting the nation during times of war, AAPIs have played, as you know, a critical role in shaping our history. Their contributions have been found in every aspect of society. AAPIs are leaders in industry, politics, entertainment, culture, civic activism, education, and much more. Los Angeles County is proud to be home to more than 1.5 million AAPI residents and more than 500,000 live in my district. And colleagues, AAPIs represent at least 10% of the population in each of our districts, according to the most recent census data. And yet, as we know, the rise in anti-AAPI hate has really shaken our communities. In the San Gabriel Valley, a recent survey indicated that more than a third of the residents had witnessed or experienced an act of hate or harassment in recent years due to COVID-19 scapegoating. Nearly 11,000 AAPIs across the country reported hate incidents to the national tracker launched by Stop AAPI Hate between March 2020 and December 2021. 
including more than 4,100 reports in California and more than 1,000 reports in Los Angeles. The county's LA versus hate initiative received 1,600 reports of hate through our 211 LA hotline that was established. Nationwide, 63% of hate incidents reported described verbal harassment, and three quarters, 75% of hate incidents occurred in places open in the public, on public streets, on public transit, and businesses open to the public. And furthermore, 23% of non-binary AAPI people and 19% of AAPI women that reported hate incidents identified gender as one of the reasons they experienced the reported discrimination. Many hate incidents involved street harassment, which included unwanted words, gestures, or actions that, forced on, that are forced on a stranger in a public place because of their real or perceived identity can include ra radicalized or sexualized slurs. Existing California laws members are ill-equipped to prevent and address street harassment because most laws are under the penal code, despite street harassment requiring a public health and civil rights response. All people deserve to feel safe and move about freely without becoming targets of hate and harassment. And street harassment is not just an AAPI issue, as we know. All women, particularly black and indigenous women and women of color and LGBTQ plus people, people with disabilities, unhoused people, the young, the elderly, the people of color experience street harassment, which carries the threat of and occasionally escalates in violence. We have to do more to address the issue, which is why this motion would support several bills to address street harassment in public transit, businesses, on streets, from public health and civil rights. Just because anti-AAPI hate incidents no longer make national headlines doesn't mean that they have stopped. So on AAPI Heritage Month, I hope we'll continue to shine a light on this issue and make real investments to address it, to address this issue in the long term. So I respectfully ask for your I vote. I believe Supervisor Barger, you wanted to First of all, thank you, Supervisor Solis, for asking me to co-author this motion with you. As we celebrate this month of May as Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we must recognize our AAPI residents and the immensely valuable contributions they make to our society in art, education, technology, government, and so much more. This celebration must also be met with reflection on how far we have come, but also how far we still have to go. The hate crimes and discrimination against Asian American communities have skyrocketed since the start of this pandemic. The majority of these reported hate crimes occur in public places, and I've seen videos where people are watching helplessly. It is critical that we stand up for our AAPI communities. Though showing our support for this, new, this No Place for Hate California legislative package truly is a step in the right direction in preventing street harassment and doing what we can as a board to make our Asian American communities feel safe and protected in Los Angeles County. So again, thank you for asking me to co-author this with you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Supervisor Solis and Supervisor Barger uh, for authoring this motion so that we can indeed proclaim May 20. 22 as Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month and support uh, the Stop the AAPI Hate Legislative Package. This, mar this month marks a time to speak out, to share stories, and uplift our Asian communities in LA County, the state, and across our nation. It's significant to note that Asian culture and history is filled with incredible stories of resilience, persistence, and determination to fight for basic rights. Last year, we supported the Federal Hate Crimes Act that was prompted by the recent outbreak of attacks and harassment against Americans of Asian and Pacific Islander heritage during the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, at our last board meeting, I authored a five-signature motion to support Senate Bill 1161, which will develop an anti-harassment transit plan 
to ensure that our transit agencies in the state develop and implement plans to address harassment of riders in a meaningful and lasting manner. I'm pleased to see that this bill and others will receive much deserved support as part of the Stop AAPI Hate Legislative Package. Still so much work to do. Uh, if you see something, say something. We all need to rise up and uh, right the wrongs that we see in our communities that, that have uh, where we see discrimination and harassment. However, we are taking steps in the right direction. Thank you to both of you for your leadership on this important issue. Thank you. I agree. When you see something, say something. And this board took action and actually put money behind data collection around um, API hate, because collecting data really helps, you know, validate um, that uh, law enforcement and bystanders needs to step up and take action. So thank you both very much. Are there any other supervisors who would like to make comments? Seeing none, hearing no other comments. Item 16 is before us. Happy to uh, ask that Supervisor Barger move. Supervisor Solis second. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 11 is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. That was item 11, not item 16. Once again, I got ahead of myself. Moving on now to item 16, proclaiming May 5th through the 30th as LA County Fair Days. We're gonna see a little video here in a minute. Um, after we all know, after a two year hiatus where we couldn't get turkey legs or corn on the cob or ride wonderful fair rides or, or smell the pigs. <laughs> about chocolate, chocolate bacon donuts. That part, that thank you. Um, as a result of COVID, we could not engage in all those fun gastro activities. But they're back. It's opening this week on Cinco de Mayo, as a matter of fact. Uh, so I'd like to encourage the public and members of our own county family to make the trip to the Fairplex for LA County Fair Day, which is on Saturday, May 7th. You can visit with staff from our county departments, pick up valuable information, and even get a COVID-19 vaccine or a booster from our very own Department of Public Health. Um, we're going to play the video, and when we come back, Supervisor Solis is going to talk about all the wonderful things Fairplex did for us while they weren't doing the fair. Um, but let's roll that county footage. Board of Supervisors, welcome to Fairplex, home of your Los Angeles County Fair. I'm joined this morning with our chair, Heidi Hansen, Summer, and myself, Walter Marcus, President and CEO. I want to thank you, Chair Mitchell, Supervisor Solis, Supervisor Cool, Supervisor Hahn, and Supervisor Barger for all your support. We're looking forward to kicking off our centennial celebration next week at the LA County Fair. Uh, we welcome you all to come out and join us from May 5th through May 30th. And thank you again to the Board of Supervisors for this proclamation. Supervisor Solis. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, one of the many things that I missed during the pandemic obviously was going to the county fair because they have, they don't just have a lot of good food, but they have a lot of good entertainment as well as a bunch of goodies that people can go through these different uh, halls and pick up things that you wouldn't find anywhere else. The fair is really special to me because it's home at the LA County Fairplex, which is in the first district, which I represent. And starting from this year, it will be held in May, which is very different. So they figured out that it's better to have it early than in, se in August and September when it was really hot. People couldn't stand the heat. So they got it, which is wonderful. So we're actually going before, I think, the Orange County Fair, which is good. So listen up, Orange County. <laughs> this year marks the 100th anniversary. So I hope all of our residents will join us, especially on the opening weekend, May the 7th, when all of our LA County residents get in at half price. So get your tickets, folks. I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank the Pomona Fairplex for their partnership and collaboration with my office, and also with the County of Los Angeles throughout the pandemic. Just remember back in uh, 2020, COVID 
partnered with the hotel at Fairplex to serve as a quarantine site, and they helped to isolate about 2,547 people who had been exposed to COVID but had nowhere to go, no safeguards. And let me tell you, we had people from all around the county that were placed there. How wonderful for us to be able to help out the Fairplex and the hotel. And for the past two years since the onset of the pandemic, the Fairplex has been a testing site for us and in fact have been one of the county's largest testing sites conducting over, get this, 445,000 tests at Fairplex. Can you imagine? So it wasn't just Pomona, it was a lot larger than that. And I want to remind everyone that while the county fair is running, the testing site will be temporarily relocated to Palomares Park in Pomona, just three miles away from the fairgrounds. However, there will be a testing kiosk available at the fair for attendees there. And when the vaccines became available, the Pomona Fairplex set up operations to administer over 218,000 shots. That's amazing. Last year, the Pomona Fairplex took on another mission when I made a request following a conversation with President Biden. It served as an emergency intake site for unaccompanied minors who were mostly coming from Central and South America seeking refuge last year during the surge at our border. The children were housed on a part of the fairgrounds on the 60-acre campus with lush soccer fields and ample space and had a capacity of 2,500 children at any given time. The safe but efficient speed of reunifications was remarkable. It took almost 14 days to reunify these children with caretakers, guardians, and family. It's remarkable because in the end, close to 8,000 children were reunified with family members or sponsors right here in the United States. We vaccinated almost 6,100 of those children and the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra, toured the site with me and coined it, quote, quote, unquote, model site. I'm very proud of what the County of Los Angeles and the Pomona Fairplex have accomplished together. And now the Pomona Fairplex is reopened to all of us again as our fair. So let's get out, let's celebrate, let's make it happen. Spend your dollars there at the Fairplex. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Again, just to remind folks that the fair officially opens on May 5th. It will run to May 30th. LA County Day is Saturday, May 7th. Supervisor Solis said uh, county residents get half off, right? And so for ticketing information, it's at lacountyfair.com or our own county website, lacounty.gov. With that, hearing no comments, item 16 is before us. Supervisor Solis will move. I'll second approval of this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 16 is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Item 17, Senate Bill 1245 by Senator Kamlager, LA County Abortion Access Safe Haven Pilot Program. Little did we know when we put this item on the agenda, the news that we would receive yesterday, or maybe we did tragically. Uh, I wanna thank a number of the community-based health advocacy organizations that uh, assisted my co-author supervisor, Sheila Kuhl and I, I wanna thank Planned Parenthood Los Angeles, and Black Women for Wellness. Back in January of this year, we directed the CEO to work with key community groups to create a plan in the likely event that the U.S. Supreme Court would overturn Roe v. Wade, which created a constitutional right for women and girls to choose whether or not to have an abortion. I want to thank the CEO, county departments, and stakeholders for their initial plan and their continued hard work to get us ready for what appears to be the inevitable. Among the recommendations is a plan to pursue state legislation to create a pilot project in the county with state funding that will support innovative reproductive health approaches for women regardless of their state residency. And here is the fruit of that labor, Senate Bill 1245, and its companion state budget request of $20 million. The state funding could be used in a number of ways, including to advance and improve health outcomes, to streamline and secure more infrastructure for reproductive health care, to coordinate care and patient support services, and to provide medically accurate education and training tools specific to community needs. 
not going to allow us to meet the brutal need should Roe v. Wade be overturned. But for us here in LA County, it's an important step to show that we are standing in solidarity and we are doing our part in the fight to preserve access to all reproductive services for all women and girls, including those who are forced to seek care in our county from out of state. And we want to thank State Senator Sidney Kamlager for introducing the bill. Oh, uh, yeah, why? And someone yeah. needs to mute themselves. Do you log in back in? You're not host already. No, I, I am host. So. Maybe host, but I'm the chair. So <laughs> mute yourself. <laughs> okay. With that, Supervisor Kuehl, co author, would you like to speak to this motion? You know, I thought I knew what I was going to say about this when we were looking at it yesterday. And then all of a sudden we started, you know, we saw the tweet from Politico and everything opened up. I mean, there's a um, demonstration going on right now in Van Nuys in my district. I mean, people are just turning out at courthouses and everywhere. Um, it's, it's tectonic. Um, and that, that actually makes Sydney's bill even more important. Um, you know, California, everybody takes California for granted as a kind of, you know, liberal state, but we have a lot of different considerations. Uh, uh, over a decade ago, when I brought a bill to embed all the rights that were contained in Roe v. Wade in California statute, which was successful and was signed, I thought, you know, well, I don't know that we'll ever need this, but oh well, just in case. And now, of course, if Roe is overturned, having it in California statute, is, I mean, the, the better thing would be in California Constitution, of course, and there will be a movement about that. But we need to stand at this moment, and that's really, I think, what Sydney's bill helps us do, as a, a, a beacon, as a, a rational, welcoming, and supporting place. Um, you know, L.A. County provides a, a large percentage of the reproductive health care services in the state, including abortions. But that's appropriate. We're a quarter of the state. And we um, got the first report from the work group uh, to provide us with recommendations about how we might increase our services. Uh, Planned Parenthood actually added something like four or five million dollars this year to provide help to women coming from other states and they're looking at nine or ten million next year or more. So everything that we can do in California and here in LA County to help I think is it's reasonable, it's rational. I can't believe 47 years later or whatever 49, oh yeah, almost 50, you're right. I mean, that we start all over again. But I am experienced in the worm turning. And sometimes it turns the wrong way and sometimes it turns back our way. It takes a lot of work. Uh, this may activate a lot of people who were thinking, oh well, you know, this will never happen. I don't know what the Supreme Court is for. Can it be so bad, you know? And now it's kind of like, yeah, it's bad. So um, I'm happy to co-author this, happy to support SB 1245. State legislation is really important. Um, there, uh, a bill just went into effect at the beginning of this year that allows you to include in your restraining orders under domestic violence that your abuser is keeping you from getting reproductive health services. And that was, you know, that was a that was a good step because if he can find a way to torture you, he'll do it. And it's kind of like, no, I'm not gonna let you go, I'm not gonna let you do this, et cetera. So um, this is a, a good next step, I think. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Supervisor Han. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Supervisor Mitchell and Supervisor Kuehl, for introducing this motion. And you're right, when uh, 
we, I looked at our agenda for today last week. I thought, okay, this is good. Of course, I'm going to support it. But after uh, last night's bombshell announcement uh, based on a leak uh, that our Supreme Court is on the precipice of overturning uh, Roe v. Wade, a lot of people made the comment, uh, uh, not unexpected or this was expected, not a big surprise. But nonetheless, I think once we actually heard it and saw it, it uh, is devastating. It is devastating to so many um, women, uh, to girls uh, who are going to find themselves in the position of having an unwanted pregnancy. And I, I agree. It's 1973. I remember uh, when we got this uh, fundamental right to make our own reproductive uh, choices. I think everyone thought, well, that's great for generations to come, right? All the, the girls growing up in this country will never have to, again, uh, be relegated to you know, back alley, unsafe uh, abortions that many times led to death. And I think that's why this, what we're doing supporting this bill is so important because uh, you know, overturning Roe v. Wade is not going to end abortions, right? It's just going to cause uh, women to go to extremes um, to uh, you know, do what they fundamentally have the right to do. Uh, but at least there will be some states in this country that will be a beacon, and California will be one of those. Uh, but it will really uh, fall, the burden will fall on, once again, you know, poor women and, and women of color who might not necessarily have the ability to travel uh, several states away uh, to uh, perform, to get an abortion. Or um, uh, women who might not be able to, you know, leave their jobs for three or four days to make that uh, long-distance uh, trip. So it's really unfortunate. I'm proud of us uh, as the state of California for being, uh, you know, being that beacon. I'm proud of uh, Los Angeles County to have this uh, safe haven pilot program uh, so that uh, we will be a safe haven for women no matter uh, what state they happen to come from. I fully support this bill uh, and to create this abortion access safe haven pilot program here in Los Angeles County. And maybe, just maybe, the masses that are now pouring into the streets, protesting uh, this potential decision might turn, might uh, turn uh, the Supreme Court justices to rethink uh, this terrible, one of the worst decisions they would ever make. Supervisor Barger. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and you know, I, I echo what my colleagues have said, and I never thought the word safe haven would be used um, abortion access. And it tells me that, you know, I've said it earlier in, in another issue, we've come a long way, but in fact, we've got a long way to go. Um, because as I was talking to, to Supervisor Kuehl when we walked in, um, I thought this was the rule of law now, based on the Supreme Court ruling, and that it couldn't be overturned. And, um, and it leaves me scratching my head. And I think it's one of the most um, shocking things, quite frankly, um, that, that have happened to recently as it relates to what's going on in Washington. And I didn't think I could be any more shocked than I have been, but I think this tops it. So um, I'm prepared, I was prepared to support this prior to the news um, yesterday, and um, I will support it, but I think it speaks volumes to um, the fact that we as women do have um, to continue to use our voice um, and protect our rights. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Uh, I too am angry. I'm saddened, I'm devastated, and I'm enraged. Couldn't believe what I was seeing and hearing yesterday on television and around the world and seeing political reporting on what happened. Um, it's abundantly clear to me that abortion care, to me, is health care. It's reproductive care. So 
people should understand that we're really talking about harming our healthcare system for women and their children and their future families or that individual woman herself. And God knows if she's also being threatened from her perhaps abuser. It's very true, Supervisor Kuehl. We know that men are capable of doing a lot of unfortunately bad things when they become very possessive and try to hurt women and their children. Um, I too am very uh, struck by, by what um, has come about and I plan on taking action. I don't think we need to grieve, we need to get active. And we need to support our sisters and our mothers and future generations and that means everybody else. I, I am wholeheartedly in support of this legislation that Senator Cal, Cam Lager has put forward and I think people need to understand, they shouldn't be confused, as you said, Supervisor Barger, about safe haven, because uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett somehow thinks that that removes the need for abortions. It's my opinion, she has it mixed up. Um, and obviously, she couldn't be so wrong. She's really terribly wrong. And that's why I'm glad also that our legislature and our governor are now going to do everything they can to help uh, take action as soon as possible and to enshrine the right to an abortion in our California Constitution, which is what we need to do. So when I heard about this news, I was sad, devastated, but I woke up. I woke. And we got to fight back. And reading Justice Alito's draft opinion, it's clear that he and his colleagues are only getting started. He goes further to say that a historical basis is required for constitutional protection. A true handmaid's tale scenario, setting up the groundwork to overturn same-sex marriage and other constitutional rights that, I hate to say, Republicans, some, have made their twisted and cruel mission to strip from Americans. It's a travesty, make no mistake about it. We have a lot of work to do, and I remain committed. And I wanna thank our incredible partners here in Los Angeles, like this county, Planned Parenthood, and our federally qualified health centers for their support, because we need all of them. And I wanna urge our communities to seek out good information when it comes to abortions. Please consider visiting ineeda.com to find an abortion clinic, use pill by mail services, and find financial support. To our county residents, Los Angeles County will stand with you. I call on Congress to codify Roe versus Wade. Abortion is essential. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to all my colleagues who have spoken. Supervisor Kuehl, when you made your point that you hope that um, young women in particular will, will be activated. I was reminded, I think I was 24 when I was elected to serve on the Planned Parenthood Sacramento Valley Board. And at my board orientation and training, I sat next to a board colleague who had a wire hanger pin on, lapel pin, and I didn't know what that was because I'd come into my reproductive maturity under Roe v. Wade. And when they explained it to me, I said, then you need different symbols to communicate the risk of losing this right to my generation and younger, because that's not our orientation. And I'm afraid that that's what happened. We have several generations of people who only know life as it is under Roe. Perhaps now that it's at risk, more people will be awakened, Supervisor Solis, uh, and hope it's not too, light, too late for us to, to fight. With that, thank you all for your comments and your support, uh, your stated support of the motion. Now let's make it official by voting. Hearing no other comments, item 17 is before us. I will move, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl, to approve this item. Please call the roll. Item 17 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero.
Moving on to item 23, safeguarding the rights of incarcerated youth, support and implementation of State Assembly Bill 2417 by Assembly Member Phil Ting, which was held by Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and my thanks to uh, Supervisor Solis for co-authoring the motion that recognizes the fundamental rights of incarcerated youth. Example of the rights that are included uh, in the uh, BOR include uh, a right to live in a safe, healthy, and clean environment conducive to treatment and rehabilitation, the right to contact their attorneys, the right to receive quality education, including post-secondary academic and career technical education, the right to, con to contact with family, where family includes any adult who has an established familial or mentoring relationship, including godparents, clergy, teachers, neighbors, and family friends. And that also includes their right to see their own children. The right to receive adequate and healthy meals and snacks, clean water at any time, timely access to toilets, access to daily showers, sufficient personal hygiene items, clean bedding, and clean clothing in good repair, including clean undergarments on a daily basis. The right to visit, as I said, their own children, and also to get information about their rights as parents. No one of these rights or any of the others in the bill should be at all controver <clears throat> excuse me, controversial, and none should be difficult to implement. The significance is not only in acknowledging that every youth should be afforded these rights. The significance is in making sure that they know about them, that they know they have these rights, and allowing them to hold us accountable. The motion has three key steps. Uh, we'll ask our LA County legislative team to support AB 2417, but we won't wait to find out if it passes, because here in LA County, the Bill of Rights will immediately be posted and explain to our young people at Barry J and one camp to be chosen by the probation department as a start. We will get a report from our probation department detailing an implementation plan because some of the rights listed in the bill are already part of probation's practices. Others are not. So the report back will provide details, give us a timeline by which we can expect the bill of rights to be implemented at every county facility. The Probation Oversight Commission will empower youth to hold us accountable. This county has been held accountable by the BSCC. We've been held accountable by the Department of Justice, which recently imposed a consent decree in our two juvenile halls. But I can't think of any better form of accountability than that coming from the youth we serve themselves. Probation Oversight Commission, under the leadership of its executive director, Wendy Julian, will develop a survey to hear from youth on a quarterly basis, and then work with the department to report to the board on the results of the survey, and the department will address areas of concern that may arise. In the past five or six months, we've all been made painfully aware of how we're falling short in implementing these rights at Barry J. We've heard of programming deficits, canceled visits, poor quality food, lack of adequate recreation time, inconsistent education. The most credible reports have come directly from the young people themselves. So the vision put forth in this motion is one of consistent recognition, communication, and accountability around a set of rights for every young person. I ask for your I vote. Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Kuehl for asking me to co-author this timely motion to support a meaningful bill, Assembly Bill 2417. And it's no secret that we're going through some hard times right here in our own probation camps and our halls. In a short time, we dealt and are continuing to deal with the transfer of Central Hall youth to Barry J, Norda Juvenile Hall, the need to immediately move our secure track youth from Barry J Juvenile Hall to Camp Kilpatrick, the examination and selection of probation camps for suitable placements for other secure track youth will be joining us from state facilities that are closing. The numerous failed BSCC inspections at Barry, Barry J and Central Juvenile Hall 
and the feasibility study on the closure of Central Juvenile Hall. Throughout all of this, I've heard disturbing accounts of staff calling out and not showing up for work, resulting in programming and school being modified and visits and outdoor recreation time being cut or canceled outright that are likely contributing to the youth on staff incidents. And we heard about some earlier today as well. Probation leadership is also making significant changes to its leadership, structure, and culture that will impact youth. But what remains is that we need to continue to safeguard and protect the rights of almost 400 youth who are incarcerated in the county's camps and halls. When these youth are entrusted to the county's care, we're obligated and mandated to provide the very basics, which include housing and food. But as something I know both Supervisor Kuhl and I have continued to push for with the support of the board is ensuring that these youth have the right to receive programming and services. The Bill of Rights for Incarcerated Youth was already implemented at state DJJ facilities, but should this bill pass, it would require every juvenile justice facility to post and distribute the Bill of Rights given these state facilities are closing. And just because DJJ facilities are closing, the Bill of Rights for Incarcerated Youth shouldn't disappear with it. I'm proud to not only support AB 2417, but what this motion does beyond that. Despite what happens to the bill, the youth in the county care will know what their rights are and will understand their rights. Their rights will be posted and distributed throughout the county camps and halls, and the oversight entities we have in place will ensure that their rights are not violated or threatened. These are not just words or a piece of paper. The board, with the support of this motion and bill, will ensure that they are implemented. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. <clears throat> thank you both. Seeing no additional questions or comments on the safeguarding the rights of incarcerated youth, we will have the motion moved by Supervisor Kuehl and seconded by Supervisor Solis to approve the item. Please call the roll. Item 23 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item 25, support of Assembly Bill 2220 by Assemblymember Al Marasucci, the homeless court pilot program that was held by Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Assemblymember Al Marasucci for introducing uh, this bill that would create a statewide grant program to fund homeless courts. I've been talking about uh, our homeless court here in um, LA County as a model uh, over the last few years since it's been started. And I think a uh, city attorney from Redondo Beach called in this morning, Mike Webb, uh, to also, he was very instrumental in getting it um, up and running. I'm really impressed with the program in the homeless court model unhoused individuals who are charged with a low-level offense go to court where the goal is not to punish, but to connect housing and any other social services they need. The judge connects the clients to services to get them housing, housing ready, whether that means signing up for substance abuse uh, classes, expunging a past record, or simply getting an ID. And when they complete the program, their charge is dismissed. Uh, when I visited the Rodano Beach Homeless Court, uh, I learned about this model, uh, and it was so fascinating. And many of our uh, uh, county employees, our, our um, public defender uh, is there, um, our, our, our sheriffs are there, um, you know, a lot of our uh, social work uh, folks are there, and it's really amazing uh, to see homeless people sitting in the audience and getting cheered on by each other when they pass a program and the judge tells them that they have succeeded, their record gets expunged, and they stand ready to uh, be moved into housing. Uh, you can feel that support when you're there. And since the Redondo Beach Homeless Court began at the end of 2020, they have, they've gotten 25 people into permanent housing. And this is just another one example of what we all believe in, care first, jail last, and also wherever it is that we touch those who are experiencing homeless, uh, homelessness, we have an opportunity 
to uh, connect them to services. And so I'm really um, grateful. I think uh, Torrance is about to implement one of their own. Long Beach uh, has started one. Um, I had to use my one-time discretionary funds uh, to help set them up because there wasn't a sustainable source of funding for homeless courts. So AB <clears throat> 2220 would address uh, that. It would create a five-year grant program for cities to implement their own homeless courts and would collect data and outcomes on the, pro on the programs. This will be great, be very helpful um, to our cities who, again, have the heart, want to do something different, and want to change the trajectory of people's lives who are experiencing homelessness. Thank you, Supervisor Mitchell, for co-authoring this motion with me. Um, you're now the supervisor uh, that uh, is lucky enough to uh, cover Redondo Beach, uh, where this uh, homeless court is, and thank you for your support on this. Thank you very much for the invitation. I absolutely am thrilled to represent uh, Redondo Beach and to witness firsthand the amazing work that they've done um, where the unhoused can resolve their cases and access critical resources all in one location. Everybody wants to be able to do that. So I fully support AB 2220. Um, we know that the passing of this legislation would assist Redondo Beach in their current efforts and expand the model into other areas of our county to support unhoused individuals. I think, you know, as we heard the governor present his concept around care court, um, it will be nece necessary that these kinds of courts are in place to be able to help facilitate that. Whatever that pro program ultimately looks like, we know it's in process, but having uh, these kinds of courts, which is what uh, uh, interested him in coming to LA County when he announced the program, is because we've already taken strides towards that uh, resolution. Supervisor Solis. Oh, it's okay. I'm, I, perhaps I didn't shut you out from the previous motion. I'm sorry. Any other comments from any other member? Seeing none, uh, item 25 is before us, moved by Supervisor Hahn. I will second to approve the item. Please call the roll. Item 25 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item 81 will take up the public hearing uh, item, the hearing on the junior lifeguard program fee increase. Um, Boatou, practicing my French there, from the fire department is available if uh, we have questions. Uh, if not, or is there anyone who would like to make comments? Of course, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, colleagues, I just held this because uh, the Junior Lifeguard Program is so fantastic, and we're doing a much better job of outreaching to kids from all over the county and not just those who uh, live at the beach uh, and have easy access to it. We're really reaching out to, to kids from all over the county. Many of our current county lifeguards actually started uh, as a junior lifeguard, so it really does more than just give them you know, uh, water safety skills. It could be a, uh, a road, a pathway to a good career uh, with the county. Uh, so, the fire department uh, came to me and said they wanted to increase uh, the current uh, fee for junior lifeguards by about $200, um, which would have brought it to almost $750. Well, I pushed back on that because, uh, you know, that, that could be completely unaffordable for a lot of families, uh, even though the, I will say the fire department does have scholarships. Uh, that they uh, raise money for so that, you know, no kid is turned away because of affordability. But still, I just felt like that was a bit high. I pushed back and said I could support uh, raising it by $50. Their costs have gone up. It, the cost of, of this program actually doesn't cover their own cost. Um, so I said I could support $50 more a year, uh, making sure that we, again, focused on scholarships. And with the caveat, and I, I, I talked to Feezy about this yesterday, with the caveat that 
Um, FISIA is committed to looking into other funding part, pots to help support this program so they can make up uh, the gap that the fire department uh, has. Again, this is a, a program that benefits all of the county. Uh, I'm not sure why uh, the fire department just has to absorb this by themselves. Um, so today what we're doing is raising the fee by just $50 uh, and um, recommitting ourselves to doing outreach throughout the county, particularly in many of our underserved uh, communities who uh, kids could really benefit from a program like this and with the commitment that our CEO will be looking to find money to fill this gap. So it's a great program. I hope I can count on your support today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, it would be appropriate to close the public hearing and vote on this item. Item 81 is before us, moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Supervisor Mitchell to approve this item. Please call the roll. Item 81 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries, five to zero. Uh, there are no specials before us today, and with this, with that being the case, at this time it would be appropriate to transition to hear adjournments in memory. We will begin with Supervisor Barger, District 5, and then go in chronological order. Supervisor Barger. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we do so in memory of Lee Harris. He was a lifelong resident of Newhall and passed away at the young age of 65. Lee attended Newhall Elementary School, Placerita Junior High School, and was a graduate of William S. Hart High School. He attended Occidental College with actually Supervisor Kuehl, your Chief of Staff, Lisa Mendel, um, where he played rugby and golf and was a proud member of the Oxy Old Boys. He graduated in 1979 and began a career as a stockbroker at Dean Witter, now known as Morgan Stanley. He was passionate about golf, which he played at Valencia Country Club and at many courses throughout the United States, Ireland, and Scotland. He enjoyed an eclectic taste in music and easily attended over 1,000 concerts in his lifetime. Lee is survived by his wife, Kay, his daughters, Nancy and Georgia, and his brother, Dave. I also move that we adjourn in memory of Michael Angelo Holmard, a longtime resident of Pastina who passed away April 1st at the age of 89. Mike was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, learning construction and sports skills before his St. Augustine High School graduation in 1950. In the beginning, in the following year, he married the love of his life, Gwen, whom he had known since he was 12 years old, and by the age of 22, they had four children. By the same, but at the same, by that same age, he graduated from Xavier University in Louisiana and played multiple years of Negro League and professional baseball. In 1956, Mike and his wife moved to Pasadena and pursued teaching credentials at Cal State, Cal State University of Los Angeles. During this time, Mike and Gwen added two more children to their beautiful family. He first worked at Horace Mann Junior High, then at Eagle Rock High School, where he was also a baseball coach and athletic director. He was an active member of St. Andrew's Church and would be missed by all that knew him. Michael is survived by his children, Michael Jr., Denise Jones, Stephen Kevin, Marie Foster, Keith, and his sister, Marie Vet Marine. Also that we adjourn in memory of William James Sipes, a longtime resident of Canyon Country who passed away at the age of 89. Bill was born and raised in Topeka, Kansas. He received a Naval Scholarship and attended the University of Notre Dame. He majored in aeronautical engineering and entered the US Navy as Lieutenant JG. He became a fighter pilot who flew F3, FJ3 fighter jets, making 96 aircraft carrier landings. Years later, his squadron, squadron was turned into the Top Gun Squadron. He became a leader in the aerospace industry contributing to many patents. He was also a valued consultant with JPL and NASA, winning NASA awards. 
He married his first wife, Mary, and together they had six children. They opened their home to children from all over the world, adopting three from Mexico and hosting 11 exchange students who each spent a year with the family. He was a head coach of Santa Clarita Valley Athletic Association youth track team for decades. The Warrior team became 400 strong under his leadership and fed the Santa Clarita Valley High School Championship track and cross country teams. Cope Sipes assisted in the Canyon Country School football team and filmed the, the team games for many years. He was an active member of his church serving as lector, Eucharist minister, and headed the annual church barbecue. Bill is survived by his wife, Sally, and his children, Anne, Sharon, Tom, Diane, David, Anna, Carmen, and Teresa. Those are my adjournments, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. We'll go to District 1, Supervisor Solis. Madam Chair, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Gilbert Frank Coelho. He passed away on April 15, 2022, and was 80 years old. Gilbert was a great example of a man of faith and great character and was the brother of former Congressman Tony Coelho. He was raised on a family dairy farm in Dos Palos and attended local schools. Gilbert continued working on a family dairy farm until the mid-1960s, after which time he worked at Eagle Field and then in custom farming with his father in Hillmar, in the Hillmar area. Gilbert continued in the agricultural industry and became a specialist in the melon growing and harvesting industry. Gilbert was well respected during the many years as a pest control advisor, harvest manager, and grower recruiter. He retired in 2009 and continued in the industry with some individualized agricultural consulting. Gilbert found time while working to become very involved in his community, the schools and the St. Joseph Catholic Church. He served on the School District Community Recreation Commission and volunteered at the local Harvest Festival. He served as president of the local Lions Club, Fireball Service Club, and Fireball Rotary Club, and was a member of the Knights of Columbus. Gilbert is survived by his loving wife of 48 years, Carol, and his children, Michelle, Gregory, and Tracy, five grandchildren, his brothers, Otto and Tony, and his sister, Susan, and numerous nieces and nephews. May he rest in peace. Madam Chair, that concludes my adjournments. Thank you very much, Supervisor Solis. When we adjourn today, I ask that we adjourn in memory of Michael C. Herndon. Mr. Herndon was born on April 21st, 1958 in St. Louis, Missouri, and passed away on April 16th at the age of 63 in Bellflower. His family relocated to Los Angeles when he was just two years old. He proudly served the residents of the second district and former supervisor Yvonne Brathwaite Burt for 20 years, driving and accompanying her to various events throughout the district and the county. He spent the last five years of his career working as the head of staff services for the Department of Parks and Rec until his retirement. Mr. Herndon will be remembered as a loving husband and father, as well as a dedicated county employee of 25 years. He will also be remembered for his kindness and even-tempered nature. He is survived and will be deeply missed by his loving wife, Jacqueline, daughter, Michelle, sister, Stephanie, in addition to a host of family, friends, and colleagues. I'm hearing that people would like to be added on, if we could all add on. Um, thank you very much, colleagues. Next two... Um, are rather difficult for me. Um, they are women that I knew, black women who um, lost their lives sooner than they should have. Let me start with Kimberly Willis Esquire. Kimberly was born May 3rd, 1971 in LA and passed away April 21 at the age of 50. She attended the Westlake School for Girls, now of course Harvard Westlake, where she founded the Black American Culture Club, enabling young women to share their heritage with classmates. She moved to DC to attend Howard University where she graduated cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science. She continued her studies at Howard where she graduated with a Juris Doctor degree. After law school, she returned to Los Angeles to work as a contracts administrator for Community Build, a nonprofit community development corporation established in 1992 in response to, to the conditions that led 
to the civil unrest that we just commemorated the 30th anniversary of last week. As the contracts administrator, Kimberly assisted with program development and managed the traffic warrant cleanup program. This program exposed Kimberly to the criminal courts and revealed the need for African-American attorneys to participate in all facets of the judicial system. In January 1999, she began working for the criminal division of the LA City Attorney's Office, where she earned a reputation as a zealous advocate. After more than 10 years in the criminal division, she went to work in the domestic violence unit and finally in the general litigation division, where she distinguished herself in defending the city of LA and its employees in civil lawsuits. She was a true public servant whose work was centered on using her experience, knowledge, and authority to help serve and empower her community. She was a proud member of the Los Angeles chapter of The Lynx, Black Women Lawyers, Black Women's Forum, and the League of Women Voters. She was also a member of the Langston Bar Association where she was elected as president in 2015 and also served as co-chair of the Youth Outreach Program. She will be remembered as a loving wife, daughter, sister, and friend. She will also be remembered for her dedication to the community and for being well respected in the legal field. She will be deeply missed by her loving husband and high school sweetheart, Monty. Father Lorenzo, Brother Lorez, Sister Linda, two nieces, a nephew, and her circle of BFFs who loved her and helped her with care. When we adjourn today, I ask that we adjourn in memory of Sabungale Bradley West, who was born April 2nd, 1955, to the parents of Manuel and Adeline Bradley and passed away unexpectedly in her home in Windsor Hills, April 15th, just a few days after her birthday. She was a Windsor Hills resident for many years. She was raised in Pacoima and attended San Fernando High School. She graduated with a business degree from the Maharashtra University of Management. And in 1973, she undertook training in Ethiopia, where she became a certified teacher of Transcendental Meditation. She had a successful career of 49 years of guiding many to spiritual solace through meditation as well as teaching it at universities and in the private sector. During COVID, she wrote a grant and got funded and was teaching transcendental, transcendental meditation to African Americans, largely women, as a way of using meditation to help people get through the isolation um, and in many instances depression brought on by COVID. Ms. West achieved success as a real estate agent for many years. She also served as vice president of Young Communications Group Incorporated, where she managed the public affairs and community engagement divisions. Her deep roots in the black community and wide connections made her an invaluable leader in the firm. She worked on many high visibility public, edu public education campaigns, including LA CARES, COVID-19 vaccination education, the Stop the Stigma campaign, and capacity building and training for First Five California. Ms. West worked on the Special Advisory Board for African PTSD SD Relief, where she established an internship program for students at Spelman College. She was a phenomenal artist uh, in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, becoming an internationally recognized expert braider. And many of the entertainers, including Patrice, Wilson, Patrice Russian and even the Flip Wilson wig when he became uh, Geraldine, were her works of art with intricate braiding and elaborate beading that uh, many of us who have chosen to wear our hair natural in the African American community can certainly respect and acknowledge and remember. It is a true art form, and she was an internationally recognized artisan. She'll be remembered as a storyteller and an expert in the fields of public relations and transcendental meditation. She was preceded in death by her loving husband, Rick West, who was a successful music professor. Her infectious smile and warm spirit will be deeply missed by her brother, Daryl, sister, Gaynell, best friend Michael and a host of extended family, friends, colleagues, and clients. She will be thoroughly missed. 
Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Samuel Aroni, who was a Holocaust survivor, joined the UCLA faculty in 1970, and eventually served as Dean of the Graduate School of Architecture and Urban Planning, Chair of the UCLA Academic Senate, and Director of Academic Cooperative Programs and International and Overseas Studies. On his retirement, he was granted the title of Professor Emeritus. He mentored many generations of UCLA students, not only in the classroom, but equally in life. He also contributed his wealth and his breadth of knowledge to the Israeli government, as well as other foreign governments and educational institutions. He survived by his daughters, Ruth and Miriam. And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Lila Oreck, who died on April 15th. In her long life, she had a wide variety of roles, wife, mother, community organizer, activist, passionate volunteer. Professionally, she had worked as a human computer in the early aerospace industry, something that we saw in the movie Hidden Figures. Later, she was a fiscal analyst for the LA Community College District. After she retired, she served multiple terms, including president on the board of Haven Hills, which is a leading domestic violence shelter with multiple programs in the San Fernando Valley. She was also very active in leadership roles in the Folk Dance Federation of Southern California, West Valley Folk Dancers, the American Association of University Women, and the Woodland Hills Community Church. She, uh, she survived by her husband, Wally, and her children, Lee, Sherry, and Mike. I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Florence Davidson, who died on April 23rd. She lived a long and happy life. In her first few decades, crisscrossing the country, finally making her home in LA, but also had come from New York City, Iowa City, Buffalo, Milwaukee, Falls Church, Virginia, finally coming back to LA for the last 53 years of her life. She was much beloved for being the kindest, the sweetest, the most lovable, creative, generous, and intellectually curious person that anyone knew. She survived by her sons, Peter and John. John Davidson, you may remember, was the CEO of the Lambda Legal uh, Organization. Uh, and I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Yao Katagiri, who died on April 28th. She came to Santa Monica via the RAND Corporation after completing her graduate studies at Harvard. She created RAND's first sustained private philanthropy program, led the effort to secure development rights for its Santa Monica headquarters, and created their community relations program supporting dozens of community organizations. She served as chair of the Santa Monica Chamber's Board of Directors from 2009 to 2010. She retired from RAND in 2015, the same year that she was given the Chamber's Roy E. Naylor Lifetime Achievement Award for her many years of service to the Santa Monica community. In addition to RAND and the Chamber, EAL also held leadership positions, we, we actually in Santa Monica said, in everything because everything you'd go to, she was either running it or on the board. But I'll just list a few. Um, Connections for Children, Santa Monica Child Care and Early Education Task Force, Santa Monica Arts Commission, Wise and Healthy Aging, the Westside Food Bank, and the Santa Monica College Associates. She's survived by her sister, Lori. And finally, I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Harold Livingston, a screenwriter who died on April 28th. He wrote the screenplay for Star Trek, The Motion Picture, and many episodes of Mission Impossible, and novels that explored the changing world in the aftermath of World War II. But Harold Livingston had his own starring role in a real-life adventure in Israel in 1948 as part of a small pack of American pilots defending the new nation. Livingston's heroics helped Israel fend off its attackers and gave birth to the Israeli Air Force. Above and Beyond, a documentary Nancy Spielberg produced, featured Livingston, among others, and brought the long-ago mission back into focus. 
Harold is survived by his daughters Leah and Eve and his son David. Thank you, Madam Chair. Those are my adjournments. Thank you, and we'll close with Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Detective Gonzalez, uh, Alexis Gonzalez, who was a five-year veteran of the Southgate Police Department. He passed away due to injuries suffered in a traffic accident on Sunday, April 24th. He was only 27 years old. Uh, the chief of that department described him as having an ambitious drive and his personality and character were beyond unique. I went to the hospital uh, as his body was being taken uh, from the hospital to the coroner's office and there was such an incredible outpouring of support for his family and fellow officers. Um, his youngest brother is a volunteer with the department and is hoping to follow in Alexis' footsteps and become a Southgate police officer. He's survived by his parents and two brothers. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of William Urso, who was a longtime resident of San Pedro, who passed away at the age of 77. He was a successful business owner, well-known general contractor. He was an active member of the community and Holy Trinity Church, where his children and many of his grandchildren attended school. He survived by his wife, Barbara, children, Nicole, William, Sam, and Kate, and 10 grandchildren. And I wanted to add one that uh, is not up on the screen, but I just found out about this a couple of hours ago, and I wanted us to adjourn our meeting in the memory of Norm Mineta, uh, who was uh, first-generation Japanese-American, uh, who was held in an internment camp during World War II, and later became one of our country's highest-profile Asian-American political leaders at, as a mayor of San Jose, and then he was a 10-term Congress member and a cabinet secretary. He just died uh, May 3rd, and he was 90. Uh, he uh, was known for his uh, really collaborative working uh, with everyone across the aisle. Uh, during his tenure in Congress, uh, he championed civil liberties and played a key role in obtaining an official apology and compensation for Japanese Americans who were forced from their homes during World War II uh, when their ancestry made them objects of government suspicion. He served briefly as Commerce Secretary toward the end of Bill Clinton's administration, becoming the first Asian American cabinet member, and the incoming president, George W. Bush, tapped him as the Transportation Secretary uh, in January of 2001, and he uh, was on uh, at the transportation um, secretary when uh, you know we were attacked on September 11th. And after the second plane hit New York's World Trade Center that day, he uh, insisted uh, that we ground all 4,638 planes in the U.S. airspace. Uh, no emergency protocol had been established to bring them all down at once, uh, but he felt that that was uh, important that that happen. Uh, he will be uh, known uh, for his work as a transportation um, secretary, as a big city mayor. Um, he also, it was his work that led to the brand new department of uh, TSA. Uh, so he was responsible for that as, as well. Um, I knew him uh, for uh, most of my time in public service, and I um, really respected him. Uh, as a city council member, a mayor, a member of Congress, and then as a transportation uh, secretary uh, in uh, the president's cabinet. God rest uh, his uh, memory, uh, Norma, Normanetta, you were a true public servant. You know, I bet Hilda would probably like to, too, I would think. And so maybe all five of us, because he was incredibly important, great guy. Supervisor Hahn for letting us join in on that adjourning memory. Thank you, and we'll take all the motions as seconded. If there is no objection to a unanimous vote, such will be the action. Executive Officer, please read us into closed session. In accordance with Brown Act requirements, notice is hereby given that the Board of Supervisors will convene in closed session to discuss item CS2, conference with legal counsel regarding existing litigation. CS3, Department Head Performance Evaluation, and CS4, Conference with Labor Negotiator, Negotiator Kezia Davenport, and designated staff, as indicated on the posted agenda. Thank you.